Tereomikust, good morning, guten morgen. How it's in Latvia and Lithuanian? Who can help me? Labas Litas. Dabri. Welcome everybody. Tere tulemast meedia konferentsile. Welcome to the media conference. Defending media freedom. What's a freedom? Welcome to media conference. Vabadus. Meedia vabadus. Milline ta siis on? Mul on suur hea meel ja rõõm tervitada teid, kes te olete Tallinna Ülikooli auditoorumis maksimum kohale pääsenud, sest te poole siia pääsesid valit. Tallinn Universiti maksimum ja välkama to our online visitors as well. Konverentsi kahe sisse juhatava kõnega. Esiteks annan sõna Tallinna Ülikooli, Balti Filmi ja Meediakooli direktorile Elgatsile. Welcoming words by Director of Baltic Film and Art School, Mrs. Birgit Vilgats. Tere ommikust! Nüüd võib öelda, et vist on traditsiooniks saanud, et kui ma pean kuskil tervitus õnudlema või kõned pidama, siis ma ei ole lasega, et mida nad siis tõenud. Ja eelmine on ma ole lasega, et mida nad siis tõenud. Ja eelmine on ma ole lasega, et mida nad siis tõenud. Ja eelmine on ma ole lasega, et mida nad siis tõenud. Ja eelmine on ma ole lasega, et mida nad siis tõenud. Ja eelmine on ma ole lasega, et mida nad siis tõenud. Ja eelmine on ma ole lasega, et mida nad siis tõenud. You have, when you have messed up and you've been banned from iPad and TV. So based on a slightly different approach, I started thinking, what is media freedom? What kind of a media freedom have we seen recently? We've seen freedom to support and encourage. Freedom to show different solutions, to understand. But we've also seen freedom to damage, destruct, label and so fear. My freedom is to, to have the freedom to notice. That's the freedom of choice that is always with us. Even in Auschwitz, it was there, as weird as it seems. Like Judith Edgar, a Jewish psychotherapist, says, I could choose till the very end what, which one of uh, grass um, leaves she would eat. Especially if we notice choices that don't build or support, then people don't feel responsibility. At BFM, we are responsible for media edu education in the widest sense of the meeting, uh, meaning. We train professionals, but also teachers, different teachers of different professionals and everyone interested in this. We teach them to participate. We teach them to consume media in a responsible way to see creative solutions, creative choices, media education needs to promote critical thinking. The skill of looking for information from different sources, with ethics, of being sensitive to different cultures, of tolerance. In a sense, we need to come back to the basics of being a human. To become aware that in addition to freedom, I also have responsibility. What do I create? Why and for whom? How do I do it? Are there other options? I do hope that this day will help you put some content into these thoughts. Have an elegant mind and enjoy this day. Chairman of the Board of Estonian Public Broadcasting, Mr. Eric Rose. Mr. Eric Rose. Thank you. Tere. Alustuseks, ta on siiralt täna ta kõiki. So first of all, I would like to thank all the organizers of today's event. Ja üritus. And last year, this event was cancelled. And we all know what the reasons were. So today, a year later, and this situation is a lot better. 
in our hospitals. Aga saanud, et But at the same time, we have understood on that in certain cases, on we cannot change võime, things and we need to adapt. And uh, the, we, it has, has been olema. said that adaptability is another definition for intelligence. Looking at the program we have today, today, then we can uh, look for intellectual uh, excellent tidbits, which uh, look at the uh, press freedom, confidence, and quality. So if we were to ask if this is all important, then it's, we can also ask whether oxygen is important. Well, it's not, until it's no longer there. So we want to have a, a warm uh, rooms, uh, cheap electricity, safety and health. We think that these are all guaranteed and we only understand when it's all gone missing how highly dependent we are on all these. The same is true for the free press. It seems to be that this is assured and commonplace. Uh, even annoying, ja ka and sometimes uh, an irritant. Aga ka päike on nahale but uh, sunshine can be also irritant if you Aga fall asleep on the beach. But there's no point of blaming the sun. A media consumer does not have to think about vabadus. press or press freedom on a daily basis. But uh, what seems to be a big challenge is when our politicians, politicians and decision ja makers and finances do not understand the importance of ja press tundub, freedom. And I think that explaining this is important. It, do, it doesn't matter if it seems to be hopeless, but this is the biggest challenge we have today. Selleks, I wish us all uh, uh, strength for that and also best conference today. Ja oleme jõudnud Thank you. And now we can move on with the first presentation. So I have a great pleasure that uh, Public Broadcasting Company and Baltic Centre for Media Excellence and the University of Tallinn I've been able to bring uh, the speakers into this room. Not all of them are physically present, some of them are virtually present, but there are many speakers who are actually here. And first, I would like to invite here Monika Kartjeskauta-Pyrjain. Sorry about pronunciation. Tema on Leedu, Radio ja Televisiooni peadirektor. Director General of the Lithuanian Next Radio and TV. Next 25 for your presentation already. Okay. So hello, everybody. Um, how does this? Next. Doesn't work, the pointer. Could anyone help with the pointer? Or? Could anyone help to put up the presentation? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, it's too fast. Okay, now. So hello everybody and uh, thank you for inviting me here and um, yeah in this picture um, you can see uh, a journalist of uh, LRT of TV journalists attacked uh, by the participants of uh, anti-vaccination protest uh, this August in, in Vilnius and uh, similar scenes uh, not rare uh, across Europe and you could see it all over and uh, we are shocked. We were shocked by this behavior, and our journalists were shocked. And uh, uh, this journalist said that I was working in Maidan, uh, but uh, I uh, felt safer here than here, attacked by my own uh, by my own uh, co-citizens. And uh, so, sadly, journalists are perceived more and more as enemies, and uh, they faced increased violence and intimidation in many European countries. And this trend it didn't start uh, with pandemics. Uh, Anti-vaxxers and radical demanded, radicals uh, demanded of LRT free, uh, free airtime uh, long before COVID. And uh, rallies at uh, LRT office has become an instrument to gain, to gain uh, political attention. And uh, in recent years, LRT has come um, under significant political pressure. 
So I would like to use this opportunity to thank uh, director of BCME and colleagues from Estonian and Latvian uh, broadcasters who helped to support the independence of LRT and uh, uh, who was pressed uh, also by former uh, uh, political majority and uh, it was uh, attempts to limit the freedom. Uh, but it, they did not succeed, but this, this, fight is not, uh, this fight is not over. And the uh, pandemic only highlighted this uh, destructive tendencies and deep-rooted pro uh, problems. Um, yeah. ah. Now it doesn't work again. So, um, political actors are among uh, the main sources of manipulation and uh, uh, social fragmentation and polarization of society by social networks is further worsened by manipulation of public uh, opinion. Uh, interest groups, authoritarian governments, dictatorships such as Russia, Belarus, China, and etc., etc., contribute, but equally uh, so do politicians in uh, democracies. Uh, research that you can see here in the slides uh, shows that uh, the government, political parties and politicians are among uh, the biggest generators of digital uh, propaganda and disinformation, sadly. Uh, they employ uh, private PR firms to produce disinformation and uh, social media has, has become a major uh, battlefield. And uh, these figures illustrate the scale of uh, political disinformation. And uh, we, of course, observe these processes in Lithuania as well. And uh, almost without the help of mainstream media, politicians now um, can fabricate and distribute lies, mobilize and instig instigate the, the, con the discontent. Uh, here you can see the representative also of former ruling uh, Greens and Farmers Party, and they basically they partially uh, based its political campaign and communication, election communication on conspiracy theory about LRT. Uh, here you can see the figures of trust in uh, Lithuanian institutions and uh, it is unfortunate to see, in, especially in this conference, but media have long lost their monopoly on truth, and uh, there is a generate, uh, general distrust of, on, uh, of everything in general, of all the media in general. And media is becoming increasingly vulnerable, and the confidence in media in Lithuania has reached its record lows. Um, uh, here you can also see in this slide uh, um, the... Um, in like research that was uh, carried out by European Broadcasters Union, uh, which shows a very clear correlation uh, between uh, public service media and democracy. And the findings of EBU research from over uh, 50 countries uh, uh, on democracy and, and PSM, it's public service media, indicate that there is a close relationship uh, between countries' democratic well-being and the performance of PSM. Uh, in the past, uh, LRT was the main target of attacks uh, by populist and marginalized uh, political groups, and now the whole, as so-called mainstream media, uh, are perceived as enemies. Journalists are harassed online and physically, and today journal Lithuanian journalists uh, also need to remove their labels, their insignia, and uh, that was happening in, in Europe, in, in Paris for two years already, and now it's coming here to Baltics as well. Um, and uh, therefore, I would like to stress that the attack on PSM also means the attack on, uh, on, all, the, uh, on all the media. Um, in such complex environment, um, it is very important for all the media, but especially for public service media, to demonstrate the greatest possible honesty, uh, the greatest possible transparency and uh, contact with the audience and to offer the most meaningful content possible. In this respect, public service broadcasters have taken uh, a big step forward, at, uh, at least in Lithuania. Uh, further, I will be explaining why uh, public service media is important. I will mostly talk about Lithuanian situation because I know it best. Um, Luckily, um, high public trust, uh, we, ha we still enjoy high public trust uh, uh, and um, it enables um, uh, our influence. And I believe uh, that especially in small uh, media markets and young democracies, public service media is uh, very important because it is a set of standards. 
uh, from quality of journalism to quality entertainment uh, and education. Uh, and uh, it has historically been the case that public service broadcasters maintain uh, the highest ethical standards and that are close, uh, close, uh, closely monitored by public. And uh, High Trust imposes the, uh, the responsibility to keep these standards and also enables to set benchmarks uh, for the competitive media environment, uh, which benefits for all the landscape of the media. Uh, therefore, it is very important to ensure proper uh, uh, functioning and uh, stable funding uh, of public service media and independence. Mm. Public service media uh, invests in quality content and uh, contributes to creative industries. And um, well-funded public service media has an opportunity, an obligation to invest into content that the commercial media uh, may consider not profitable. That is investigative journalism, constructive journalism, educational and cultural content. And by acquiring, creating, and broadcasting uh, films, music, and other production, uh, public service media makes significant contribution to the development of the creative industry and provides support for the artists. Uh, PSMs uh, is also, are also large contributors to collective author rights uh, management organizations. Um, PSM has to hear and reflect diverse and views and perspective, uh, perspectives. Um, historically, due to its mission, public service media has to respond to the needs of diverse groups and communities and listen and reflect diverse views and perspectives. Uh, public service media must cover entire country, uh, various ages group, various convictions, and so on. And LRT now has the widest uh, network of reporters in Lithuanian regions and the network, network of co-workers around the world, uh, from Latvia to Republic of South Africa. It has dedicated a platform for Lithuanian diaspora living abroad, and it develops and uh, broadcasts content for ethnic uh, minorities and serves the needs of the uh, faithful. Uh, public service broadcasters in Europe uh, understand that they need to further strengthen their relationship with the audience and be accountable. Uh, listen to all the opinions and respond to them. As we see uh, that during uh, COVID and anti-vaxxers movement, it's not always easy. Uh, recently, uh, in LRT, we established uh, a new uh, initiative, which is called LRT, uh, LRT Hears You, uh, which is addressed uh, Mm, addressed to the, uh, our audience, and we, we want to hear actual uh, social issues from them and then uh, produce a content ba based on these uh, stories, uh, which started a month ago and it's, uh, it's going uh, very well. Uh, cooperating with different cultural and educational institutions, we help to create and distribute quality and meaningful content and enhance social network networks. News is very important for, for LRT, it's our top genre, and um, PSM uh, across Europe on average spent nearly one third of its budget on news. And LRT is the only media group in Lithuania that broadcasts news uh, around the clock. And uh, PSM has a prominent role in verifying and exposing information and in cooperation with the BCME and other institutions, LRT has implemented a number of multi-platform projects, exposing manipulations and strengthening uh, media literacy. And currently we are running information security project on TikTok for younger audiences. Um, another, uh, another obligation of uh, public service media is uh, power to bring people together consolidating, strengthening solidarity and unity of our uh, society is our mission. And LRT demonstrates its unique ability um, uh, and role to mobilize the whole society around important initiatives. Uh, you can see it here, uh, uh, commemorating of uh, the Baltic, uh, Baltic chain, uh, Freedom Way rally to support uh, people of Belarus uh, and all other uh, initiatives. Um, PSM needs to also um, further its role of exposing disinformation, explaining and education, educating uh, audiences. And um, 
not only ex exposing fakes, but also sources, interests, and techniques uh, behind them to show how public space is being misused, what trolls and politicians are doing there. It is absolutely necessary to explain educate, and educate the audiences to strengthen uh, critical judgment, ability to recognize manipulations, and uh, make well informed uh, uh, and help to make well informed decisions. Uh, last but not least, uh, we invest uh, in uh, investigative journalism and uh, mm, to hold the powerful uh, to hold the powerful to account. And uh, soon we will be showing an investigative journalism uh, movie about the, the riots that you saw pictures from. And uh, by, by doing this, by investing into investigative journalism, we we'll bring more transparency, accountability, and uh, strengthen public trust and democracy in media. Um, realizing the unique role of PSM, it does not uh, come by surprise uh, that uh, PSM organizations uh, led the initiative of Brussels Declaration. They committed to take efforts to protect journalists and media freedom to support public service media as they are a key uh, for democracy. And I, I use this opportunity to invite the other uh, public service media to support this declaration by, uh, by signage. Uh, well, last but not least, uh, to safeguard uh, democracy and strengthen uh, so, um, uh, socialist resilience, uh, governments have to employ their best efforts to communicate. Uh, their decisions better to protect independent media, to ensure journalist safety, which is a, a very big issue now, and uh, in their responsibility to guarantee conditions through uh, sustainable and sufficient funding uh, for public service uh, media independence, competitiveness, and contribution to society. So, the you know last uh, uh, statement is that uh, strong, credible, and free uh, public service media is important uh, for all. Mm, all media, all society, and uh, democracies. So thank you very much. I don't know if we have time for questions, but not, maybe not now. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. It's on lupatud platsuta. It's allowed. Hey, Monica, don't. don't. Yeah, yeah no, no. okay. The story is not <laughs> Not over yet? Okay. Yes. So as you all hear and you are viewing us online, you can all submit your questions as Slido. And the password is media2021. Uh, so we should see uh, the slide. So this is where you can submit your questions. Just raise your hand if you have questions. And the option to go to slido, sli.do, and type in media2020. And this is for questions. Open, uh, uh, open for a full day. Uh, I will make a start. Is there any hope? Yes, yes there is. I do. I'm a strong believer of public service media and uh, uh, although the environment is very fragmented but uh, and there is more and more of pressure but I believe that if uh, public service media play their cards right that if they do uh, try to be uh, aim to be useful for societies, to um, be with them, engage with them, to be accountable, to be impartial. So I think there is, uh, I think there is hope, and especially in the small countries like uh, like Baltics, uh, because we have so um, I would say so little quality uh, alternative, and because uh, because that some in the small countries uh, public service media sometimes is the only media that. Uh, for example, does quality investigative journalism or invest into children's content. And we also must think about our future uh, generations and future about our kids and provide them uh, uh, needed content. Also, it is very important that uh, public service uh, media would be allowed to, to proceed their operations uh, online, uh, not, that it would not be limited uh, by the decisions of European Commission. Uh, uh, yeah, so it is important because it's our future. Uh, PSMs need to adapt to be digital, to be online, and be where their audiences are. One uh, obstacle coming up is the funding of public service media in the Baltic countries. How it's in Lithuania? 
In Lithuania, we now have pretty good and independent model. Uh, we, our budget is formed from a certain uh, percent of taxes from general income tax and excise duties. Uh, and we do not have to confirm our budget in Parliament every year, which make, make us uh, independent. This was confirmed by, the, by our constitutional court, although, of course, in the past, uh, in the very recent past, there were a lot of attempts to, to, to change this model to, to yeah, well, it's, as we far, very well know, the commercial media is also putting a lot of pressure. But uh, I think that uh, it is, the, the financing is pretty stable, therefore we are able to plan uh, our activities. And uh, I urge everybody to embrace this model, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we admire actually, the Lithuanian politicians have made a very good decision about the funding. We're still looking forward to have something implemented in Estonia too. And yeah. You have a lot more money than Estonians do, and that's not. <laughs> no, we are, actually our budgets are very similar. Uh, and, yeah, but it's. Uh, and anyway. Estonia has twice as li uh, well, not that twice, but you know, much little uh, inhabitants, uh, which you know, it's all, also it shows that uh, in Estonia there is a high understanding of uh, that. You know, it needs to be invested in uh, in public service media, and we we well we admire and see it also as an example. Yes, a question uh, from Slido. How are journalists in LRT dealing with the aftermath of attack from their co-citizens? What can be done to fix these relations and heal? Yes, we took several measures. Uh, one of them was that we, uh, we organized uh, trainings for all the journalists, not only for LRT, but for all the journalists, with, uh, together with police forces, to just to give them an understanding how they should physically uh, protect themselves during the riots. So it's one thing. Another thing is that we equipped them with the um, safety equipment like caps, uh, he uh, helmets, uh, and all kinds of, 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 of things. And another, of course, thing that we provide them psychological support. We also, thanks to, to uh, international organizations and NGOs, for example, our um, um, some of our editors just went through training on how to cope with harassment online. And we, according to these trainings, we provided um, uh, like guidelines for our journalists and for our editors, what, you know, how to behave when, you're, when the journalist is attacked. But it's uh, obvious that uh, the, uh, the, you should emphasize the safety of the journalist in your, uh, in your guidelines, in your editorial guidelines, and the, uh, the company should also take responsibility for it. Thank you. Now it's more political question, and I'm not sure it's if anybody here can uh, give a proper answer. But the question is, from Andris Melakaus, uh, how do a Russian state media qualify as a public service media for membership of EBU? That's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, I'm also a member of EBU executive board, and we have been lately uh, discussing a lot, a lot about it. And. Uh, uh, as you might probably hear, uh, the Belarusian uh, public broadcaster was, well, not a public, it's actually state broadcaster, was suspended uh, as a member of uh, EBU. Also, it showed that uh, there is a lack of um, clarity on procedures in, in, in EBU regarding this issue. And now, recently, the three working groups were established to discuss the issue uh, both of, uh, of uh, procedures inside EBU and of the values issue. Because uh, EBU is a very broad organization, as, as they say, a broad church, and uh, it needs to be, um, I would say, more uh, clear uh, what EBU is about. And so that these questions should, should be answered by like in the next half of a year or so. Mm, okay, this is, we will, slightly touch on the same issue in the next presentation, but now I'm looking into audience. Kassin on Kusi Musikelle Kilges Um Any questions from the audience? Would anyone like to ask questions? Please put up your hand if you desire to do so. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm blinded, but we do have a question from the audience. A microphone, if you please. If you could go and uh, take them, receive the microphone from their side. Um, I do apologize uh, for the delay. We are clearly 
um, spaced far between ourselves. But anyway, the microphone is here now, so my name Estonian Public Broadcasting Company. I would like to hear about uh, your experience in dealing with uh, topics that are very divisive in society. Uh, you were talking about the, the various divisive issues and, and how do you handle uh, such topics uh, which clearly divide the audience or the public? Let's say issues of vaccination or restrictions uh, regarding the pandemic. Um, any kind of set of guidelines that you have for this? Uh, and what are the biggest challenges that you find yourself in when you deal with, with those uh, topical everyday mm. questions? Yeah, this is a very good question because as I mentioned in my, in my presentation that uh, we often hear demands from anti-vaxxers and anti-vaxxers members of parliament uh, to be here and to, to get the ear to, to uh, present their position. So we don't have a, uh, guidelines but we discuss about it every day. And, uh, well, of course, there is always two sides. Uh, uh, one is that we should educate our audience and not to, to allow, it, not to, to distribute information that is not based on, uh, on science facts as the second opinion. So, however, uh, from time we, uh, to time we do, we give them the voice uh, uh, very heavily, con con uh, putting it into context. Uh, commenting uh, by uh, experts, uh, uh, putting up together comments uh, by experts and so on. Uh, it is clear that you need to seek for a dialogue with this uh, part of society as well. Also the sensitive issues like uh, LGBT rights, which always mm, spark uh, the discussions from both sides, the conservative side of society and human uh, human rights side, uh, but we do not try to avoid these uh, issues and like somehow get away from it and be calm and untouchable. Uh, we discuss it and we bring it up, uh, trying to balancing it. Uh, uh, well, I don't know if I answered <laughs> your question. Are there any other questions? Uh, any other questions? Yes, as I um, thank you for your presentation and your answers. And, but my question is about the uh, legal framework and uh, legal conditions of the activities of the public service media in the new digital environment, uh, especially about the uh, current rules in the EU on. Uh, the state aid and the funding of the public service media. What do you think? Is there a need to revise, to update the functioning of these rules? Because we know that there are several cases in the EU, including in the Baltic states, mm -hmm. where there are unfortunately conflicts between the private and public mm -hmm. media. And uh, what do you think? How to assess or are these uh, rules on the public service media the funding and the uh, application of the state aid rules still valid? Are they do they support the development and the activities of public service media or do they restrict it? I would like to hear your mm. opinion about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a very, uh, very relevant question. I mentioned it uh, in my presentation that there is, yes, the, there are several cases now in, in the European uh, Commission regarding state aid. Uh, I think that uh, I think European Commission, you know, should not uh, base their uh, decisions on the uh, on the precedents that on the, their decisions that they were, you know, brought up like uh, ten or fifteen years ago because the landscape changed so much. And as I said in my presentation, without presence in uh, digital uh, platforms, uh, PSM will have no future. Uh, and it is very important. You, you see, you know, that the young audiences, and even not young, and even, you know, uh, average age audiences, more and more uh, uh, um, 
consume uh, content uh, on demand, uh, they consume content uh, in the news websites, uh, non-linear uh, and so on. So this has to be, uh, the European Commission have to pay attention to it and even more, especially during after pandemics, everybody realized how public service media is important, that it, uh, it, it is trusted, it is uh, quality and it, uh, Mm, its role was very important. So I, I hope that uh, they will pay attention to all these issues when bringing up their uh, decisions. Yeah, and we will have supportive data on the issue later today when we present politic research on media consumption and trust in the media. That's the one point we will touch uh, after the lunch. Any other questions? I don't see any. There don't seem to be any at Slido. And I'm really happy that here we have a presenter who can answer all the questions related to regulation. Am I correct, Adam? We'll see. I'll just get some water, so... Uh... Yes, uh, water we have. Uh, we have still a freedom to pick up a bottle of water. I don't know where I have all the answers, but... Yeah. Uh... And the next speaker comes from the UK. His name is Adam Baxter, uh, chair of Ofcom, uh, responsible for licensing, and online content. Licensing and online content. Is it correct? Uh, not quite, but it's more or less. I mean, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually uh, Ofcom Director of Standards and Audience Protection. Oh, that's even but, but better. It's, it's broadly right. But, but it's uh, even better. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. What we expect from you is media should protect us. And you oh, will take God. care of it. I don't know about that, but um, um, it's the, I think I'm, is the microphone working? I hope it is. Anyway, um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a real delight to be here today. It's the first time I've been in Estonia, an absolutely beautiful country, and I, um, I'm really disappointed I can't stay longer because it's, it's, it, and it, um, Tallinn is a beautiful city. Um, and, and also, it's lovely to actually get out and meet people again, and rather than just being in the zoom averse or teams averse, which is, uh, I think we'll all agree, slightly super re real or hyper real. Um, and I think this is such a fascinating discussion, is it not? And actually hearing Monica's um, excellent presentation, um, it shows that these sort of themes are not just nation only, they're, they're sort of pervasive. They are truly transnational. Um, now let's, uh, obviously like any regulator, Ofcom has so much, um, had so many issues to deal with any day. I mean, it's, it'd be impossible in just uh, 20 minutes or so to cover them all. So what I wanted to do is just pick a flavour of some of the things. And some of these will touch on some of the points that Monica was making so eloquently. Um, and I, maybe it's a bit of a sort of counterpoint to her. We, we heard her sort of talk about some of the supply side issues. You know, obviously, the importance of uh, quality journalism, PSM. And I will touch on that. But also, because of my day-to-day -day job as director of standards, um, I'll also want to talk about more like the demand side, so what actually the viewers, the audiences think, because it's no doubt that we're in a very weird time, are we not? Um, the pandemic has uh, dominated all countries, and I think um, it has definitely had an effect on everybody in very different ways, and I think, as I'll come on to in a minute, um, in what how our audiences, how they behave and feel. I think it's definitely had some sort of um, effect. Um, so just um, very much this is what, what I'm doing so day in and day out, and just talking about what audiences feel. Um, 2021 saw exponential rise in the number of complaints. I mean, as these figures show, we were sort of, whoops, gosh, sorry. Uh, they what, uh, are the complaints we were um, dealing with day in, day out were staying fairly stable over a number of years. And then last year, we saw a 300% increase. Um, and I mean, why, why is that? Well, I mean, no doubt people being at home during the pandemic, maybe they felt more appetite to complain more. Maybe they're watching more TV and radio. Who knows? 
Um, but it is just a, a fascinating thought. And as I'll come on to in a minute, a huge increase was the number of um, complaints around offence. And I mean, I've, I've tried to think about why this might be um, myself. And, um, and without doing further research, it's very hard to know precisely. But um, in the UK at the moment, and I don't know what it's like in other countries, um, there's a great much more heat uh, in social and political discourse. Um, the press often talk about this concept of the culture wars. So um, the idea that there are sort of hugely polarised and very, very angry sides to an argument, and Monica was touching on some of these issues, the di divisive issues, so vaccination, anti-vax, trans rights, gender identity theory, uh, dare I say it, the B word, Brexit, non-Brexit. All these, these debates have been incredibly polarizing. And I think there's no doubt that some of the, the uptick in complaints we've seen from audiences over the last uh, year, 18 months, must in some way be, be, be linked to that. Um, I've done a sort of a bit of a breakdown on some of the issues. I mean, the figures, don't, don't worry about the figures in detail, but you'll see how offense just dwarfs the other categories. But even the other categories like harm, due impartiality, which I'll come on to in a bit, very important to us, um, have seen uh, an increase as well. Um, so going into offence a, a, a bit more, um, as you'll see, the, there's a huge uptick in complaints, but actually only a, a, a doubling of, of the cases we've um, dealt with. And it shows you that actually... Yes, we've seen a huge increase in complaints, but some of the, a vast majority of those complaints are driven by what we call complaint events. So um, single bits of content that have just attracted huge numbers of complaints. Um, indeed, back in March of this year, just, so just before the end of the 2021 period, that line at the bottom, over 54,000 complaints about one programme, this, this uh, uh, sort of very uh, leading morning magazine news program on ITV, which is our leading commercial public service broadcaster, Good Morning Britain. Um, a sort of quite notorious presenter called Piers Morgan. I don't know whether he's known about in the Baltic States or elsewhere in Europe. Uh, he's been very big in America, but he, was, uh, he got, attracted a huge number of complaints because he very publicly criticized Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex, um, who some of you may have heard of, who's married to Prince Harry. Um, Meghan Markle's an American citizen, a, a former actress, and um, I think uh, she's had a huge effect on our country in terms of, uh, first of all, bringing a totally new uh, approach to how to be a royal, or a member of the royal family in, in this country, but she's had a huge effect, and she's cre uh, created a lot of debate, and he was highly, highly critical of her, indeed, because she'd made a very high public, high profile interview with um, Oprah Winfrey in America saying how her mental health had greatly been affected as while well, she was a member of the royal family living in the UK. He very publicly um, repudiated her, said, I don't believe her. She's lying. Um, she's, she's not to be trusted. And we got uh, over 50,000 complaints. But um, we actually decided not to find a breach of our rules because the important thing was... Um, Yes, what he said was highly offensive, and a lot of people said it was harmful because of the claims about mental health. A lot of people said he was being racist because she is a woman of colour, and some of his comments could be interpreted by some as being racist. But we said, uh, no, it's not a problem, in the sense that it would be a chilling restriction of freedom of expression, and we're talking about media freedom today. It would be a chilling restriction of freedom of expression to stop him saying that. But what the broadcaster did, had to do, and they did do, was ensure that, as this is what Monica was saying, context is provided, challenge, critiquing, repudiation. And there were other people on that program who challenged him. So I think that's a really, in one case, that shows a lot of the themes that are going on here, the importance of freedom of expression, the fact that you have this huge heat, the culture wars going on, polarized positions, but it shows that uh, in a free media um, underpinned by you know, Article 10, ECHR rights, freedom of expression, um, as long as you have sensible, well-resourced uh, public service broadcasters, public service media who understand the rules, 
they should have total liberty to, to explore these very divisive topics. Um, so that was a fascinating case. But offence, okay, got the most complaints, but for us, and I think a lot of people here would agree, the, what we should really be concerned about in terms of protecting audiences is harm. And we, we obviously know the, the traditional concerns around hate speech, incitement to crime, abusive treatment, and we do, unfortunately, get a number of those sort of cases. Very few, fortunately, um, actually require us to take any next steps. Um, but where we do find instances of uh, uncontextualised hate speech or incitement, we will uh, investigate and impose significant sanctions on those broadcasters. I'm pleased to say it's not the public service broadcasters, it's very small niche broadcasters with small audiences, but it's very important that we, as a regulator, come down very heavily uh, on that. I think, and this is once again another um, theme that was alluded to in Monica's uh, presentation, have seen during uh, that year, 2020, 2021, a huge increase in harm complaints relating to the COVID. So we talked about sort of anti-vaxxing, but that's one issue. Um, people actually claiming COVID is a hoax, that COVID was being caused by 5G technology, that, uh, well, going back to vaccines, you know, vaccinations uh, are harmful, but it's, you know, Bill Gates trying to impose his hegemony and will on the uh, population through the use of vaccines, all this sort of stuff. So we've seen, once again, a number of small broadcasters come out with this very, very damaging, potentially harmful stuff without context, without challenge. And I think that, once again, going back to that theme I mentioned a moment ago, broadcasters should have freedom to feature this quite challenging stuff as long as they contextualise it. So in going back to the gentleman's question a moment ago, um, how to deal with this sort of stuff, I think our broadcasters, in particular our PSBs, are very, very well able to deal and challenge and contextualise and critique these very challenging, um, so sort of quite um, controversial views. The problem for us is when you have these little small broadcasters who just put a person up, like an anti-vaxxer, unchallenged, um, and just being given a, effectively like a soapbox, a platform, to um, transmit these really uh, very uh, harmful views. And at the bottom here, I've just, just given you an outline of the number of statutory sanctions we imposed. So um, totaling about 770,000 sterling in euros, that's probably a bit less than a million, I guess, 900,000 euros. So it's quite a significant amount of cash. Coming on to another interesting area, due impartiality, due accuracy. Although we don't get as many complaints, um, we still saw a sort of a um, bit of an uptick in complaints, as I've laid out there. Um, but there's a bit of a mismatch because a lot of politicians in our country, media commentators say, oh, there's a real issue about impartiality, in particular impartiality on the BBC, the um, uh, wholly public um, PSB. But actually, if you look at the compliance record of the big PSBs, um, it's pretty good. So what's going on here? Well, our research, when we last did some research on audience perceptions of the BBC's impartiality a couple of years ago, showed that actually what is driving perceptions isn't program or content, it's other factors. So it could be factors around people's perception of the BBC brand, of what they're reading in the press or hearing commentators or politicians saying about the BBC's impartiality. So it's an interesting, almost like meta debate going on here. Um, and I think we're going to have to do some more work on this because this isn't an issue that's going away. Um, uh, the present government has made clear, um, and I can un totally understand why, why it really wants the BBC to attend to impartiality. The new, relatively new Director General of the BBC, Tim Davey, has said he really wants to make due impartiality a priority. And just the last couple of points, I just thought just of interest, um, even though we haven't had any sort of investigations, major investigations in recent years, um, just some ongoing issues from past investigations. So um, we, uh, back in the end of 2018, uh, published a, a very significant decision in relation to RT, Russia Today, as was, um, and we subsequently imposed a, f a fine of £200,000 for multiple breaches of our due impartiality rules. RT have chosen to try and go through the UK courts. They 
sought a judicial review, lost at the High Court in March 2020. Just they went to then our Court of Appeal, and they lost just a few weeks ago the Court of Appeal 100% backed off comms approach. Um, and RT are indicating they now want to apply to our Supreme Court. So the, the story goes on. So we will see where that goes to. And then um, the Russians are at a certain stage and the Chinese follow in their wake. So CGTN, Chinese state broadcaster who we used to license, we similarly um, recorded a number of breaches of our gym partiality rules. And, they, and we imposed a financial penalty, £125,000. And they are challenging those decisions in, in the court. So it shows yet another pressure on, this time it's not pressure on the broadcast, the public service broadcaster, but on the pressure on the regulator. When we have to carry out our duties, we must make so, so sure that whenever we make a decision, they are as legally robust as possible because they can be so easily challenged at any point. And then I was mindful also of coming to uh, the Baltic states um, that we, over recent years, have had a number of uh, complaints from our sister regulators uh, in Lithuania and Latvia in particular against some uh, Russia phone channels uh, in the Baltics. A number of these we no longer license post-Brexit for, for obvious reasons, but um, it is interesting that um, we upheld a lot of um, complaints and um, indeed we imposed a £20,000 um, uh, financial penalty. I'm just mindful of the time here, so I'm going to try and um, go on. There is a time. Don't worry. Okay. So just going on, leaving the world of standards behind, um, and just again picking out sort of a, a theme that Monica was talking about, and back to, I suppose, the more of the supply side. Public service media, I'm really interested. When I first started going to a uh, conference like this many years ago, we were always talking about PSB, PSB, PSB. And I think it is an interesting and, and totally right development that we're now talking about public service media. And Ofcom has re recognized this, and we kicked off about two years ago, I think, um, our review um, called with the, the title Small Screen Big Debate. And it was all about the future of public service broadcasting. But actually, very quickly, we adopted the label public service media because it, we're not talking about just linear broadcast anymore. It's reaching those audiences, in particular the young, difficult to reach audiences on all platforms. And back in July, for those of you who aren't aware of it, we published our statement where we set out a package of recommendations about how public service media should, the, the framework should be adapted. Because our major bit of uh, legislation, the Communications Act, was passed in 2003. And my gosh, 18 years ago, um, what was it like in terms of media delivery? I mean, we're in a whole different world now. So our legislation, I'm sure like a lot of other people's legislation, needs to catch up. Um, and we're sort of talking to government about, um, because obviously it's not up to us, um, a lot of these changes need legislative underpinning to, to um, give them life. Um, and so we're, we've been talking to the government about sort of how these issues, for instance, improving um, prominence of uh, PSM, uh, content on different platforms, how the legislation can be adapted to, to make those work. And the government has indicated that it will come out with a white paper, maybe by the end of this year, um, we shall see. Um, and then there would have to be then subsequently a media bill, a piece of media legislation um, to, to tackle that. And then finally, I thought I'd just spend a, a few minutes talking about another huge um, uh, bit of activity. Um, online safety and uh, video sharing platforms. As we know, uh, the latest iteration of the AVMSD required member states to, for the first time to bring in rules around the regulation of video sharing platforms. Um, the United Kingdom um, Parliament brought in regulations in November last year which actually uh, enforced or brought into place the VSP, the video sharing platform requirements. And we, as the regulator of video sharing platforms, have started our tentative first steps in that area. And the last few months since those regulations came into place, the team at Ofcom that is regulating in this area 
have consulted um, and brought into place um, various bits of guidance on, firstly, determining which services fall into scope of the new regime, also um, guidance about very important area protection measures for users of these services. And um, I think it's very initial first steps, and it's going to be fascinating how this carries on. But of course, this will be this is really important learning ground for us because the government has already indicated that uh, what actually it wants to do is bring in a piece for online safety legislation, which will supersede the VSP rules and make and actually widen them out. So what we have here at the moment is um, just a bit of a description of the timeline of a draft online safety bill that the government published back in about the middle of the year. And it's currently going through a process of pre-legislative scrutiny in Parliament. So a cross-parliamentary uh, committee of members from both houses of our Parliament are looking in detail at the legislation. Our chief executive, Melanie Dawes, gave evidence to that committee at the beginning of last week. And um, I think there's a lot of features of this, this regime which are worth um, just just noting as we go along. And they, of course, they might change because you know things go through parliaments and can change. But at the moment, as the draft uh, regime um, uh, is actually being set out in this, this draft bill, which I just wanted to go through. Just before I leave this slide, um, the intention is for the new regime to come in, play in 2023, 2024, which actually is a long time, isn't it, in, <laughs> in terms of how new media develops. And obviously the first and the, the, the loud demands for the more egregious forms of online behaviour is constant now. So we have a, an issue to, to sort of how to sort of balance the fact that we're not there in terms of this new regime and the fact that the public and a lot of commentators want this, these new rules in yesterday, as it were. But um, just I won't go through this in detail, and I'm sure these... These, these slides will be available, won't they? If, I mean, if uh, people, if they want to look at them later. I mean, if, if not, I mean, if you contact me, I'm very happy to share these slides. But this just runs through some of the, um, the uh, systems. As a person who does, you know, content standards uh, on a, a, as a daily job, the thing that really strikes me is fascinating is that at present, the traditional way we regulate linear broadcast content video on demand content is that individual members of the audience can complain to us, the regulator, about an individual program. We assess it. If, it pretend, if it's potentially problematic, we can then investigate it. What the government has been very clear is that um, this new system, Ofcom won't have that role. We, we won't be actually assessing and judging on individual pieces of online content. So this last bullet point here. Our role will be more as sort of a strategic supervisory role, looking at things like the terms and conditions of the platforms to make sure that they are um, taking due account of the various statutory duties in terms of due care, to, to make sure there that they are not to, to actually guarantee that there will never be sort of harmful content on their platforms, but that they have the adequate processes to deal with them if they are alerted to them, or that they have adequate processes to make best endeavours and attempts to, to um, ensure that they are spotting that content. And also, just um, an important thing about media freedom is obviously journalism and media freedom. There's some interesting proposals about online journalism. Um, the fact that um, so-called Category 1 services, which are the big, the, the big services that will come into the scope of the regime, must have um, uh, uh, processes uh, in place to protect content of journalistic, uh, journalistic content. And uh, the second bullet point there talks about you know, what, what will be constituted uh, or considered to be uh, journalistic content. And with disinformation, there's obviously any uh, discussion about online harms, online safety, uh, disinformation, misinformation is never far away. And in the draft bill at present, um, the way this is being dealt with is there's a proposal for a disinformation advisory committee um, that Ofcom will be required to form of experts, platform representatives and civil society 
um, to advise on issues around transparency, media literacy, etc. So I rather than to go any more in detail on this, I think I will draw to a close. And if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Yes. First of all, I must correct. Uh, I didn't receive complaint, but I, I feel I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry because, Monica, that belongs to you. It's sometimes media also mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and yours, uh, you still need to... <laughs> I need to perform a bit. Yes. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we'll yeah, see if okay. there will be any complaints about your presentation right now, but we have questions. Uh, okay, yeah. Yes. And uh, in the Slido, please, you can share the Slido slide, but uh, already a couple of questions have arrived. Uh, starting from a uh, question from Andris. The definition of incitement to violence and hate speech differ from state to state, leading to inconsistent regulation of Russian channels. Why? Uh, ah, that's, that's interesting. Um, I think um, I mentioned a moment ago um, some of the um, complaints we'd had from sister regulators in, in some of the Baltic states about some of these Russia phone channels, and I think it's fair to say they were characterised or couched to us in terms of incitement. But actually, when we looked at the, the content, um, I mean, incitement and hate speech, it's, I mean, there's, there's a, I think the way we view it, there's a bit of a, a sliding scale. There's, a, there's a, a range, a spectrum, if you will. And so you can get stuff which is obviously anodyne and not a problem through to offensive, through to potential hate speech and incitement. And for us, there was a lot of content, for instance, which could be heavily critical about, say, the Lithuanian state for instance, just to take an example, but it, or the Lithuanian people, but it didn't, to us, in those particular cases, amount to hate speech. And so, but what we did feel, and we made this clear when we recorded a number of briefs of our rules, was that um, there were concerns under our due impartiality rules. So it's very one-sided, biased, um, say, debate about whatever it was, maybe the, action, the policies and actions of, say, um, the Lithuanian government or the Latvian government. And so that's, I mean, it, without going into, and obviously every case turns on its facts. So, um, and I appreciate that not everybody will agree with our decisions, and that's totally fine. I mean, that's, the freedom to disagree is an important freedom, right? Um, but for us, we look very forensically and cl closely at what has been broadcast, the context, and um, when, whether something is hate speech or not, um, it, it would depend, you know. So, I mean, it's very difficult to give a general answer to a question like that. It depends on the facts, but I'm just mindful of some of those past complaints we had from this particular region of the world, and it was notable that they were put to us in terms of incitement and hate speech, but for us, they weren't. But, you know, maybe we got it wrong, you know. People will disagree with us. Yeah, thank you. A couple of questions more. How many, how many people are working in Ofcom just to answer all these complaints? Um, very good question. Actually, um, I've been very uh, pleased that because um, my big boss, uh, Melanie, the chief executive, has been very um, quick to recognise the pressure we've been under. So we've actually taken on um, a number of new staff this year. So currently the team dealing with broadcast and on-demand standards is roughly 42, 43-ish. Um, I mean, they're not always all doing those standards. I mean, some of them might be also doing a little bit of work on other teams, like maybe online safety or, or, or whatever, but that is their main team. And then we will have separate teams, like a separate team, which is regulating uh, VSPs and developing the regime for online safety. We also have a separate team um, which we call content policy, who are the people who, who are basically um, spending their time developing the PSM, the Public Service Media um, Framework. And we also have a team um, that uh, does all the licensing of, of broadcast channels. And altogether, our sort of broadcasting and online group is about 125 people. You know? Yeah, but compared to the number of complaints, still a lot of work. I, I, hey, um, no, and interestingly, um, you know, we are thinking 
um, you know, are there, if we, if we think, oh, maybe 2020, 2021, is, was that a sort of one-off because of the pandemic? Um, or is that a, like a trend that's staying with us? And actually, the complaints this year so far shows that we're still at the same levels. So we are asking questions about, well, will we have to sort of adapt the way we work? Because if so many complaints are coming to us are matters of offence in the context of the culture wars and the heat, heat but no light, as it were, where we're not finding issues that are actually breaching our rules, should we deal with offence complaints slightly differently? Um, don't know. We have, we're at very early stages of those conversations at the moment. So there's a question actually related mm. to that one. To what extent the race of cultural wars or what causes a huge race of complaints is orchestrated by inter intentional actions of global political interests? Um, orchestrated campaigns are a fact of life. When I first started uh, working in this area back in 2008, still in the days where we would occasionally get a, a postcard campaign, you know, so the people would, it was an orchestrated campaign, so some lobby group would say, write to Ofcom to complain, and they'd all send in the same postcards, so you knew then. Now, of course, it's all online, so you've seen the same text of complaint, which has obviously been suggested by a individual or a group or a lobby group, um, but it all comes in digitally on our web complaint system. So uh, orchestrated cam uh, campaigns are nothing new. I think digital technology just makes it incredibly more, much more straightforward and easy and also dries up the numbers of complaints we get. Um, so there's no doubt they exist. But for us, what is key is that um, the number of complaints on an issue is interesting but it's not determinative of there's an issue under the code. So, for instance, we um, take, have taken extreme action in terms of imposing significant financial penalties for examples of, you know, say, incitement to crime after just receiving one complaint, or indeed where we've received no complaints as our monitoring has found stuff. Whereas that example I, I was talking about in my talk about Piers Morgan, over 54,000 complaints, not a problem. So it, complaints, yes, they are useful to us to alert us to potential issues, but we, we, we divorce ourselves slightly from the actual numbers of complaints, if you see what I mean, in terms of uh, what decision we come to. Are you planning to use uh, AI, artificial yes, intelligence? Yes, yes, yes. No, we, we, we are looking at uh, ways, in particular, because we license um, a lot of channels which are not in English, so in particular channels which are targeting diaspora communities, you know, in Urdu, Punjabi, uh, Pashto, Hindi, whatever it may be, using forms of AI that can actually transcribe um, content and obviously search out for key, key search terms. I mean, it's very, it's very much in its infancy at the moment, but um, that will have a dramatic uh, Im impact for our for our work. I mean, I do have a specialist team of about five or six people who are um, uh, fluent in various South Asian languages and, and they're cultural experts who can help in the translation and analysis. But if, if a lot of the actual sort of the slog work of, you know, trans, you know listening and, and translating stuff and transcribing it is done uh, by technology, AI technology, that would be a huge saving of time. Okay, now we have time for questions from the audience. Kas viin on? Jah, ma näen ühte kätt seal üleval. Kohe jõuab mikrofon ka sinna. Sinna vastu liikuda siis. Ja palu. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Sokolos. I am from the Estonia Regulatory Authority and I would like to thank you for your presentation. My question is about um, your everyday job, about your activities. Uh, you gave us uh, some statistics on the mm. cases, the complaints and yeah. some areas covered included uh, infringement of the rules on due impartiality and uh, so on. I couldn't see there, maybe I missed something the questions about the infringement uh, 
on the rules of the protection of minors against mm. harmful content. What is the share of such a complaints in um, your everyday job? And what is the statistics and the trends in this area? Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, probably much less. Um, I mean, I deliberately, I mean, as is the way with these things, you make a decision about what you, what categories, how you subdivide them, but um, they will be less. And there was an others column, which would include um, issues around protection of minors, uh, and such like. So we do get complaints about that, and we do um, reach some decisions, but we, we don't have um, the levels of concern about that. We, we get, I mean, some, and it's difficult, some of the offence complaints could be categorised as concerns around children, because if it's concerns about offensive language, say, you know, some of the, so it's difficult when you are categorising. Um, but um, in terms of co content which, like, say, pornography or uh, other sort of adult content, uh, we do get a number of complaints, but we, it's, not a, it's not a big area of concern for us in terms of broadcast and on demand. Thank you. Kas on vielä kysymyksiä? Ja siinä puolella on, we have a, if you can send some microphone over here. Suspense. <laughs> this question had better be good, right? Uh, yeah. Now you've waited. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> Hi, Adam. Hi. Thank you for your talk today. Um, I want to ask about. So I work in media literacy. Yeah. And I want to ask about how the decision of the Piers Morgan incident was communicated to the public. Yeah. Oh, just that. that, that um, yeah. Okay. So we had a lot of interest, as you probably know, telling from your accent, uh, for a fellow UK person, um, where the, the incident happened in March, we had this huge number of complaints, a lot of media coverage, and we actually launched, we announced we launched our investigation the following day. So we made very clear, yeah, this is an issue here. Now, leave us alone, we're going to investigate it. And then periodically we would get um, requests from journalists saying, oh, what's happening about Piers Morgan? So we knew that whenever we came out, um, we would, we would, it would be a big deal. And then we actually published our decision on the 1st of September. And um, the way something like that works is that um, every breach, well, every decision we make, even if we just assess something, it's not a problem in our rules, we, we publish the fact that we've looked at something as a single line in our fortnightly broadcast and on-demand bulletin. And then where we've breached something, or where there's a significant case like this where we haven't breached our rules, but it's, but it's such a significant issue, we will publish our full reasoning, and that as a sort of a document within our, our bulletin, that comes out once a fortnight, as I said. And that decision came out on the 1st of September, and was just immediately picked up by the, the press. And our comms, and obviously I work very closely with our comms team, because I, I took the decision in that case for my sins, and so we had to make sure, right, well, this is the decision, it's the write-up, and talking to the comms team, so they had press lines ready, um, so that when they got the inevitable um, uh, sort of... Um, because all the journalists are watching for our bulletin coming out, and the calls started coming in, goes online, and then it just gets picked up and disseminated through, um, first, obviously, online platforms, then the news bulletins on TV and radio, and then in the, in the daily newspapers. So that's how it works. Can I yeah, of course cool, you can. Um, so, because it seems to me it's quite important that, especially a decision like that. I mean, mm. I can't, you had fifty thousand complaints for yeah. it, but, um, but I, I'm sorry, I must interfere because most of the audience don't know actually what this is a case about. Ah, okay. So this is the Piers Morgan story with Meghan Markle that Adam referred to mm. early on in the talk, mm. and Piers Morgan is a, a very well known. Um, can I say provocative? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, no, he's, he's controversial. <laughs> On television, very well known. He did a lot of work in the states doing similar kind of, you know, high-profile provocative interviews. And on the Breakfast Show, he talked about Meghan Markle, who had just done an interview with um, Oprah. Oprah Winfrey yeah. with her husband, where they, you know, told their truths, as it were. And he was he was questioning whether they, they had been, she had been particularly honest. Mm. The wider context is that in the press in the UK, which Ofcom does not regu mm. regulate, 
that the press, there were toxic elements in the press about Meghan Markle mm. because she was um, different. She was the first mm -hmm. different kind of royal we'd ever had. Her skin color was different. Her background was mm -hmm. different. Her family background was different. Her career, previous career was different, etc. And uh, there was toxic coverage of her um, in the press. So mm. that's why it was such a big controversy. Mm. Let me ask the question, because I think the, the question is more broadly reachable for yeah. everybody, yeah. even if you don't know the story, which is, to what extent then did that context uh, filter into your thinking of the decision itself? Yeah, that's a very good question. I can see why people ask it. It's, it's what we, when I do that job, when I have to make a decision, I have to be totally forensic and look at the, a particular issue and actually, first of all, in that case, I had to ask myself, well, was Piers Morgan, did he come out with some potentially offensive stuff? Yes, absolutely, highly offensive stuff. What, did he say stuff which was potentially harmful? Yes, in terms of mental health, he was denigrating her claims to feel feeling suicidal, to saying she had mental health issues. Potentially uh, harmful, absolutely. So then, the actual content, the, the people they are has to be, you know, that doesn't come into my feeling. I have to analyse what content there is. So, yeah, the statements he made were problematic. What else in the programme was there to mitigate, challenge uh, the offence, but also protect the audience from potential harm? And because they were like his um, co-presenter, Susanna, who, you know, uh, people here won't know, but you will know Susanna. Um, but also there was a couple of other, uh, a couple of the guests very strongly repudiated him, challenged him, and other context and content. I said, right, ITV were on the right side of the line here. So we, that background noise, if you will, that doesn't come into the decision I make, and it shouldn't do, because that's, that's, that's irrelevant to the, the standards decision. I mean, I'm aware of it as a human being, as a citizen, but, you know, that's a different thing. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the audience? No complaints? No? Do I get my goodie bag now? Yes. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Life is full of surprises. Sometimes they come when we don't expect them to. That's the definition of a surprise. Tim Ward, you didn't ex uh, I'm sorry, Tim Powers, you were not expecting to come up to the stage right now, but for some reason we can't get in touch with uh, Stephen Ward, so I'd like you to come to the stage. If uh, the reason is due to the time difference with Canada, yesterday we did a test and everything was fine. Ma ei oska kõelda, mille pärast me järgmist esinejad praegu hetkel veel Zoomi tulnud ei ole. Eile ta oli ka ühel täiesti olemas. I don't know why we don't have the next speaker at Zoom. Maybe it's just too early in Canada. No. My mistake. No, no. Tim is, Tim is coming. But we, are, uh, we expected to have Stephen Ward from Canada for in Zoom. But uh, just one second, and I, uh, Tim Powells, who is an ombudsman, uh, he will take a, a stage and make a presentation. Sorry, Janet, it's, uh, yeah. You, we can. And let me remind you, all of you here, uh, looking, uh, uh, um, checking in through online, sleed.do uh, is where I get your questions. And it's great to have more questions, so we learn more from our wonderful guests that have taken the trouble to speak at our conference. But now? I believe Ombudsman must be ready for surprises. <laughs> Thank you for joining. And the clicker is on uh, there, on the stage, okay. please. Thank you. And how not to report on populism? It's almost like this question from Hamlet, to be or not to be. <laughs> OK. Is my presentation ready? I can see it, but do the, does the audience see it? Does the audience see it? 
Like that? Aha, there we are. Okay, so my name is Tim Powells and I'm the Ombudsman for VRT News, that's the Flemish Public Broadcaster. Uh, Belgium is in majority a Dutch-speaking country, so VRT is the leader on the Flemish market, which means that we are the largest broadcaster in Belgium, as far as radio and television is concerned, at the very least. Today I'm going to talk about journalism and populism, because populism affects us. Populism attacks us very often, so what, we sh what should we do with that? What should journalists, how should journalists react to populism? Now, before we talk about that, of course, we would want to know what populism is. And I would start by saying that populism exists in all parties and ideologies. Rare are those politicians who would say, or would be able to say on their deathbed that they have never said anything populist. And it goes for many other opinion makers as well. It's as old as politics itself. And basically, it is a way of speaking. It's a narrative. Now, there are many academic definitions, but I work for television, so I like simple definitions. And this is mine. Populism is everything's rotten. The system's rotten. The government is rotten. The people are pure. And how fortunate are we? I am the people. If you say that, if you talk like that, you're a populist. OK. Now, unfortunately, it often goes along with scornful and exaggerating, aggressive uh, kind of speaking against the establishment, but also against the media, uh, with scapegoats, everything is to blame on this or that group, or conspiracy theories. Now, populism works, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know of any part in history where it didn't work. And more importantly, populism can be a legitimate voice of what people feel. So that makes it kind of hard. You cannot always condemn it by definition. Uh, but first of all, let us look at an example of what, according to me, is populism. Nope. The clip should start. Just put play. <laughs> I didn't do anything. <laughs> Shall we just skip it? Well, I'll tell what's in the fragment. In the fragment, you will see Greta Thunberg, who says uh, at an important international conference, politicians have been giving us fairy tales and they've been doing nothing. The young people are the hope. And between brackets, I am the young people. So basically, this is populism. I'm sorry. If you say things like that, that's populism. I'm not saying it's forbidden, but it's populism. Because, well, you portray yourself as the only representative of a certain group that is pure and all the others are rotten. We have our own uh, school strikes and, and climate marches in Belgium with uh, our own Greta Thunberg. I often receive complaints about that. You're stuffing this down our throat. Every week you're reporting on it. Um, and and, and you're, you're, just, you're just promoting the Green Party because you're giving so much attention to this problem. So it, it, it's a bit tricky for us, and it makes us vulnerable for populistic attacks. So one of the questions as a news ombudsman that I had to answer was, was there too much attention for climate marches or global warming? And this is my answer. There can never be too much good journalism. Right, so the bottom line is, what do you do with it? And very often, indeed, we made a little report about the climate march, but we're not really explaining something or not really asking critical questions. So good journalism is no free rides. 
do your job. So free rides are opposed to asking questions. Now the first question is of course the basic question, why does it matter? If you attach a lot of importance to something, please explain to your public why it is important and explain it over and over again. Maybe you could even have a, a grey little text, a basic text, which you put on every article that is about climate change. Why is it important? But secondly, there is also a reductional question, a, a question about the content. What does the climate report say on these one and a half degrees? Is it really a tipping point? Is it really 12 years or do we have time until uh, 2050, as, as other people say? These are answers that we should give. We should explain to our audiences what is in the climate report and what is not. We, too often we ask climate activists to explain what the problem is. Their role is to explain what we should do according to them. But the facts is something we should explain. Or we should, we should look for scientists that are not activists, but really can stick to the science. And of course, we're not asking questions about this because we like the Green parties or the marches, but because politicians themselves have said that they were going to do something about it. It's not really working out. And we can point out that most or an overwhelming majority of climate scientists support the idea that the climate is in danger. Mind you, I, I advise my reduction not to say consensus. Because you don't have a consensus from the moment that somebody is, doesn't agree. <laughs> if there is one dissident voice, you don't have a consensus. But it's an overwhelming majority. And we should say that over and over again. So, the next thing is, ask questions that show that you know your public. Some people just need their car. An electric car for them is expensive. They just have practical problems that public transportation is not going to solve. If gas prices go high, we had a professor in Belgium saying, it's good that gas prices are high because people will only change their habits if they feel it in their wallets. But hey, how many people are living in an apartment building? The central heating is downstairs. They have no choice. The only thing they can do is pay the gas prices. And we should ask that question. We should show that we know the daily struggle of common people, because if we don't, populists will do it for us. So it's important that we do this. Then again, avoid intuitive signals. And this is something which is a bit more complicated. I get it from the theory of Jonathan Haid and this book. Um, I have a whole separate presentation on this. I'm just going to stick to some basics here. And Mr. Haid is doing research on what steers our moral judgment in terms of psychology. And the first thing that he taught me is that our indignation, our moral in, in, uh, our, our anger, is very often steered by intuitive things and not by rational things. We would hope it's the other way around, but no, <laughs> that's not the case. So that means that we provoke likes or dislikes, indignation or complaints, by things that very often we do not really choose very consciously. And we should be careful about that. One of the elements that was strong in this for me was our reporting on Donald Trump when he just was elected. Uh, there were very many little sentences where you could just feel some disapproval. Now, mind you, and to be very clear, if Mr. Trump says that injecting bleach water is a feasible thing to do against corona, we journalists should say that that is nonsense and that you should not do it because it's dangerous. But we should not make little sentences. So if you criticize, criticize out in the open with rational argumentation and not convicting someone between the lines. And we did that in the beginning, so I, I, may, I gave workshops on that. But the second thing is, well, this fragment, and I hope it starts, because here I can really show you that how intuitive signals work. So let's try. Welcome, allemaal. Welcome here on the 20th and voorlopig last climate betoging for the verkiezingen. We staan here in the buurt van Centraal Station, and uh, Youth for Climate is er helemaal klaar voor. Anouna de Wever and uh, Kira Gantwa. Herinneren jullie zich nog die allereerste keer, 10 januari? Hoe was dat? Uh, ja, ik dacht eigenlijk dat we maar met twee mensen er gingen staan en dan waren er 3000 en nu het allerlaatste, de allerlaatste keer en er staan echt al veel mensen en ik ben zo blij en dat is echt 
gek als je nadenkt, de voorbije zes maanden, wat er allemaal al gebeurd is, is ik ben echt super blij. Welk gevoel overheerst, Anuna? Ja, echt trotsheid eigenlijk op mijn generatie, omdat ze toch zoiets hebben van we gaan er nog een laatste. Oké, okay, anyone een idee wat ik mean met intuitive signals? Ja. That's it. <laughs> That's very much it. And if you if you analyze what we're talking about, well, it's things like I'm sorry, where does that go? <laughs> okay, but it, it's things like welcome at the climate manifestation. A journalist should never say that. Welcome at the Facebook Live where we report on the climate manifestation. Also, she's calling Anuna de Wever, Anuna, first name basis. Don't do that. What emotion do you have is not really the most critical question, is it? But on top of that, the way in which she stands there with her backpack, with these clothes, it's just as if she's part of one of the students. And I had very lengthy conversations with Anne de Bee, who, by the way, is a great reporter. And in her defense, this was never broadcasted. This was a Facebook Live. And in the beginning, when we did these Facebook Lives, uh, our journalists were asked to be somewhat more loose. It's for the young audience. It's something different. But you know, you end up sending signals that you're not really impartial. And so I use this example to get rid of, uh, of that habit to, to say that, well, for Facebook, it should be different. It should not be different. It should be impartial. Intuitive signals. I would like to see my presentation. I'm terribly sorry, the presentation. Um, so apparently there's a technical problem. Um, I'll try to remember what I was supposed to say <laughs> after this point. The, uh, an extra element is, so I talked about intuitive signals, and the second insight from Jonathan Hayde is that intuitive signals also work on the field of group recognition. So with these intuitive signals, you kind of say to your audience, we know you or we don't know you. Just like with the question about the gas central heating. And this means that sometimes people really want to hear something. It is, I call that, a flag. For instance, Greta Thunberg goes to New York on this ship. Remember that? 15 days on a ship. But unfortunately, the crew flew back and another crew came up meaning that not too many plane tickets were saved. Actually, more carbon dioxide was exhausted in that whole thing. It was a stunt. Then say it was a stunt. And in one of the uh, clips that I would show you in my wonderful presentation, I show to you that VRT just fails to say that, which is not a good thing. Because people who are skeptic see this as their flag. And if it's correct, we should say it. There are no saints. We, 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 just, we should just say it if things are right and if some critical element can be mentioned. All right. So flags. Unfortunately, of course, for some people, to say that you believe science is a flag that you don't know their group or vice versa. They feel that you only recognize them if you say that Science might be wrong. And by the way, science might be wrong. But chances are not all that high if so many people agree, for instance, on climate or on corona. So should we then please them? Should we then say, OK, you are the guys who feel that science is not correct, so we're going to speculate a bit about that to show that we know you. And that I would not agree. I would specifically not agree on a debate. In my presentation, I show a picture of a debate um, with corona skeptics and a virologist. And the virologist is very good. 
and lots of elements that the corona skeptic people say are rebutted. But in the end, you don't have enough time, and a lot of claims remain on the table without being answered to, and I received many complaints about that. Now, I don't think debates are a good idea here. Why? Well, we all work for television, or most people here, and we know that a debate is not only one based on content or on argumentation. Sometimes a debate is won by the guy who is funniest or uh, who speaks better. And that's okay in politics. If people want to vote for some guy because he has nice eyes or he is able to captivate their frustration, then that's okay. It's not for us to judge. But you cannot do science that way. So we cannot debate on science. Is it forbidden to interview corona skeptics? Well, my answer is the very same thing. <laughs> Nothing is forbidden in journalism as far as themes are concerned, as subjects are concerned. There is no deal in journalism that you cannot interview this or that person, but it is forbidden to be a lazy journalist. And so if you do it, then you should have all your argumentation on the table. And you should make clear to your audiences that science is not established in TV studios, nor is it established in YouTube movies. Usually, the people who fail in the real academic debate by publishing in scientific magazines, well, if they fail there, they go to YouTube. Right? We should explain to our audience that the real debate is in scientific magazines, is in peer review, and that we report on what happens there. And what happens there, well, has a very clear trend. So we should be careful to do that. Nevertheless, it, it's a bit of a problem, because even the Flemish minister president once said that we should give airplay to corona skeptic, if need be, to prove them wrong. But it's very difficult to prove people wrong if well, the basis of science is refused. I went myself on television in one of our shows to say, well, I'm not against it, but it's not very practical because for starters, which climate skeptic are we going to interview or which corona skeptic are we going to interview because they all have a different theory. And if we want to rebut it, they'll never agree with it because, well, the basic of science are refused. But I do have one tip or one one idea, and that is that we should talk more about the method. And this goes for both scientists and journalists. We should talk more about the method. Because in my presentation, I show you a number of disinformative websites that are giving me a lot of problem because people are mailing me and saying, why don't you show this? Uh, why don't you tell this? Why are you hiding the truth? And these websites, they look very scientific, right? They're not afraid to publish a chart or to publish numbers. They're not afraid to link to this or that study. And if you really go down to it, probably the study doesn't say what they say, but the link is there. It looks scientific. The difference between us and these websites, the difference between us and propaganda is not the, um, I say, the astuteness of formulation. It's not the conviction with which it's said. It's not uh, the, 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 the ability to come up with a decent title or clear language. It's not the layout of the website. They all look very professional. And we are on the brink of an era in which, well, pretty much everyone can start a YouTube television channel that looks rather professionally for not too much money, even if you broadcast only 10 minutes a day. The difference is the method. How do we reach our conclusions? And we cornered ourselves into a position where we don't really talk about our method. And we convinced ourselves that maybe our method is even boring. And I disagree. We should explain more why something is true, how we draw a conclusion, and why we are saying what we're saying. One of the things we learned, for instance, is that we have, if we have a journalistic research project and we publish the results, we immediately publish another article explaining 
how we did it and why we did it. Why did we start this investigation? No, it was not because we wanted to hit that minister, but because we received this and that tip and we went there. And okay, the, 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 the Justice Department has made some arrests. Did we talk to them? No, we didn't. And so on and so on and so on. Explain what we did before anyone can start framing it. But scientists should do the same thing. Scientists very often also immediately go to the conclusion. And sometimes what they say is not scientific fact, but opinion making. We should invite scientists to talk more about the method. If there is a corona policy, what is the scientific basis for that? What is the research? What, what, what was done maybe in another country? What was published that allows us to draw this and that conclusion and that we then can base a policy on? So talk more about the method, because the method is the difference between us and this information. Okay. Then, another element. When I show you these websites, disinformative websites, if I go on it, and I have to because I, I get these complaints, then very soon something will pop up. Give us your opinion. We want to talk to you. These websites are very interactive. And if you go to a Facebook group, yeah, there's a, we're lagging <laughs> immensely behind. Uh, if, if there's a Facebook group which you, well, might like a bit and you become a member, well, you're welcome. You're part of a community. So, ladies and gentlemen, it means that we have a, 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 a way of spreading information that can be used by populists to talk directly to the people, whether they are corona skeptics or political parties. And this is just, this is not real good research. This is just me going to the Facebook pages of a number of political parties in Flanders. And I discover that. I just write down how many followers they have. And I discover a totally different world in which this right-wing party is the largest one, which it is not in Parliament. The second party is the largest one, but then you have this whole bunch of parties that should be a lot bigger, but not on Facebook. Oh, and by the way, VRT News is smaller than this party. That means that people hear more on Facebook from these guys than from VRT News. We are completely past in that respect. I just did the same exercise a bit for Germany. So this is the CDU. Persons can sometimes have more followers. But this is the CDU. You know, AfD has a lot more followers. Interaction is the fourth medium. We have radio, we have television, we have text online and sometimes on paper. But interaction is the fourth medium. It's a different way to spread information. And some people are better at it than we are. Now, I was talking about this one political party. Oh, yeah, media habits of people with populist attitudes. This is some research from uh, Reuters. Uh, first of all, people with populist attitudes watch more television news. So it's not true that we don't reach them. They're watching us. It's not true that they only sit in echo groups. No, they are part of our audience. They use online journalistic brands, so they do read newspapers online. But they significantly use more Facebook for news. This is the chart. Okay. So uh, in my presentation, I slowly came to the point where I was to talk about political populism, which is probably what you're waiting for. And uh, that was uh, interesting for me because it kind of uh, is, is a, a strong part of my career. In 1991 already, there was a breakthrough election in Flanders where, let's say, a populist party uh, became pretty much the largest one in the country. And this was a shock at the time, so it's a long time ago. And when I started as a journalist, I ended up on a redaction where there was a kind of atmosphere of crisis. What should we do? Right, we should do something about that. And this in itself, in my view, is a bad attitude. Don't do that. The thing is that we had a, we had a whole discussion on that for years. And slowly, because I was young and I didn't know, but slowly I sided with those who said we shouldn't do anything. We should do good journalism. 
So one of the things that journalists and redactions should do, keep your forums and comment sections, in my view. I will immediately confess that I have not been able to convince my own media company to do that. <laughs> but I think it's a good idea. Why? There are too many people that come to me and say, I want to react to that. I have an opinion on that. I want to say something on that. And these people want to be with us. They want to be on our website. So if people want to be with us, why the heck would we send them to the shithole that is called Facebook, where all the disinformation and the hatred is, and where we are criticized? Facebook is making money with every second people spend on their platform, whereas we should be making money with every second that people spend on our platform. So it not, it's not, doesn't make sense. Now, the problem, of course, is that you have to moderate. You have to be there, you have to make sure that there's no hatred, there's no disinformation. And many media companies, just like mine, have said, we, we, we can't do that. But then I pointed out to my editors-in-chief that, well, on our Facebook pages, you have the same problem. You have the same hatred. You have the same disinformation. And specifically for Corona, I was able to convince them to say, well, What's the point of investing money, time, energy, staff in good journalism if in the comments section under that article you have all kinds of disinformation? So I was able to convince my editors-in-chief to hire two extra people and two FTEs in a newsroom. I have some directors here. That's a lot. I know it's a lot. So it was a big investment to have two extra people to do moderation on our own Facebook page, only on our own Facebook page. Um, why? Well, first of all, it's a duty. It's an ethical duty. It's in some of our journalistic documents that we have to do that. It helps our brand. It's good for the brand. If our Facebook page is a nice place to be, that helps our brand. The other way, if it's not a nice place to be because constantly there's hatred and it's sour, then it's not good for our brand. We have to set an example as PSM, and who knows, if we do this well in the long run, we might actually have our own community of people who would defend us on social media, just like disinformative people are making their community. We used some artificial intelligence that allows us to seek uh, toxic words. It doesn't work perfectly, but it helps. Uh, and the, big, the nice thing about this is that you can get rid of things on Facebook without leaving this software. So you can look on Facebook and see what's the context, what are other people saying. But you can also just push some buttons and the thing goes away on Facebook while you are not on Facebook. You're just doing this software. Okay, these are these buttons. That's just uh, our experiment. What we learned is that it does not replace human moderation. The best thing is to be human and to be there. Live moderation is really necessary sometimes and often better. Uh, artificial intelligence, human judgment is still needed. It's not catching everything. Uh, we, you can use it for the things that you're not paying a lot of attention to, and it's good for follow-up moderation while you're doing more urgent things. What did we learn in that project? Well, if you, uh, if you just show that the lights are on, if you show in your Facebook page that there are real people from VRT interacting, then suddenly, <sighs> comments become just a little bit nicer. Second thing, it's good to be a person, not an authority. So if we say something on that Facebook page, we're not going to say it as VRT, but as Thomas from VRT, always saying, have a nice day. Thomas, by the way, never has a last name. He doesn't have a, he exists, Thomas exists, but he doesn't have a family name to, just to protect him a little bit. The advantage is also that if Thomas says something stupid, then we can say, well, it's Thomas, we'll talk to him, it's okay, it's not really the VRT. But this works best, we learned that. Uh, on Facebook, we rather hide than deleting. Uh, service is immensely welcomed by people. So if you say, we did write a report on it, here's the link. Uh, maybe you can find an information on that government website. Uh, oh, that's a good tip, we'll tell the redaction. Simple things like that. People like that. So we don't argue, we don't enter discussions, we, we are not trying to win anything. We do little things, little service, which people like and remove the rotten apples, save the basket. We blocked hundreds of people, and we got rid of everything that we cannot verify ourselves. So we're not saying it's a lie, we're not saying it's disinformation. 
It's enough that we cannot check it from our sources, therefore it goes. And if you continue to uh, put things like that, we block you, we ban you. And if you don't agree, you can file a complaint with the news ombudsman. And the news ombudsman was very hard to convince. Hundreds of people we throw off, but the atmosphere really improved. Oh yes, recently Facebook has decided that you can close the comment sections, which we would do. After about one or two hours, we would not say, this is all nonsense, we're stopping this. No, no, we say, we're going to the next article, which is actually true. We just go to the next article or the next report. Right, this was our experiment. Oh yeah, very recently, we also started with Stel je vraag. Stel je vraag is a button on our website, ask your question, and then four days a week, we make this uh, little thing of about 15 minutes, where the most frequently asked questions, mostly about corona, but also about other subjects, are asked to an expert journalist or to a virologist or somebody from the government, whomever. So we try to answer, we try to interact. It's still a bit the old-fashioned way. Viewers send in something, we don't really interact individually. We do this, but I'm already happy that we are doing this. Still, I think it'd be better if we would just have our own forum and have total control. So interaction is the fourth medium. I keep that standing. And we should start thinking about it because others are using that medium to spread information far more efficiently than we are. Good, watch out for the backfire effect. Let's go back to Donald Trump. Um, of course, he was controversial. Of course, he said some populistic things. But the media also rewarded him for it. Who's this? It's Jeb Bush. But you have to think, right? The guy that lost, too boring in tweets, something like that. But it's us doing that too. There's the Stanford Cable News TV News Analyzer project. Uh, this is not published information. I have it uh, through a colleague who has some connections there. They use artificial intelligence to just look so the computer looks who is on screen. And so they compared Trump and Clinton when Trump was elected, and Trump was by far, the red line, more on screen than Clinton for Fox News. Now you would say, Fox News, that's Republican, that's normal. OK, but on CNN, which is supposed to be neutral or maybe liberal, Donald Trump was also most on screen. And for MSNBC, he was by far most on screen. Yes, but we do that to criticize him. Then people won't vote for him. Yes, they will. Because intuitively, you are telling your audience, this is the most relevant guy. I'm not saying you should always shut up, but you should be aware of this effect. It's also an intuitive signal. I'm going to give you an even uh, worse example. But the general thing is, do not make populists more relevant than they are. Oh, are you against populist parties? No. Don't make anyone more relevant than they are. This is what we should do as journalists. Okay, this is Dries van Langenhoven. Uh, no, don't underestimate him. This is him with, uh, with Orban. So they're, they're really, very well connected, these guys. And he has this movement, and I think the picture kind of tells you what kind of movement it is. Um, but more importantly is that they had a... Uh, a chat box, a secret chat box, and this is what we found in it. We, we, we gained access to it, and this is what we found. All kind of comparisons with, with Adolf Hitler. Uh, this is what SMV, Schild and Vrienden, is going to do for you if you become a member. Uh, this woman wants to be taken seriously. I have no further comments. Um, the, this is a straight uh, reference to the collaboration past in uh, Flanders and Belgium. I think this speaks for itself. Uh, this is the KKK, and this is Dries van Langenhoven himself saying, never share something from this group outside. So he's not saying, don't do this, this is not how we are, this is racist. No, no, he didn't say that. He said, don't share it. Well, you know very well what was going on. So <laughs> the fun is, when he put that, we were already in his chat group, and we were making copies, and we have thousands of this rubbish. And we made a very nice report about that, exposing this organization as, well, being something different from what they are on the public stage behind the scenes. Okay, um, so we made our report. But then, strangely enough, for two weeks there was total outrage. This is terrible, nobody should accept this, and so on and so on. Then, media attention went to something else. 
And Dries van Langenhove stayed a celebrity. And many media companies, unfortunately even my own, started to treat him as a celebrity. Why didn't you ask questions about these chat boxes? Yeah, that's old news. Now I have to, I have to interview him on something else. Why? Well, everybody knows him. Is that a good reason? So just an example. I hope this clip starts. Well, let's not lose too much time on that. It's a report on a manifestation. He is there, and he says that the migration pact in Belgium did not have a majority in the government and did not represent a majority of the population. Now, personally, you can be in favor or against the migration pact. I don't think it's the smartest move of the United Nations, but this is wrong. There was a majority in the government and there was a majority in parliament, and if parliament does not represent the people, I don't know. But our journalist didn't say anything. He was interviewed. Should he be interviewed? First question. Second, if he's interviewed and he says something that is plainly wrong, why don't you correct it? Yeah, but I have to interview him because everybody knows him. So, Dries van Langenhove was rehabilitated with a dazzling speech, said Bart de Sturtewagen of the newspaper The Standard. And this is actually Dries van Langenhove in Parliament. And he's sitting next to the president of Laos Belang, who at first condemned him, saying, this is not who we are, we totally distance ourselves from this. Now he's sitting in Parliament next to him, because we made him a celebrity. Because we stopped asking the questions about the real problem and started asking other questions that were really irrelevant. Impartiality, ladies and gentlemen, is not the duty to give free rights. Impartiality is partiality for the facts. Okay, I'm almost through. This is Bibi Pia. She's ill. And it's a very rare disease. Medication costs about a million euro. It was, it was found through crowdfunding, but in Parliament there were questions, why can't the government pay that? The medication is not approved in the European Union. Uh, so that's a problem. And there's a quote. Will it start? Well, no. But here's the text. There are billions to shelter asylum seekers and there is no money for baby Pia. It's not true, right? So if you, if you look at it, the budget of FETASIL, the organization that is housing refugees, that's the budget, 373 million, and the budget for medication is 4.7 billion euro. But it, it's kind of illustrating how difficult it is for journalists because this television report is short, it's about something else, it's about baby Pia, but then something like this is said. My advice is don't broadcast it. It costs you too much effort to rebound it. And it's not something that people are going to talk about the next day, but somehow it stays in their minds. So don't do it. And if you must do it, my experience is that it is better to give some nuanced information before the quote than after the quote. So vaccinate your audience against a certain quote that is coming up rather than saying it afterwards, because that is an intuitive signal that you are patronizing and saying it's not true and so on. I'm going to skip these. These are the reactions that I received on that. And people do say that, well, they won't correct it themselves, right? Be sure. Now, final thing. Does it all help? So I mentioned a few things. Does it help? First of all, um, these are the things that I mentioned. This is our moderation project, and you've got three lines here. The stark blue one, the lower one, is the one where we did real people moderation. The second one is another Facebook group of VRT News where we did only artificial intelligence moderation. And the highest one is a Facebook group from VRT News, another program, where we deliberately did nothing whatsoever. So we didn't change anything. You see the difference in the toxic content of the comments. So it did make a difference. Oh, remember on the BR Climate Reporter? This is how she looks like today. When I started out as a news ombudsman, I never thought that I would be giving advice to women on how to dress. But it turns out to be part of my job. She's a very good colleague, by the way, and she really took that to heart. OK, Donald Trump. I gave my workshops on intuitive signals and complaints on reporting on Donald Trump went down significantly. Maybe we got used to it, right? I'm, I'm not saying it's my workshop, but I hope it helped. And this is Anuna de Wever, our climate activist. She was on the first edition of a new talk show and there was a really a not critical interview, really. 
what went wrong? Well, the, the guy sitting next to her was supposed to give her criticism. Then when the cameras went on, he didn't do that. Well, things like that happen on television. The presenter should compensate it, but the presenter was new. She was not up to the task for that particular day. I received dozens of complaints. Then the same team comes to me and says, next week, we are going to talk about this Belgian jihadist who went to Iraq to fight with Islamic State, who cheered on Facebook when there were bomb attacks in Brussels, and now he asks Belgium to help him to come back to the country because in a Kurdish prison camp now, and while well, it's not fun there, so he wants her help to come back. We are going to, to invite his mother. She's a religious Muslim too. She wears a headscarf, and she's going to plea for Belgium to help this guy to come back. We're just warning you because it might be a bit controversial. Maybe somebody is going to complain. But there was a difference. This time we sat together, and this redaction said, you're, the guys in your, in your mailbox, what do they want to hear? And I made an entire list. You betrayed our country, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this was not a harsh interview. And in general, I'm not in favor of hard interviews. This was a very sober and serene interview. But everything was said. Everything was touched. All these elements that people want to hear, all the flags were out there. Zero complaints. Zero complaints. And this goes beyond the news ombudsman who has less work. This means that tens of thousands of people that are akin to have populist ideas have watched this, they listened, and they had no complaints. I'm not saying they were convinced, but they listened. And they didn't become angry, which is something public service media should stand for. This is what we want. We want people to listen to each other, at the very least that. So there is a possibility to do this right if you prepare it well and if you think more. Good. These are the things that I said. I'm not going to repeat them. There's just one final thought. We are in a battle for trust with our opponents, populists, skeptics, propagandists, whatever. I don't know if you're going to win that battle. I sincerely don't know. But this is a thought of Winston Churchill. You cannot guarantee success in war, but you should deserve it. And we should deserve it by good journalism. And what good journalism is was part of my presentation. I thank you for the invitation. I thank you for having me and for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It's, I know there are a lot of questions, but unfortunately, unfortunately, I have a now a presenter from Canada waiting on Zoom. It was, uh, and uh, as it is really early in the morning in, in Canada, we appreciate that Stephen Ward is with us over the Zoom. If you could put uh, Stephen on uh, main screen, please and everybody could uh, see also the Zoom here. First we are ready. Yes, please. Our audience is waiting uh, for your presentation now. Please, Stephen. Yes, well, good morning. And yes, it is, uh, what is it? It's 5.15 here in Canada. I'll try to stay, uh, be comprehensible at such an early, early time. Uh, I'm honored to be with you this morning, and I enjoyed the, the speaker that I just heard very much. <clears throat> I'm just going to launch right in here. Digital technology has altered fundamentally how humans communicate. It has altered fundamentally how we practice journalism. And it has caused a revolution in media ethics. We are in the middle of a difficult transition from a non-digital parochial ethics to a digital global ethics and is chaotic, it is open-ended, and I'm not really sure where it's going to go. A century ago, modern media ethics was born in the West. The first explicit codes were written for professional journalists at newspapers and in the news broadcasts who were just beginning. Why this came about is a very long story, but one aim was to pacify public concern about the growing power of the press and to avoid government enforcing its own media code. Another aspect of the codes was that they were parochial, not global. Many are still parochial. They were parochial because they were codes for local or regional news outlets. 
journalists define their duties relative to a local or regional audience. For example, even today we say Canadian journalists uh, serve Canadians, Estonian journalists serve Estonians. Parochial journalism can be tribal, xenophobic, nationalistic. And the codes, even today, say very little about the global impact of your reports. A journalist's duty apparently stops at your border. Many of the 600 codes in the world today reflect norms first formulated a century ago for a much different media sphere, with norms like neutrality, impartiality, just the facts, balance, and so on. And I was taught those values when I joined the Canadian Press News Agency in the 1980s. At that time, there was a considerable consensus across professional journalism about aims and principles of journalism. Many of the codes looked similar. Moreover, it was clear who the journalists were. Therefore, accountability systems, such as media councils, <clears throat> knew who they were dealing with, and most of journalism came under their mandate. But the media revolution, of course, upset all of this, allowing citizens to commit acts of random or regular journalism, and to create their own networks of opinion, and to seek news far from the confines, as we just heard, of the BBC or CNN. New forms of journalism violated traditional codes. Almost every principle has been questioned or ignored. Instead of neutrality, be engaged. Instead of being nonpartisan, just tell people where you're coming from. Instead of keeping a distance from sources, get closer to them. Just deconstruct the wall between journalists and their funders. Instead of verification, share what you hear when you hear it. Therefore, by the first decade of the current century, the consensus was fragmented. Professional organizations cut back on controls, ombudsmen, media councils, Media, media discussion tended to be channeled into social media hashtags and campaigns against specific targets. It is remarkable how the issues in the very language of journalism has changed. I'm sorry, there we go. It is, uh, you know, just look on this slide and see how the language and the issues are so different from say 20 years ago. I mean, things like robotic journalism, for example, it never existed, big data journalism, mobile editing, disinformation, and so on and so forth. At first, this expansion of media players was heralded as a democratization of media, but as the first decades of the 21st century arrived, the voice of responsible journalism was increasingly lost amid a cacophony of angry voices, ready to circulate anything. Whatever helps, you win. Whatever helps, your ideology. Thus, it is fair to ask, is any ethics any system of accountability really possible in this sphere. This is the bad side of the media revolution and there is positive sides. There's a lot of good stuff online. A global media also has democratic and humanitarian uses, but it will require collaborative society-wide initiatives to rescue public media from trolls, neo-fascists and racists. We need, <coughs> excuse me, we need new ethics and new mechanisms. I will present only a few of the steps of reconstruction that I think we could endeavor to do. One is to think of ethics as discourse across boundaries and global. Another is to construct a participatory way of doing ethics. And a third is to figure out a way to do journalism that is engaged, but not partisan. That is, is journalists need to join with other social actors in a macro resistance of anti-democratic forces. Let me start with the first steps, which are, conce are conceptual. They're about how we think about journalism. We need a journalism practice that is sensitive to the values in the many cultural spaces of our plural world. This means not seeing ethics as a list of absolute static principles applied uniformly in every situation. Ethics should be an evolving adaptation to ever-changing conditions. Ethics is not just content. It's also about process and change and what matters a lot is the open manner by which we address these problems. We need to examine how they actually work uh, in particular situations. For example, in Canada, we need to deal with our history. We sh how should we report on our First Nations, the sordid history of reservations and the legacy of a genocidal school system of forced integration? What is journalism's role in that? attempted reconciliation. What does a multicultural nation like Canada, how do you achieve a balance between laws that apply to all Canadians 
yet flexible in how First Nations deal with injustice in their own communities. The same could be said about the coverage of the LGBTQ community in Halifax, the Sikh community in Vancouver, the French Acadian, Acadian minority in New Brunswick. Also, we need to change the way we report on issues such as mental illness, suicide. It is not enough to say, well, report accurately, fairly, and so on. Yes, that's important. What does accurately mean in those, in those situations? Now, now I turn to the level of principles. What kinds of aims and principles should be the foundation for media ethics today? I would propose that it should be a global foundation, not a parochial one. Global journalism needs global media ethics. <clears throat> Excuse me. Parochial values are my attachments to what is near and dear, given my cultural and national identity. Global values are values that apply to humans as humans anywhere. I became a moral globalist, if you like, in fields of war, where I recognized in the misery and grief of ordinary people far from my home that there is a common humanity of shared desires and shared needs. The flourishing of that humanity any, anywhere should, became the, should, should be the ultimate goal of journalism. Global values include human rights, peace, helping people develop capacities for a decent life, the moral equality of all people, and the use of media to foster decency, hope, and humane societies. The Stoics once said that humans live with ser within several communities at the same time, local, ethnic, national, and now global. All have ethical weight. So it's not a question of eliminating one attachment for another, even if we could do that. The question is which one has priority in particular situations and especially where they conflict. And that's ethical reasoning. Moral globalism says that where they conflict, global, global values should trump parochial values. For example, for journalists, it's about enlarging, enlarging one's moral consciousness. If my country, Canada, is benefiting from unjust trading policies with African nations, such as robbing them of natural resources, then as a Canadian journalist, I have a duty to say so. As a human being, I have a duty to say so. Narrow patriotism be damned. If I cover a crucial climate change conference, I do not narrow my reporting down to what is in it for my country. I also ask what is in it for others and what is in it for the global community. When I report on a dispute, say between Canada and a European country, on who controls the Arctic, I embrace global objectivity. That is, I use an international set of sources and perspectives. I don't presume from the start that the story is going to be pro-Canadian. If I come across racist actions by Canadian soldiers in a conflict, I will reveal it. And this is not always easy. You may think, it may sound like it is, it isn't. When I covered nasty regional wars in Europe in which Canadians were involved as peacemakers, back home I was called unpatriotic if my stories were in any way critical of our effort. People try to get me fired. So once we choose moral globalism, we then need to take this open discourse and look at what they mean in specific cultural spaces. For example, does the idea of social responsibility of the media differ in South Africa compared to say America? Yes, it does differ. <laughs> to what extent is media freedom realized differently in Estonia compared say with Canada? Also global media ethics means new approaches to global issues, such as pandemics, climate change, and immigration. And we need to teach all of this to our students so that journalism education is not just technology training, but the acquiring of cultural knowledge about the complex world on which they will soon report. Finally, journalism ethics should articulate a third way between neutrality and partisanship. And this is difficult to figure out, but we have to think more about this. I call it objectively engaged journalism. It is a methodologically rigorous engagement, to, to echo the previous speaker, to advance and protect democratic impulses worldwide. In a world where facts are manufactured, where presidents undermine democracy, where states engage in misinformation, where racists spread dangerous, Im dangerous images on social media, and there are wacky, and I mean wacky, theories which weaken pandemic vaccination here in my country at least, Journalists cannot be neutral. They cannot stand back from the fray and report what others are saying. This is just the facts approach that was drilled into my head when I joined journalism. 
Instead, we are democratically engaged by calling out purveyors of fact, face, uh, fake facts, by testing and challenging public statements. Journalism today should not be a stenography where all voices and alleged facts are treated equally. And objectivity does not mean that journalists cannot write that the president is a liar or a racist if he is, in fact, and does so consistently. Objectivity does not mean you simply report the statements made by a racist speaker amplifying his voice without critically assessing his statements. To be democratically engaged is not to be partisan or biased. It is to be attached to a broad goal of egalitarian democracy. It committed to testing particular stories for bias. Journalism has always had goals and values. It is only a question of what values to embrace and for what purposes. To advocate for democracy, freedom, and violence, and to have a sharp conception of what those concepts mean is not to become a mouthpiece for a party. If you want to know more about these ideas, you can see the Handbook of Global Media Ethics and my own Objectively Engaged Journalism, which is on the screen. Now I turn to another step, rethinking accountability. Since its origin, modern media ethics has been a creature of professional media, Professionals developed the codes. Revision of the codes until recently was done almost entirely within newsrooms or journalism society. Media councils were professionally funded and operated. Journalism ethics was a professional form of self-regulation and public participation was not robust. Today, I think we should think about developing a public participatory approach. Put simply, we seek out ways for the public to participate directly and meaningfully, meaningfully in the evaluation and reform of media systems. The public includes interested individuals, groups, NGOs, and we use the power of social media and global media to make participation in real time, inclusive and constructive. Why enlarge participation? Because media content is produced by the public, because citizens have a right to be involved, because the record of mainstream media's support for ethics is checkered and undependable because journalists by themselves cannot fix the structural issues, and because we live in an age that expects interactivity. Any system of accountability, any code revision that is not highly participatory from start to, to end will lack credibility with the public. Public participatory ethics is a trio of three ideas. First, media ethics is both a right and a responsibility of all citizens, not just the mainstream media, or government regulators. Second, media ethics should be collective advocacy for reliable, diversely owned media, fulfilling key informational functions, promoting deliberative democracy. We need to connect across many boundaries here. We have to link academic institutions, schools of media, information experts like librarians, media councils, public editors, media foundations, NGOs with an interest in good media, such as NGOs that promote human rights. We can readily think about specific changes that would improve particular media, such as improving the fact checking by reporters at this particular news organization. And that's good, that's laudable, but in my view, it's not sufficient. We need to act together, and I mean we, creatively. Third, media ethics is reasoned analysis. Discussion is informed, guided by principles, and we should see common ground. We need to rise above the level of ad hoc complaints about specific stories, or heated social media campaigns. How would the public be involved? Well, people could gather virtually in town hall meetings, social media, citizen assemblies. They could spend a weekend getting up to date on an issue aided by scholars and journalists. The aim would be to arrive at recommendations on some media policy. Communication media can be used to allow public participation in the work and public sessions of media councils. To help you grasp what approach might look like, I've created a purely imaginary system. I call it the Canadian Coalition for Media Excellence. I was amused the other day when I discovered that I just gave it this name, not knowing that I would be talking at a conference sponsored by a real media excellence center. The center's organization, this imaginary center, uh, for the sake of argument, would consist in a set of hubs across the country, meaning Canada. Uh, where academics and others analyze media content and performance and converse with the public. Typically, the work would be posted on highly visible websites or some such platform. 
and the hubs would be anchored in agencies with a knowledge of media, such as schools of journalism. The slide identifies three areas of activity for this nationwide uh, organization and coalition. Evaluate media, educate about media, and create and improve guidelines for practice. All of this would con constitute what I call macro resistance to toxic media. Evaluation includes the review and critique of media content on a regular basis, unreliable sources, and fake news. One hub, say in Montreal or Vancouver, would monitor news content. Another hub would just check facts, but also engage in opinion checking. That is an analysis of interpretations and perspectives in the news. It could maintain a registry of reliable and unreliable sources. It could create national state of media reports. Another hub, say in Toronto, could bring the resources and knowledge of academia to working journalists, such as creating practical guides for reporting. Harvard's Media Center, for example, offers a very useful and weekly online guide called the Journalist Research for covering the latest issues, such as here are the four things you need to know before you report on this big issue. Also, my Imagine Center could employ the latest in story tracking. There are now big data computer programs that can identify most news stories circulating in a country on a given day. The computer can be programmed to display the story source, the author, the political perspective, story, uh, the source's record for reliability, and the transparency about who they are and who funds them. This is the sort of technology that should be in the hands of every citizen. Under Educate, I mean helping citizens be critical evaluators of the media. Coalitions would lobby the educational system to develop media literacy and media ethics teaching in schools starting at a very early age. Topics would include, yes, how you use your media devices and how news gets created, but also cyberbullying, about trolls, and about exchanging pornography. The coalitions could develop teaching modules that could be used not only in classrooms, but in workshops on weekends, say, organized by civic groups. This cannot wait until college, and it should not be seen as an add-on to the curriculum. The best defense against misinformation is self-defense through critical skills. Coalitions against such things as hate speech exist in Europe, as you can see on the slide, but not so much in North America. There's also work, of course, on media democracy systems in various parts of the world, such as, and the UN has developed teaching modules for global media ethics. Create and improve, the third activity, refers to creating new guidelines and new protocols for, for doing journalism. We need new thinking in at least three areas. We need guides for new media technologies, such as virtual reality, automated journalism, the media's use of drones, so on. Meanwhile, journalism will continue to be interpretive and opinionated. So what are we going to do about this in schools, right? What distinguishes good or bad interpretations? And is there anything helpful we can say here? Now, the old codes, the old textbooks, say either nothing or little on this because reporters were not supposed to interpret or to impine. Just the facts, please. There's some good work in this area. The Ethic Ethical uh, Journalist Network in London, for example, has been gathering journalists together around the world to develop norms for covering terrorism, hate speech, immigrants, and so on. Developing my Imagine Center would be a challenge, but the good news is that many of the elements are in place. For those who worry there are no resources for this effort in Canada or elsewhere, I am pointing to the slide to remind people of what resources actually exist. In North America alone, there are codes, textbooks on evaluating media performance. There are hundreds of media schools with teachers, scholars, students. There are dozens of centers for media and democracy and many fact-checking organizations. So is the problem resources or is it just the coordination of those resources? Happily, the idea of collaboration between journalism and other social actors is becoming more popular. Multiple news outlets worked on the Facebook papers recently in the news and on the Panama papers where an international consortium of journalists unveiled financial wrongdoing. There are so many collaborative projects, I couldn't get them all in one slide, as you can see. In Canada, the CBC partnered with The Guardian in London and the investigative reporting project in Italy to reveal that Canadian grocery stores were selling tomato pieces, 
harvested by Uyghurs under oppressive conditions in China. One more example, okay? The Canadian Journalism Forum recently produced a useful handbook that journalists can use when reporting on mental illness in Toronto. It sits on the desk of many reporters. It was put together with the help of many people. The Canadian Broadcast Corporation, the Forum, health organizations, activists, and government. So although I started on the dark side of media, I now stress the more positive side. My aim has been to plant, put a meme in your, your brain, the following ideas. The idea of global media ethics, the idea of public directed ethics. Plus one final idea, we can change things. Refuse to despair, refuse to just shrug. Today, we're all part of that media system. And digital democratic citizens are not powerless if we act smartly in common cause. Thank you. We'll start with the questions, if I, if I may. The first question is about possibility to being global in a democratic way. To see the any chance that in, in this world we are living in, with this kind of conflicts and also, uh, so on, something will be agreed, like a media ethics on global level. That's directed to me, I take it. Uh, 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 yes and no. Uh, I am not envisaging and I'm not really sure I would support that the ideal is to come up with one global code of ethics for all journalists. I think that uniformity is, is, will never be achieved and it shouldn't be achieved. We don't want journalists all rotely following the same code. So that, 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 would, not, that would be utopian in my view. Uh, uh, what we can have is, uh, is very, in various regions of the world, as, as journalists, as I say, thinking more globally when they're actually doing their journalism, they're still going to cover their, their, their local news. They're still going to cover the regional news. But they have to start thinking about what the consequences and implications of doing that report beyond your borders and not stirring up uh, needlessly uh, uh, hatred and, and other things like that. I think that we are approaching, uh, as my handbook uh, on media ethics, uh, uh, that a lot of journalists are thinking in these ways. There's lots of new thoughts out there. Uh, whether, in fact, uh, we can get people on board that's a practical matter. I think what you're going to need is to begin with certain webs of people interested in this in various parts of the world. And they have to get sort of the, the media leaders, the mainstream media leaders, some of them online and start developing uh, guidelines on these things. It could be the BBC, the CBC, it could be whomever, and start developing those. And at least they will be pioneers in this area and lead the way. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, naive about this. I know it's it's we have we face a different difficult world, and we're also going to have to get, as I said, to come back to my theme. We're going to have to get all kinds of different players involved. It's not just the BBC, as I just mentioned. It's not just the journalists. The journalists can't solve many of these problems by themselves. You have to include the education system. You have to include government. You have to include some sort of uh, new regulations and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a huge mammoth job. I'm just trying to break down the prejudice, or I, I'm not sure it's a prejudice, but the idea that, that journalists have to be detached from society to do it well. You have to be independent. Uh, and you don't want to work, and you can't work with other social actors. You can. You just have to be very careful how you work with them and who you work with. Hopefully that is a, giving them a, an answer to your question. Yes, it is. Uh, now we have a chance to ask a question from the audience if somebody would like to ask a question and we have also these online question platforms lead of our questions open right now. Uh, there might be a problem with the Sledo because uh, there is a, some delay between writing the questions and when they appear here in my and therefore I will wait for a, uh, for a moment in here. I will take the question, actually, it was, uh, it's a universal. It, it was written to, uh, after the com uh, presentation from Tim Powell's, but it's also related to the issue you touched. 
And who is responsible for a misinformation spread on the platforms? Why governments are so shy or passive to take the topic on the table? How it's in Canada? Uh, right now, there is, there is uh, some minimal legislation that you could appeal to, uh, hate, hate speech laws. Uh, right now, there is a, a, a growing resistance to that sort of misinformation and uh, sort of uh, pressure on government to, to do something about it. It's a tricky area because there's also freedom of the press, freedom of expression uh, that's in the Constitution that you have to work with. Um, but we have seen in Canada, and we saw it in the last federal election a couple of months ago, a growth of the sort of hate media, the uh, ignorant, un uninformed uh, media uh, that has beset the American uh, system to the point where I think the American democracy is in very, very serious ways uh, in trouble. Um, and we, we, it's coming to Canada. Uh, it has, you know, we saw in our last election, uh, people attacking, throwing things at the prime minister, uh, disrupting political uh, meetings. It, it's, it's frightening when you look back at the history of the, of the 20th century uh, and fascism. Uh, and so uh, I'm not sure I can answer that because I, all I could say right now is there is not the, uh, the people who do engage in that activity are responsible for what they say. The trouble is, is how, as I said in my talk, how do you keep them accountable? Sometimes you don't know who they are. Sometimes they're anonymous. Sometimes they live in some other part of the country or their networks that are very difficult and, and, and hard to get at. And that's what I'm saying is that I don't know how to do that, but there, there's, there, there needs to be some, there must be people with expertise in how to identify these people and how to hold them into account. Um, and uh, right now, uh, all I'm saying is, is, is that I'm not sure how exactly you can go about holding them to account. The best way is for the public, the good, the good part of the public that wants to be informed, that doesn't want to engage in this, to come together in coalitions, inform yourself, get your uh, critical skills up, uh, know where your media is coming from, and fight back, uh, at least in that way. Thank you. This is exactly what we are aiming with our conference, actually. To to talk about the issues and to engage with the people with different opinions about journalism and freedom of speech. Thank you so much. I, uh, I saw you have your very early morning coffee right now, yes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to wake up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we are preparing for a lunch, but we have before that one presentation more. Thank you, Stephen. And hopefully you. you can visit our uh, Center of Media Excellence for a Baltic country so we can share our experience. I'd love that. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you. Thank you, and bye. Bye, bye. Tasti, Vanille. Ja nyt mulla on ja meil me. And now I'm very happy to invite here Janet Ballard. To the stage and give your presentation. That, and you will give us an introduction to ten top tips. I will. I'll try to. Okay, so that's the reason why I'm here. I would like to learn something. That okay. This is the point. <laughs> you might be disappointed. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah, ja, ja Lava on nyt siis Janet Ballardil, founder of Be Smart Cookie from UK. I uh, bought a pen and paper up just in case the uh, technology doesn't work and I have to. Uh, revert to traditional forms of communication. Um, first of all, thank you very, very much for having me here today. I feel totally honoured to be in such a lineup. Um, I am not a policy person or a uh, oversight person or an academic. Um, I'm a people person. I do practical work with people. Sometimes it's a bit populist. I'm sorry, Tim. Um, and today I want to be a little bit provocative because I want to talk to you about um, what media literacy looks like at the moment, largely, a kind of snapshot of it, and where I think really we should be asking this question, which is, is that the best that we can do? So if I press this, will it go on? Yes, great. Okay, so let me step back for a moment and uh, show you this beautiful diagram, which if I didn't have the screen, I would have drawn for you. In fact, I did draw it for you originally. So look, this is a kind of, you know, very simplistic. This is what the media sort of looked like some time ago, some mythical time ago, 
a few decades. Events, stories, people, stuff happened. Those, that information traveled via people, largely journalists, not always. Largely, it went through some kind of filter process, and then it went out to the people, to the audience. As we all know, as we've been hearing, it's a very chaotic, different media information landscape out there. And uh, mainly because people have their own way of just getting messages, getting information, sending stuff, sending content to people, they can just do it. And I mean, you might even argue that those red arrows represent something more like 10 years ago and that nowadays that it would be plastered even more, okay? And that means that as a percentage, less and less of it is going through a filter. Less is going through a filter. People are, and of course, so obviously that leads to the problems of things like misinformation, disinformation, hoaxes, just people making mistakes, all sorts of things, which loosely we call fake news. There are people who resist that term because it's, uh, it has problems associated with it, but it's also a term that travels the globe uh, in English, every, in almost every language that I've worked in or a country I've been to, fake news is sort of understood as a concept. So it leads to fake news. And lots of people are doing lots of different things in at different parts of this beautiful model to try and address, address that. So you're obviously in here. Most people here are in here. You're in media. And you're in, particularly interested in public service media. And you're seeing what you can do there. And media literacy largely works here. So one question I want to ask and I, I, I'm going to ask more questions than I give you answers to, which is why I said I would disappoint you on the top 10 tips, is, is that really the right space for media literacy to be in? Because some of what I'm going to mention actually has been pre-echoed by Tim, um, by Adam as well, and actually by Stephen as well, who gave us a really warm thought, didn't he, about to say, things can change. I, I liked that. I liked that meme. Um, so, yeah, so one question is, is that actually the right space for the, for the media literacy work to be going on? So, let me show you what's inside the media literacy box and ask some questions that might take us outside the media literacy box. So, it's a bit like a menu. This doesn't even begin. This is quite a short menu as many restaurant menus go, but we've all been to those places that have got like four or five folds in them and they're enormous and they're covered in options, covered in options. Well, that's what's going on in media literacy. Um, there are all sorts of all sorts of people are offering often very good, high quality content, materials, training courses. Um, but it's everywhere. Universities are offering it. Classroom schools are offering it. You can find it online. Media outlets are offering it. The BBC offers it. Um, I worked at the BBC for twenty years. I I know the organisation very well. All all their media outreach literacy work has been either created or curated or commissioned by me. So I am part of this problem. I don't. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at my. I'm putting myself in the spotlight as well. There's our top ten tips. Oh my goodness, who hasn't read an article that says you know? Oh, how to spot fake news? Here's top ten tips. Ten tips. Are you really going to read all 10 tips and use all 10 tips when it comes to needing to use any tips at all to spot the, to spot the fakes? Um, we've got a growing fact-checking um, section of journalism. NGOs are getting involved. Uh, there are all sorts of sort of um, pedagogies behind it. Are we t teaching critical thinking tools? Are we giving new skills? Are they technical skills or uh, in intelligent learning skills? and so on. Um, you can see it's a really, really busy place. And as I say, there's lots of good stuff out there, but there is a lot there. And you know, I, I have some questions about it. Let me organize my thoughts for you around the questions. So the first one is that a lot of the offering is, is long. It's quite long. Um, USAID have just sponsored a program in Nigeria, teaching young people, give, delivering media literacy skills to them. It's a six-week course, six weeks. It's quite an investment. So what you get is a small number of people get access to a large investment. Or it's that top tips again. Okay, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's six. But again, 
you know, it's a list of lots of different things that you might do to see if what you're reading is accurate or in context or misleading and so on. Um, they also assume quite a lot of time that you might invest when you're actually doing, when you're actually, uh, what should I say, ingesting your media diet, when you're actually online, when you're actually engaging with news and content. This one is about new skills. So a lot of media literacy is framed in, there's a massive problem out there, you need new skills to deal with it. And I'm slightly of the view that actually, we may have quite a lot of skills already that we use in our lives that we could apply or encourage others to apply to their digital diet or their media diet or their news diet. Rather than thinking of it as something totally new, that you're, you are totally helpless and if you don't get these skills, you're never going to survive the media world. Some of the skills that we teach are quite complicated. I, I rarely come across a media literacy resource that doesn't have a reverse image search in it. Please, audience, put your hand up if you've ever in your lives, while reading the news or watching the news, done a reverse image search. One. One, I've never done one, and I've taught this thing for years, and I've never done one in my own life, only in the training environment. Did you get the answer you wanted? Good. Yeah. <laughs> so the other thing is the drop in the ocean idea, right? So um, let's think, in UK terms, if I deliver workshops to 1,000 16-year-olds, that sounds great, but actually um, in each year group, in the UK, there are about a million children. So there are about a million 16-year-olds. So, you know, when you put that in context, I, I was privileged to join some people for dinner last night and I learned a bit about Estonia. Amazing. Uh, and I know that you have a different size population to other countries, but still, you know, the maths is, is there. So the question about lots of the media literature that's out there is how many people are you actually reaching with any of this material? And then my last concern about what's out there is the disconnect. And what I mean by that is a lot of times the media literacy learning is happening here, but the diet, the media diet, the ingesting, the activity of actually looking at news or TikTok or whatever it is, is over here. And I, I would love to see that learning coming closer to this space here. And actually, I'll come to it in a minute, but you, you heard about some of those ideas from, from Tim that actually um, some of the concepts that he was talking about that could be in, ingrained into journalism are actually also media literacy con concepts that would help the audience to better understand what they're listening to or seeing or looking at. Um, okay. The, the other disconnect that I'll mention is a lot of material out there is generic. And um, I'm also guilty of this one, you know, that I create lovely resources for this organisation because that's what they've asked me to do. And they want to use them in several different places. And we probably don't adapt enough. I mean, for example, a media literacy programme here would and should look different to a media literacy programme somewhere else because the needs are different. What's going on is different. OK. So, in my thinking outside the box, I, um, I've sort of become aware that uh, a coronavirus, which has been, you know, as we all know, a devastating um, couple of years, um, very difficult at the individual and the community level, um, but our response to it, actually, the way they ask questions was quite useful. And as I do teach critical thinking skills, I thought I would apply some of those skills to media literacy. So for coronavirus, we asked, you know, what is it? How does it affect people? Um, how can we stop it? Uh, who does it affect? Who's vulnerable to this? You could ask the same about, about fake news, if you like, couldn't you? You could say, well, if somebody's just getting fake news about celebrities all the time, does that matter as much as the person who's getting fake news about what's going on politically in their country and which way they might vote, for example? Um, we, the, as a globally, we ask questions about what behaviour can be changed 
to try and stop coronavirus? What medical intervention do we need? Are we talking about a vaccine? Or are we talking about, are we talking about herd immunity? Are we talking about eliminating coronavirus? And these are the same types of questions that I think the media literacy world could really benefit from in um, encouraging those kinds of thoughts. Are we trying to eliminate fake news? Or are we trying to, in, to allow people to um, have enough skills and, uh, and uh, knowledge that at a collective level, fake news doesn't really play too much of a difficult part in our understanding of society and things that people do and ways that people vote and so on. So, I'm just going to look at my aid memoir here. Um, coming to media literacy then, um, I mean, those questions are sort of big questions that uh, policymakers and governments um, should be asking, uh, and big educational institutions and so on. Uh, and um, what I would say from the media literacy side of things is we shouldn't wait for those answers to come through. We've already heard, in, you know, underlying a couple of the talks earlier is this concept that actually the world of content generation and content understanding is, works faster than policy. I mean, policy is catching up, right? Government policy is, is constantly catch up. And if anyone's a good example of how um, not to wait for policy and just go ahead and innovate, Mark Zuckerberg, whatever you think of him, he's certainly innovated. And, you know, he's uh, now waiting for policy to catch up with him. So I think we should probably do the same in media literacy and think outside the box. So if anyone here is thinking of setting up media literacy work in their organisations, I would suggest starting with the question of um, what are you trying to achieve? What is the problem that you're specifically trying to address? Um, I highly recommend looking at uh, Lee Edwards' blog for the LSE. Um, she writes about the drafting of the online safety bill. I can't see Adam here, but I think he's still here. Oh, hi, Adam. Yeah, so uh, Adam mentioned the online safety bill earlier. And um, Lee Edwards' article, or her blog on it, um, which I think she calls, if you want to know, Media Literacy in the Online Safety Bill. So she asks a range of, she looks at a range of issues in it, which is quite helpful and stimulating. I'm not saying you have to agree or disagree with it, but it's quite helpful and stimulating thoughts. So one of them is that she's noticed a change in the wording, which I'm sure Adam uh, is aware of as well, to, um, from public awareness, so... Here we go. She says, a subtle but crucial change in wording from an obligation to improve public awareness and understanding in the media is to improve the awareness of members of the public. So that goes back to that idea of, are you vaccinating individuals? Are you trying to create a herd immunity? Um, and in fact, she asked that question. Um, she says, the specific interpretations of technologies and systems that improve media literacy focus on facilitating users' ability to identify types of content, to determine its reliability and accuracy, and, and to have control over how they receive information. These emphasize, the, these prioritize the, the ability to detect misinformation rather than the capacity to critically engage with the media. So that goes back again to, well, what are you trying to achieve here? The second question I would ask is, what does the research say? I have spent years now speaking at different conferences asking for more research. What works? Because I tell you, like if there's one simple message, one three-word phrase or a seven-second gif that we could all just put out there and we'd solve the problem, we would do it. Of course there isn't. I'm not so naive to think that there is. Wishful thinking. But... Um, we need more research about what does work. There's a lot coming out of Stanford, which was mentioned earlier by Tim. Uh, the university was mentioned earlier. Um, there's, there's some coming out of there around the success of just reminding people that not everything you are looking at might be true, for example. Or um, looking at how different people, like the difference between journalists and fact checkers and how they um, check information. And to uh, the lovely Joel Breakstone, from Stanford suggests that we should encourage people to think like fact checkers. So the argument being, in his experiments, he's shown that when journalists are given an article to look at and decide whether it's real or not real, what a journalist does, and I was a journalist 20 years at the BBC, so I, I can see how this happened, they read right to the bottom of the article. 
And indeed, I used to teach that as part of many workshops that I've done for the BBC. Read right to the bottom. Don't just read the headline. Read right to the bottom of the article. Fact checkers don't. They look at it. They assess very quickly from the first couple of paragraphs. And then they want to go elsewhere to check it. Why carry on reading from the same source when actually what you want to find out is a different source? Does anyone else corroborate what's been said here? So those kinds of things then really inform what you may or may not teach in a media literacy course. And we just need so much more of that information. Any academics here? I'd be grateful to hear from you. Um, and then there's this question where media um, outlets can, can help. And, uh, you know, Tim... Um, stole some of my thunder, to be honest with you, because I think that there is a lot of things that journalism can do to integrate and to offer journalism that speaks to the media literacy skills that we would be trying to teach young people, adults, elderly people anyway. So things like, we all know there's a difference between saying, um, let's say you're doing a story on public service broadcasting and you say, this is Jeanette Ballard, she used to work for the BBC. That is different from saying, this is Jeanette Ballard, she used to work for the BBC, uh, or she worked for the BBC for 20 years, and she still has the BBC as a client. And it's even different from saying, this is Jeanette Ballard, and I went to speak to her because she works for the BBC for 20 years, and I've heard her before defending public service media. And those small changes in the way that journalism is presented can be really helpful. So if you are a media outlet thinking about doing some media literacy, I strongly recommend that you try to pull together. You have an audience already, you already publish, you already put things on TV, you already are online, you have your audience already. I highly recommend trying to bring closer your media literacy content, folding it into your journalism when you can, or just offering the additional pieces of the puzzle. And this is something that the BBC are trying to do. So if you look at, our, at the BBC's journalism, it does say more often, it'll give more context to people who are speaking. But also, we use, they use the online news um, website to have things like, there'll be a little box saying, um, this is why I, doesn't, it won't be titleless, but essentially, this is why I spoke to this organisation, or you know, background on this organisation, or background on this piece of research, to try and increase the transparency and increase the context that is provided. And that is part of media literacy. You don't have to go away to another website to learn a little bit about media literacy. You can learn it right there. OK, I've got one minute left. You didn't think I'd leave you without a little uh, animation just to get your juices flowing for lunchtime. Um, tech team, do I hit play? Do you hit play? There you go. Okay, tech team, don't worry, because I can, I can actually hear rumbling tummies rather than the music that's attached to this cartoon. Um, this cartoon basically says it's like 15 seconds long. It's the shortest piece of content I've ever made for Media Literacy, and I want to make them shorter and shorter. It's a sort of piece of work that I'm doing. Um, and basically it says, when you get a bunch of flowers, the first thing you do is you say, oh, they're lovely. I wonder who they're from. And it's, it can be the same in your news diet, right? So the message here is what you already do in your normal life, you can do in your digital life as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Janet. It's, it seems that we have... Uh, reason to take the tech lecture lessons first and read some oh. manuals. So <laughs> okay. Oh, there I was escaping for lunch, but uh, questions. Okay. Yes, but uh, <clears throat> again, we have a couple of minutes uh, to ask the questions from Janet. And uh, Slido is open again. If you go to uh, Slido, then you can write the questions. Uh, my question, you being in front of many, many audiences, is what is your worst, this kind of really worst experience when you feel that now this audience sucks? Oh, wow. <laughs> so a lot of my audiences are young audiences, and um, I, I, I don't often deliver workshops directly anymore, 
But this summer, the BBC was short of people, and I said I would do some. Uh, and they were working with councils who, um, as part of funding that came from COVID catch-up kind of ideas, they were working with councils who um, were engaging families, what we would call hard-to-reach families, uh, and trying to do different things. And one of the things they offered was that you could learn about fake news with the BBC. And we have lots of, we have lots of fairly young skill. They have lots of fairly young skewed material for that you know sharks in the water you know uncontentious things that are quite fun but help you ask similar questions that you might ask of something more serious later in life but they're they're designed for 11 to 18 year olds so when I logged on to zoom what I found was that all the 11 to 18 year olds who've been invited they go out right they're too cool for school what they'd left behind was their younger siblings so they were like five six seven and that was a really tough audience but also a fantastic audience because kids that age, they still ask why. And there must be a piece of research on this somewhere. Somewhere along the line, that gets knocked out of you. But those children, those six, seven, eight-year-olds, ask why more often than I've ever been asked why. Yeah, but they, yeah, they were a pretty tough crowd. <laughs> <laughs> this crowd is a great crowd. <laughs> you are, yeah, yeah, you are so polite and politically correct, I know. Uh, it's, a, it's a question to follow up on this one because I had some reason to ask to start with this one. Is it quite hard, actually, to teach people who don't want to be taught? Yeah, the reach thing is difficult anyway. Um, so you do find that the people who engage are the people who want to know and who probably already know, have pretty good skills for how to navigate it anyway. Um, I, I, I just think there are other ways in. So, for example, imagine your 16-year-old who has their device and you have a programme on it and every time they open a certain uh, different apps, they just get a flash gift that's, that gives them a message. Not everything you believe is true. Just something simple. It doesn't have to... I mean, media literacy, you know, what a bore. God, what a boring, boring idea. It's so... Uh, the, the, the name itself, you know, it's never going to uh, travel very far. And that's why I think you do have to think about being populist. You do have to, you know, take it away from... And, I mean, a lot of the media literacy stuff doesn't do this. It's uh, my own stuff included. It's very classroom styled. It's very official. It's very, you know step by step we're going to go through this process and that's all good but I think there are really interesting ways to get in in a more populist way to just sending out messages what we don't know is whether that will work yeah more research is needed more research please yeah. and so, uh, therefore universities exist actually uh, at least I hope so that's me too my... do I have questions uh, no, that's then I don't forget this time. I almost did, but I'm I'm back on stage. Thank you so oh, much for being kind. here. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks. And we have a break actually. We're a little bit over the time. The so lunch is served, not on uh, people on uh, online. <laughs> All of you here, we have lunch served on the third floor of the Mare. To our new people here, I hope there are signs directing you to this building. And please try to be back here as soon as possible to catch up the time. And we have the other international presentations. Ja palun tulge siis tagasi võimalikult õigel ajal, sepärast, et meil on järgmised rahvusvahelised esinejad meie kava järgi ootamas. Aitäh ja näeme varsti.
Tere tulemast tagasi lõuna kenasti manustatud. Welcome. I hope you've enjoyed your uh, lunch. So we'll continue here from the uh, conference hall. And uh, the main topic of the uh, uh, next session is uh, the ca practical cases. Now and with practitioners, I am really happy to introduce to the audience here online and in here in auditorium, head of Latvian radio, Una. And now I am again in a trouble with pronunciations of the names. Estonians have the easy names, but uh, Latvians. <laughs> It's fine. Klapkalne. Yes, perfect. Yeah, please. Okay. Una. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for giving this opportunity uh, to... But I don't know if this big screen should be working. <laughs> Maybe somebody will put the screen on work. It will be really nice if technicians... Oh, they are on lunch still. Okay, <laughs> we will continue tomorrow. <laughs> But okay. Uh, I can start anyway. No, so, please. Let's. So probably at least one, one small screen is uh, I'm, I'm really, really sorry that okay. this technical issues this is something we should be able to avoid. But now, here, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much and, uh, and uh, good afternoon. And uh, yes. Uh, I'm working in a public radio already for four years. And as you might imagine, these four years uh, have been very challenging and interesting, especially last two one. And um, a good thing in all this corona crisis is that actually for public uh, service media, uh, these times have been uh, mostly rewarding in terms of audiences. And uh, it is reflected in our numbers of reach. So uh, this has been good side of it, but, uh, but of course, if we talk in broader sense and when this crisis will be over, uh, definitely uh, we again will be back uh, struggling with the issues why public service media actually are necessary, what's the public value in it, how much people should pay for it, and, uh, and, uh, and actually who should pay for it. So, and of course, uh, the scenery with all big, big players uh, will give tough times to public service media for sure. So, for the context, uh, I will talk about uh, Latvian radio group, of course, but, uh, but uh, just uh, as background information, uh, we are currently separate, uh, Latvian radio and television. Radio consists of five uh, different uh, uh, programs and uh, our weekly reach is around 800,000 uh, listeners online, which basically means approximately a bit less than 40% of the population. Uh, while television consists of two channels, and uh, there are web media as well, uh, portal lsm.lv, uh, uh, where all content uh, which is uh, relevant is coming both from radio and television. So, uh, of course, we are active in social media as well. And uh, when we are talking about numbers, usually we are in a, in a kind of very hard situation to persuade uh, while linear is going down, what actually uh, we are reaching in, in digital media. Uh, we can see that our reach in digital media is growing exponentially, but still we can't find a good, uh, good, uh, good, uh, good uh, methodology how to uh, prove actually how many people we are reaching, because for sure there are those people who listen linear uh, radio as well, listen podcasts or, or archives. Uh, so therefore, always there will be little bit of struggle and battle and would be nice if, if somebody could, uh, could really come up with good methodology, how to really count and see what, what, what our audience is. And then uh, uh, to describe this, what I said already in the beginning, is that, uh, and I'm sorry for, for the lunch being so boring with numbers, <laughs> please feel, feel free to fall asleep if you feel like, but, uh, but this is from EBU report uh, on, on this year, showing that actually this crisis has been uh, fairly good for, for radio, uh, which has been in trust going up, as well for, for, for uh, 
for television and print, but not so much for web and social media for sure. Because all, all of this, what, what were already said about uh, populism, about uh, division of, of views and, 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 and uh, like different uh, positions on, on, on the same topics. Um, And one more challenge for us during the next year will be that actually there is a law which says that uh, public service media should join, should be merged. And um, therefore, actually internally, on top of all these issues which are, uh, which are uh, relevant for everybody around the world, we will have our internal, uh, internal uh, kind of uh, hard and challenging times as well, because, uh, because uh, of course, there are struggles how to do this. Uh, th there is no clear situation regarding how public service media should be financed in Latvia. I, I envy uh, Lithuanian colleagues where this is very clearly um, aligned with some taxes. Uh, we'll see if we will manage to persuade our uh, politicians to go the same direction, but at least we, we should try. And, uh, and uh, on top of this all, uh, when two media like TV and radio will be merged, definitely it will be one really big uh, player in the market. So what is obvious, um, this process should be done so that uh, neither commercial sector nor populists nor, I don't know, somebody else who would like to would be able to attack results of this process or even to intervene in this process. So this is a situation in general in Latvian public service media. Uh, regarding um, uh, attempts to measure public value, for radio we have done it already in uh, two uh, sets. Uh, definitely till the, uh, 2018 uh, there were not enough money so we're actually doing it very fragmentically and uh, I can't say there would be any system. Uh, then uh, we did two public uh, value tests in two 2018 and 19, uh, and the uh, results I will present a bit later. And the uh, third, uh, third thing is happening uh, right now is uh, we are having radio brand uh, positioning research as well will show some data already and uh, there is new methodology which should enter into force from this year uh, on public uh, public value measurement. So, um, in general, uh, I would say in, in, in Latvia at least we are quite good at uh, measuring uh, uh, inputs. For example, how much money we are spending on this or that issue or how many minutes of something we have produced, but we are not so well at measuring uh, outcomes and outputs or even more general impact on society, which is made by, by public service media. So in, in, in general, what I can say, uh, we have nice mission, um, but uh, if you would ask me if we measure, are we even half step closer to reaching it, I can't say it because this is not what we are measuring right now. Uh, I would say that uh, this, is, this is something which uh, still remains uh, for us uh, uh, ahead and, and uh, I even can't say that we are much into thoughts about it because of all those daily, daily issues which are coming, coming up. Of course, uh, we are in some very good positions, like uh, in reach of uh, younger audiences for radio are quite, quite good and stable. Um, there are, our audience actually haven't dropped lately and so on. We are really exploding in social media and podcasts. But still, if it really makes value for society, it remains a really, really good question. So, um, as you all know, I shouldn't go into depth about it. Public value is uh, really diverse and multidimensional. And uh, the most important, of course, for public service media are those uh, topics which are not so, so much covered by commercial media. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, 
analytics, news, discussions, education, democracy, which I would name as the first ones. And um, therefore, as well, of course, the trust in what public service media are doing is uh, really essential uh, for, uh, for, for us as public service media. Otherwise, uh, our, our job can be, you know, thrown in based bin. So, unfortunately, I don't think that you will see much, but um, I will try to explain. Uh, and probably I, I hope that uh, this presentation will be shared so that you can see those numbers if you feel like. Um, during our, our public, uh, public value uh, reports um, done in 2018, 2019, we have been looking at several issues and, and several topics, and, um, which is a really good thing for us. It would be like that... Um, that, that part where we feel confident and uh, where even a whole population, regardless if they listen to radio or they don't, uh, says that actually we are, we are good at uh, informing and delivering news. Uh, the same is about uh, national culture issues and uh, in general improving knowledge and knowledge and, and, and uh, World, world view on different things. Um, but, but of course, I'm kind of the person uh, that usually thinks that probably we should focus mostly on those topics which are not so uh, well reflected. And uh, on, on really bottom one is uh, how we inform people and, and educate about new technologies. Uh, since it was done, this research was done in uh, 1819, so basically already from this year we do have a really good one, good program, uh, radio show about uh, uh, new digital technologies. So I hope that uh, when we'll measure these, these, uh, these uh, results uh, next time that uh, this will be already in a bit better shape. But uh, the thing which worries me most actually is this one. Uh, where still, after 30 years of independence, um, uh, people are not so convinced if Latvian radio represents interests of society or interests of government. And uh, you can see it's quite, let, let's say, only ha let's say half half. And um, and uh, I have no good solution for this. Uh, maybe you can advise me later on coffee breaks or, or wherever. But, but really, this is worrying me still, uh, that, uh, that to a certain extent we are still very much associated with state and state information. And of course, during, uh, during COVID crisis, it, uh, I guess if we will measure this uh, next time, it will be even more so because uh, we have to inform about government decisions even more than we have done it previously. So, uh, this is how it looks like. And uh, when we look at our listeners, then uh, the problems remain the same. Uh, and uh, and uh, evaluation in general is the same, but what is the difference that those who are listening to us uh, they rate our content 20% plus better than those who don't listen. And then the question, of course, is how do we reach those people who don't listen or who don't know about us? Um, one, one more slide about very first results, preliminary results from brand uh, research is about... Um, satisfaction of listeners, and you can see that uh, uh, altogether it's uh, very good. Uh, so, so almost 90% are satisfied. Um, when we look at uh, trust, uh, and we, of course, we compared with all three public service media, so at least in this research, uh, radio is in better position with 67% uh, as uh, trusted and radio 60 and um, our portal with 50 percent. Still, anyway, it's, these are good results um, in general, but, but still uh, there is a lot of room for improvement for sure. 
So, yes, and this is what I was already saying, that, uh, of course, uh, higher scores are for those who are listening our content, and, and, uh, and uh, we actually should more focus now how to reach uh, those who don't listen to us. And somehow I, I, I thought that it will be complicated with videos, so this is only the, uh, the photo of our latest campaign for public radio. Uh, and um, we have this campaign uh, with the slogan Never Ending Discovery because we understand we have actually over 200 um, radio shows in our programs. And uh, we are sure that actually every, every citizen could find something of his or her interest in our programs. We just can't reach it. And, and then uh, this video is such that uh, as I, Einstein got this first apple on his head and then this guy is getting like 200 of those apples and, and, uh, and uh, could, uh, could, uh, could, uh, could, uh, could get my, uh, a lot of fruit for, 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 for thought listening to, to, to radio or podcasts. Uh, so, uh, we'll see if this campaign actually will result in some uh, real uh, listening uh, improvements. And, uh, and uh, lately we are really as well trying to work a lot in, in podcast sector, so, so to become actually number one uh, producer of podcasts in Latvia. So, uh, we'll see how it all will work out. And then, uh, as I already told, we are just on the beginning of starting new edition of how to measure public value. And um, um, the methodology is quite complex, so we are having uh, um, three sets of different things which we should do. Uh, one is, uh, one is uh, just exit pool uh, with uh, all our listeners, TV viewers and, and web then expert surveys, and then uh, there is envisaged something which we could call public value, but uh, I wouldn't say that uh, the uh, approach is correct, and I hope we will cor correct it later on, uh, to um, align the results uh, or, or public, uh, publicly available statistical data to the job uh, what public service media have done. For example, there was an uh, idea to, 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 to judge about the content of public service media from the number of new uh, companies uh, registered, which actually I couldn't say that I agree totally because basically the first would be really uh, economic factors which influence this rather than, uh, than, uh, than, uh, than really public service media. So we will see how, how we will succeed with this one. And uh, what I would say is that actually, uh, definitely we need some, some, uh, some more uh, different approaches how to really measure real public service uh, media value. And of course, how to reach more people in more meaningful way. Uh, and not to lose the sight on what we should deliver in bureaucracy uh, as it's possibly easier. So, I guess I will save a little bit of time, two minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, saving the time is, uh, is not uh, actually obligation because you are here to, <laughs> to make a presentation, not to save time. But uh, again, we have a possibility to ask questions via Slido if you have and raise your hand from the audience if you want to ask a question from the audience just put up your hand I can't see any hands raised about 15 20 years ago it was the first rumors that television will be dead soon when internet came in so there was nothing about radio how come you know Luckily, I have been in a, the one more conference before this conference. So, uh, basically, uh, there are some trends which are saying that people are getting a bit uh, tired of screens. I will not be able to now uh, directly tell the numbers, but, uh, but that's why people feel like they, they put audio on 
and do something else because on screen you have to really be present. You just can't. I mean, go by. While, while at the same time we did some research on podcast uh, consumption back home in Latvia, and uh, what struck us totally was that uh, that uh, the biggest uh, consumption of podcasts actually is in YouTube which we wouldn't imagine, actually, and we are not putting <laughs> our podcast in YouTube, but we are considering now. Who is your main competitor? <sighs> you know, uh, I guess that we are not alone in this situation, that we are having so many competitors right now, and basically all big players, uh, we are all competing for the same. I don't know, three or four hours per day, which people are spending on, uh, on, uh, on digital platforms, uh, whatever, listening, watching, scrolling, whatever. And, and therefore, uh, it is really an issue of, of very good quality of content so that we can, uh, can really provide to people. And of course, the problem is that, unfortunately <laughs> for us, uh, yeah, uh, I would say not only younger generations, but all generations almost are speaking English now. So we are having endless competition. Oh, here is a question. Uh, yes, it actually is uh, the biggest, uh, biggest radio for Russian speaking uh, um, my, my minority. And uh, the audience, unfortunately, of course, is aging uh, for this uh, channel especially. Uh, because uh, in this, uh, during this brand, uh, brand research, actually, we managed to, to, uh, to, uh, to look at um, focus groups as well, and uh, there were focus groups for, for Radio 4 as well. And it turned out that younger generation, actually, if they feel like they, they listen to Radio 1, and they actually are quite familiar with the program. They know what's happening on Radio 1. Uh, so we will see how this all will, 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 will develop because, because uh, currently, of course, we are doing it and we are, uh, we are trying new ways how to go into platforms as well. So to reach this public, public where it is, not only to, to remain on, on linear audio. Okay, thank you. If there are no more questions, then I almost forget again. <laughs> it's, I'm not learning so well. Okay. Thank you okay. so much. Okay, thank you, thank you. Oh, there, there is one question. I don't know, I have some kind of filtering system on a... F yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's uh, without the microphone now, the question is, there's some delay in between that. About the cost of radio stations being 525 for uh, one Lat uh, Latvian radio, is it per month or per year? No, 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 it's per year. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you prevent the spread of misinformation in your broadcasts? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, actually, most, um, mo most of them will be, anyway, our shows. So. Um, either they are longer than on air, or they are specially made. So, um, yes, and, and still the most popular are still the same, which are the most popular in linear audio. So, so that's how it goes. And the question is also for, for linear radio, because a very popular uh, show is uh, where people are calling to the studio, and they can uh, discuss and ask questions to some, uh, some uh, not only to the host of the program, but as well to some invited persons, so uh, they are quite popular. Although they are really controversial with all vaccines and everything, so, but, um, yeah. And there is a third question, not directly towards the radio. Uh, the question is, which effect have you seen from blocking Russian television channels in Latvia? Have the audience, I mean, have the audience turned more to national channels? Uh -huh. I guess it will be really a good question for Rita to answer, because this will be <laughs> directly with, with, her, with her presentation. But, but I would say that what we are doing, we really are doing now, uh, 
we are trying to reach our audiences in, 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 in uh, digital platforms, but what we have to do actually to reach them is uh, we are going to um, Russian platforms and then they go up and then they go up in Latvian platforms as well. So this is some kind of strange metrics how it functions. So we actually have to deliver our, our content to Russia <laughs> first and then we will get it back on, on the list of popularity in Latvia. So very interesting. This, this part is really very interesting, yeah. No more question here. It's, uh, thank you. Thank you so <laughs> thank much. You. And we will hear a little bit more in Next presentation Järgmin ülekan tuleb meil Zoomi vahend. Next transmission will take place via Zoom from Hungary. And I see Peter is not yet on Zoom. Uh, so if I can ask a question if Patrick, are you ready to jump on the floor and yes. Are you here? Yes. At least we tested your video. It worked once. <laughs> yes. It's, um, Üks hetk läheb natukene tehnikaga aega, et sellise one of the painful lessons of arranging a hybrid conference is, but we try and be better next time and try to have a universal clock going in the world, so everybody in the world will follow us on Estonian time. And you have something to introduce, which is, is Enter. Enter. What does it mean in Estonian? Mida see Nothing. Eesti tähendab? Mitte midagi. That's good. Oi, väga hea. That's good. Okay. So, uh, yes, hello. Yeah. I'm Patrick Loisch from uh, Deutsche Welle, which is the international broadcaster of Germany. We have 35, uh, 31 languages in which we broadcast all over the world. We have um, 297 million viewers per week. Um, we have 11 European languages. Um, and all that, what's called ENTER, started three, four years ago when a director general came to me and to others saying, what can we contribute to Europe under the impression of Brexit, under the impression of what happened in Hungary, under the impression of a polarized world, under the impression of fading away narratives about Europe and why an idea of Europe could be a good idea for peace, democracy and all that kind of stuff. And the, um, the fact that constantly when you analyze it via CrowdTangle or others, for instance, when you look at what young people are consuming on internet, you find out that nationalist, populist voices uh, are growing in the perception. So this is, um, I, I listened very much closely to the presentations this, this morning, um, saying that, yeah, many people are consuming many different sources at an eye to eye level, uh, and they don't distinguish between what is deriving from journalism and what is deriving from, you know, propagandism or, or what, what, what else. And uh, we started um, uh, talking about how, what can we do as an international broadcaster. And one of our main competencies is to understand cultures, because if you broadcast in Serbian, for instance, or in, uh, in Hausa for, for Africa or in Bengali for Bangladesh, so you have to understand the people, and we are successful in that markets. We work with local teams. We work a lot with rebroadcasters. We partner very much with uh, uh, media in these regions, in these countries. Also with Baltic media, for instance, which we share Russian content for TV, for instance, and uh, we do training. So one of our core competences is to, um, to step into different cultures. Uh, and, and try to understand people on the ground and uh, bring an added value. Our claim at Deutsche Welle is made for minds. 
minds are all these people that are questioning if life tomorrow couldn't be better in one way or another. It's not an elite identification of audience. It's also a young student, for instance, or a worker, but somebody that cares a little bit about what is tomorrow and what can I do and what information I need to act in, in my life. That, that's our philosophy on, on, on program. We teamed up uh, with France Media Monde. France Media Monde is the French international broadcaster. And we are the remaining ones in the EU <laughs> after Brexit and the World Service, uh, the, the BBC World Service somehow disappeared from the, from the EU map still around as, as a, a very important source. Um, but from the EU perspective, um, there, is, there is no other institutions than the two of us that, that have that capacity uh, and, 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 and have a look into European and global issues at the same way. All the other media are barely nation, national oriented and the national perspective is one of the main sources uh, of disconnect between Europe and the citizens in Europe. Because all the national uh, broadcasters usually, you know, national media, are reporting uh, to, uh, on the EU from a perspective of this is foreign policy, this is our interests, this is foreign policy. Um, and in fact, uh, Europe can, not, can go forward only if you understand European affairs as a kind of home affairs. Uh, which is shown by uh, the corona crisis very heavily, by the way. Uh, and in that philosophy, we asked ourselves, what can we do? And the answer was, first of all, we have to be critic with everything that is Europe. Um, there is no single conception of Europe, but we have to have a debate about future life in Europe. Um, the old narratives are no longer working, so what could be an asset of a Europe of tomorrow? What are the challenges of a Europe of tomorrow? And all that for young generations. And that means that you have to go to the platforms where the young generations are. And the outcome was the idea of a project that is a debate project in many languages that addresses also and particularly what we call non-cosmopolites, which means young Europeans that are not easily traveling to another country to, to, to study, that are not participating in Erasmus programs and all the likes, you know. There is a third of the young Europeans that are globalists. Huh? And there is 40% that are more non-cosmopolites. They are not all nationalists or extremists, but they don't addict instantly to a globalized idea of a global agile, flexible community. And we wanted to offer something to them, and it should be on, in their language, and it should be uh, on social media. That was the main decision. We took a lot of discussion with actors around Europe, including the European Commission, the European Parliament, but also partners in the countries and many young people. We organized ideation workshops, we did brand testing and all the kind of stuff. So everything I, you can see now from, from the project that I'm going to briefly present to you has been worked on over two, three years. And since March, the project is running. Since May, the channels are on. And here is what it is about. The, um, this is the consortium. We have six languages at the moment. It's a start. We want to have all European languages at the end of the day, becoming a true pan-European network on social media. Now we have partners in Poland, France, Portugal, Ireland, Romania, and Germany. And as you can see, it's a mix of public and private partners, which is quite interesting. We don't care. We are not an EBU copy. We are not an EBU news exchange uh, on social media. We are very open to cooperate. I give you a three-minute video uh, where the makers are talking, which starts with uh, the video, the presentation video that you can find also on the website, enter.net.
Anta is a social media project in six languages across Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. Anta is all about young Europeans talking to young Europeans. The food, the sea, it sounds dreamy, doesn't it? A partir do momento que eu comecei a deslocar na bicicleta, em que um dia... System is stronger. What is important to know is that the contents are produced by young journalists as well, that create a very dynamic mood. Bună! Salutat din București! Eu sunt Diana. Olá! Eu sou a Joana e bem-vindos a Lisboa. Hi, my name is Lukas and I work for the Enter Team in Berlin. Cześć, nazywam się Bartłomiej Wóblewicz i jestem dziennikarzem Onet.pl. Media is always about competition. Everybody wants the attention of the users. But I think it's something where you have common values and you have a common idea, then working together helps. We are not one company targeting young people, but several companies targeting in them mother tongue young Europeans. Of course, a lot of young Europeans speak English, but a part of them doesn't, and sometimes they can feel isolated. Other European media projects are often very much focused on what's happening in Brussels. We specifically try not to do that, so whenever we talk about European politics, we will deal with them in a rather implicit way. We cover any issues that young Europeans care about, climate, poverty, employment, women's rights, all sorts of topics that young Europeans are interested in. What ENTA aims to be is a community. So whatever content we produce is really just supposed to be a starting point for debate. When we post content, we try to, to ask questions in order that the community can answer, can make proposals. We're not trying to, to sell to young people that this is what they should believe in, but rather engage them into a discussion about what kind of Europe they want to live in. The issues like climate or uh, employment, all these issues, very important for this generation, they don't, they don't know borders, they don't have borders. So to share about these issues is the right way to find solutions, to solve problems. The users will realize that their problems might be the same as somewhere else in Europe. And now we are testing it, and now we are starting it. Enter, yeah, yeah. At the beginning, we, we had a, an idea of creating content and sharing this content via a huge variety of platforms because all these partners own social media platforms and online platforms. But then, uh, with, in long discussions, we, we, we found out that it would be better to establish a new brand because you need a, a, a very strong visual identity uh, when you want to succeed on uh, Instagram, for instance, or on YouTube or on TikTok. And um, that is what you see here. Um, so when you, when you check enter channels on Instagram, for instance, you will find six of them in all the languages. And you see that the topics are varying, but the identity is the, the same. The visual identity and, and, and the, 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 the spirit is very much the same. And that is exactly the challenge. We are very at the beginning of this editorial process. Yes, you can know what young people uh, in Europe are interested in. Um, we have what we call focus topics, uh, and they were researched also. These are mainly topics that are common in, of common interest among your, young Europeans, uh, what country ever. The point here is, how are you going to address them? Because when you say education and skills, what does that mean? And for ENTER, it does mean we're not reporting about education or economy, but we try to make the link to the real questions that people have towards this area of, of knowledge or interest. 
By the way, our um, target group identification is 18 to 34. Seems very large and is not matching with any other usual target group by age. But age is not the, the, the decisive matter here. Uh, we want to touch on people that step from being responsible for themselves, being student, for instance, or in, 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 uh, in, in, in class, um, into a self-defined uh, life. Uh, getting married, looking for a job, getting a baby, um, housing, all that kind of stuff. So when you step into your professional and private life in a complicated setting, uh, that is exactly where you need a lot of advice how to do, what to do, and when you are interested in looking at your op options and opportunities. And by the way, this is exactly where Europe has to deliver a lot via a lot of, of, of instruments you know, and policies. Uh, so 18, that can happen in some countries very early, in some countries is very, very late. It depends on, you know, culture, but also the educational systems. So that's why by age, the definition of the target group is very large, but it, it, it should target a certain situation of life. And it works. The main thing is to say, okay, we very much value differences. You are all different. You have different um, life circumstances. You believe in different things, but we also celebrate commonalities. What are commonalities that we could have? So, from the beginning in May, on all the 18 channels, uh, we have uh, 16, 16 million views for a new branded um, social media project. This is quite okay, I guess. By end of uh, August, I guess, by end of September. And we have t uh, 25 million subscribers. That's something we have to work on. It's growing slowly, but we aim at having an organic growth. Yes, we do marketing, but uh, we are looking for an organic growth. Uh, and again, the project is very new. Um, it is obviously promoted and cross-posted by the channels that we own, the partners, but we try really to establish um, these channels as a brand in social media. Uh, and you know that is, that is uh, hard. Uh, to do. Um, the community starts to be more lively. Um, on Instagram, the, um, how it works and the variety of formats that we develop for the, for the project is richest. Uh, you can check it also on YouTube or on Facebook, but on Instagram you can, you can really see uh, what, we, what we are looking for, because we think that on, on Instagram you can see really how it should look, how it should address topics, etc., etc. I'm shortening a little bit my, my presentation because my time is up, obviously. Um, what is the learning here from, from the first months? Um, we are not translating... First of all, um, we came from a perspective of low local. We said, okay, First, every partner for its own cultural setting, for its social media market in Poland, in Romania, in Portugal, in France, has to come up with a solution, a topic and a format that could be successful in its market. And then the editorial team that works on a daily basis together across all the countries and, and partners is assessing what could be the, the success formula in that idea um, test it, and then we pick it and we transform it into something that could be successful in another market. So we came from the idea that we should not have a format and then say, okay, this is interesting for all young Europeans from Poland to Portugal. That's how we speak about it. Please do that in Portuguese, do that in Polish, we do it in German, France Millemont is doing it in France. That's more or less how many other projects are working. And that is exactly what we didn't want to do. Now, over time, we learned that it is, however, wise to identify topics commonly that are uh, of importance, but then find very specific ways to turn it. So when you check a topic, for instance, on Afghanistan, the recent one, or on LGTB, you will find out that you see sometimes the same protagonists 
but the packaging and the angle and the approach is different to the piece in every single language when you check the Insta Poland and when you check the Insta German, for instance. You see that it is different. So we are not translating, we are at least adapting, but often we are agreeing on a topic and an angle and all the partners for the platforms are playing it very differently up to address you know, their, or, or their audience. Um, one other thing is that uh, we learned that we have to be easy and universal in what we do because you can imagine uh, that it is very, very expensive to feed uh, six languages and three channels per language. At the beginning, we had the idea that we can, you know, from one video, we, we derive then something for YouTube and we do a short one on, on Insta and we have then Facebook and so, but we learned very, very quickly that that is not possible, that we have to really produce for every single social media platform a unique piece that, that works. And it means that uh, it's, it's not easy to simply cross post stuff. Huh? The stuff that is really successful is the one that is uniquely designed for every single platform and in every single language. And that's why we are, f we are trying to find ways to be easy, adaptable and universal on one hand, but very specific on the other hand. That is a real challenge when you think about a pan-European, pan-language, multi-language uh, social media uh, product. Um, yes, well, we are more and more developing cross-border formats where we try to find different angles combined in one single um, video, for instance. Um, I have a, an example here that I skip because Andres is coming closer and closer. <laughs> um, yes, um, we are very much um, looking forward uh, to the next... Um, to the next phase of the project. We applied for funding for the next year. Um, what we will do is uh, we will invest more in format development via design thinking. Uh, we will open up the whole project for content creators. We will more collaborate with bloggers and influencers. We have some experience in doing so to open up the platform for such kind of cooperation. It's very funny and very interesting to do so. But on one hand, you have to be very open to the ideas that comes. And on the other hand, you have to be very strict to your principles, be it on design, be it on journalism. And it is a lot of work to, to, to work with influencers um, when you want to keep away from that the project turns more in their world, but their world is paying on your world. We definitely will uh, step as, as next into TikTok uh, because TikTok becomes more and more, in, um, the, uh, more and more important. And we will strengthen also debate and dialogue with these non-cosmopolite groups, uh, which, which is hard to do, um, which we just started. But um, I think we are able to do so. And I learned a lot also from, from, from these uh, groups, from, you know, from, from Tim Powell's presentation this morning, for instance, how to engage with people that are more or less resistant to or the media or some, 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 some topics, etc. So, yes, thank you very much for uh, having the chance to present this, this uh, unique project. Um, and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, yeah. I have a gift for you. Oh. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. But, uh, let's <laughs> thank you very much. Make, 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 we exchange red against yellow. That's nice. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, entering into a new world. But we have questions here. Uh, you almost answered the question regarding a TikTok and the new platforms uh, developing the new new areas. But the other question is: uh, Could you choose the most relevant problem among young people in the contemporary society and explain how would you try to solve? with assistance of enter. Um, the, the, when, when, when you look at it from a general perspective, um, the most important problem that we have or challenge among young people is, to, uh, as I think, is that uh, most of the young Europeans uh, say that they have first a national identity and then barely second a, a, a European identity. 
So the, the feeling um, of your, you know, where you belong, where you, where you position yourself in, in a highly interconnected world, uh, in a highly globalized world, is, is a real problem. I'm not, I'm not against, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, national identity. I'm Belgian, by the way, and I often say that I'm Belgian. I live in Germany, I'm Belgian. But I, I grew up on the border. When I was 16, I had also four, always four currencies in my pockets. Deutschmark, Niederländisch Gulden, uh, Franc Luxembourgeois, and Franc Belge. So, for me, Europe was an incentive. No border control, one single, you know, it eased my life. But unfortunately, that's not the reality for many young Europeans. They don't care about that. And the fact that there was war and that there is peace now is not an issue for them. They grew up in peace with roaming, with no border controls between here and Spain. They take it for granted. But it's not sufficient to adapt them to that idea. And that's something that is really, really, really important to, to drive. What does that mean to live in Europe? You can identify yourself as Hungarian or Belgian or so on, but there is also Europe. Thank you. Yeah, so the question, please wait for a microphone because online people don't listen to your question otherwise. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's interesting, who is producing all this content? Do you work with the freelancers or you have some uh, Everybody can apply with the idea, and just young people can write and do the something what's interesting, you know. No, it's a it's it's a professional structure. So so we have with each partner has a small editorial team where you have one full contracted staff that is a kind of coordinator, and then obviously there are freelancers behind as a first layer. So we have a larger group of freelancers in all that countries. Uh, and then beyond, there is this work with influencers, as I said, with, with, with bloggers and vloggers and influencers, case by case on a project basis, small series, etc., etc. Um, there is another project that goes that way of, you know, young people can apply and then they, if they pick the video, they get paid 50 euro or something like that. We don't like too much that kind of idea because we, 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 we don't think that you can get good quality uh, by that means. But you are right when you're saying that um, on one hand uh, professional journalism needs some structures, yes, but on the other hand social media it's, is much much more and you can earn much more ideas and very good stuff from people that are not professional journalists. And that is exactly the way uh, we want to go now. Um, we do it with a partner in the next year's round uh, which is called uh, Are We Europe? And it's, the idea is to have workshops where we invite young people and then they develop in a design sprint, tech, with the design sprint technology. Uh, they develop ideas and then we buy the ideas. So it's, it's both opening up but framing also. And which countries are next where you try to develop your project? You are in six countries now, but where, which directions you go? Um, Difficult to say. Uh, we, we definitely want to add uh, Eastern European languages and Southern European languages, but we thought also about uh, Baltic countries, for instance. It depends a little bit on where we find a, a partner that is up to step on board, because there is a contribution to make to the project. This is not a business project. This is uh, co-funded. This is partly funded. You have to invest in the brand. You have to invest in, in this idea to become part of this network, and it's difficult to say uh, who, who will be. Priority would be Hungarian, Italian, um, and then you can pick any other language. Uh, there is no big difference, you know, in importance to, to drive such kind of thing. Huh? You cannot say, okay, you can you, okay, leave that, that language aside and the other one. The idea is really to have it uh, for, for, for every European in its language. It's a question uh, related to uh, this one. It's why not Russian yet? Russian is <laughs> Russian is an option because Russian is the second most spoken second language in Europe. When you look at what is the second language of people, the first language is English, the second language is Russian. It's very important. 
we, we actually fought in the context of, of, of uh, Baltic countries, we fought of uh, looking, uh, assessing if Russian for, 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 for Europe, for people that are far from the ideas of Europe that speaks Russian could be a good idea. Yes, indeed. And the last question from uh, here, it's how much it will cost to join? <laughs> how much it will cost to join? Thank you very much. You can, I mean, we can discuss. It's, we, we, we managed to get on the ground a funding scheme with the European Commission that could potentially fund the project over a couple of years. But we have to apply for it. It's, it's not set. We, we, we have no contract. And we don't want a contract, very clear. But we need uh, funding as a public, because it is a public project. Even if we have private partners, it's however, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a public service endeavor somehow. So you, you don't need to bring money, but uh, yes, it depends on the scope of co-production that you do, and you have, to, you, you have to invest in it. But we can discuss that bilaterally. <laughs> yeah, and the last, last question, in English. Why not in English yet? We are doing English. Oh. Yes, we are doing English. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, 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 yes. What is the difference uh, producing the content in English for a different countries? Is it the same? Yeah, it's, dif it's difficult because uh, your, 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 your research is, is more difficult. We have no home country for English. Um, English. English is the lingua franca, which is somehow also the working language of the project. Um, we have a pan-European audience with English, which is quite undefined. Uh, but uh, many, uh, con uh, many content is adapted from English into other languages. So that's also why English is important. I, I would say it's, it's even maybe more important for the inner co cooperation and collaboration of the project than for the, real, uh, for the real audience reach. Okay. Thank you so much. Please give a hand. Palunks applause. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we are entering, <laughs> entering into next presentation. Uh, please leave it uh, with yes, with me. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, meil on Zoomis olemas külalis esineja kohe, kas me saame Zoomipildisi ette kavaluks. Hello, Peter Erdely from Hungary. Hey. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Just one second, it'll take a minute to switch the screen. And now you are in front of our audience in online and also here in Tallinn University Conference Forum. Please, That's the screens are yours. Thank you. Uh, can you see my presentation as well? Not yet, but it will be on a screen right now. Okay, great. So, hi, uh, my name is Peter Erde, uh, and I'm going to be talking about the, the Hungarian media landscape and the five sort of important forces that are shaping what's going on in Hungary at the moment. Um, I work as a senior editor and business development director at 444.au. Just very brief, briefly about us, we started uh, in 2013 with, uh, with 12 people. Now we have a staff of 30 full-time reporters and editors. We publish around 40, 60 pieces, con uh, pieces of content a day. We are a, a news site, so we do politics, economy, uh, crime, uh, foreign affairs, and we do long-form journalism, investigations, and videos. We are fairly big. Uh, Hungary is a country of 9.8 million people, and we have around 500,000 daily and 3 million monthly visitors. And we are fairly good on social, I guess. And we launched a membership program exactly three months ago uh, today. And now we have 12,000 paying members. And I'll touch on that in my presentation. So this is who we are, just you know, so you know what my perspective is shaped by. Um, I think when we look at Hungary, we need to take uh, the, the past 10 years, past 11 years into account and the government we had. So I'm going to talk briefly about that. Uh, pressure on advertisers, uh, media capture by state or state aligned actors and restricted access to public information and officials. And then I'm going to talk about the effect of the, the pandemic, the crisis of 2020 
and uh, some hopeful new models that have emerged. But I have to say that last year, especially the first six months, was probably the most difficult for Hungarian media since the democratic transition of 1989. And that's saying something because the past 10 years wasn't exactly peachy either. So the first factor is about money. And it's about how uh, the government, how the state is trying to starve independent media. So basically in Hungary, but I think this is true for many post-communist countries, the state is a very large or the largest advertisers, in fact. And the state almost exclusively advertises with outlets that are aligned with them. So if you're an independent media uh, media outlet or critical of the government, you will not get state advertising money. And state advertising is not just uh, you know the, the government itself. It's the state-owned or partially state-owned companies. It's the municipalities. It's It's a very big part of the advertising uh, scene. Now, this is not only true for the state itself, but also big private advertisers, especially in the digital sphere where I'm like familiar with financial services companies like banks or telecom companies are very big players, but they operate in uh, regulated marketplaces and they are very cautious about where they spend their money for advertising because they don't want to upset the government. You can see uh, two charts on the bottom. The the left one is the audience share of the two largest television channels, RTL, which is owned by the German Bertelsmann Group, and TV2, which is owned by some people close to the government. Basically, their viewership is pretty much the same. This is data uh, from 2010 to 2017. But if you look at the right, if you look at the revenues, you can see that TV2 is making a lot more money because they are willing to tow the government line. This is uh, the money from state advertisement. So independent media, especially if you are not very big, is, is a difficult business in Hungary. So this is one of the biggest way that the government interferes with the, with the media sphere. Now, I think the second most important factor is, is acquisitions and takeovers funded by EU money. Over the past 10 years, there was a near constant stream of acquisitions. Basically, the blueprint is very similar for for most of these things. You have big businessmen who make a lot of money on EU or state-funded projects, and then they go and reinvest their profits in media. And so what happens is media, independent media or critical media outlets are struggling, again, because they don't have access to a lot of advertising money. So a new owner comes in and offers a good price and uh, they acquire the media outlet. They do restructuring. Sometimes it's dressed up as economic necessity, but sometimes it's, you know, it's not. And sometimes it's just, no, we are firing the editor-in-chief and installing someone new. But shortly after the takeover happens, the the editorial tone of the outlet changes completely. And then uh, suddenly there is advertising and suddenly some of these outlets can turn profitable. So the first factor is advertising and the second is these takeovers, which has been happening for quite a while. So in 2018, after eight years of takeovers, there was a huge merger and the Central European Media and Publishing Foundation was formed. This is over 450 outlets under the same roof, magazines, TV channels, radios, web portals, all owned by the same foundation, a foundation that is very close to the government. This merger was exempt from regulatory oversight. The, The prime minister signed a decree and said that this merger was of strategic national interest. And because of that, for example, the competition authority couldn't look into it. And so the merger went ahead. And you can see the result in the bottom. These are the front pages of 16 regional newspapers. And this was from 2019, one day before the European election back then. And it's it's an interview, it's an identical interview with the prime minister with an identical title. And it's the the favorite agenda of the the government. It's about migration. Uh, The third uh, very important element is the restriction uh, of access to public information and officials. So I think in 2010, when the, when the current government came to power, Hungary had pretty good legal framework for freedom of information request and access to public information in general. But over the years, there were multiple amendments to these uh, legislations, each time to restrict access. So in 2013, the government introduced this concept of abusive freedom of information requests. Basically, it meant that if you ask for too many documents, the, the institution that you were asking could uh, designate it as abusive 
exclusive request and deny it on that uh, ground. Then from 2015, there was the option to charge label related costs. So the, the, the institution you're asking can say, okay, I'll give you the information, but it's going to cost you 2000 euros or 5000 euros. Now, especially if you're a smaller outlet and you don't have that much capital, this is prohibitive. And then 2015 and 16, they broadened uh, tax secrecy legislation, exempted certain enterprises from, from obligation to comply with requests. So it, it got increasingly difficult to get public information. You can still go to court, but as a journalist, I can tell you there are very few stories that are interesting today. And uh, so you ask a question and then you have to sue and then it's two years in front of the courts. And then maybe possibly if you're lucky, two years from today, you can get uh, the information you were looking for. But the story by then is irrelevant. And in 2020, there were new rounds of restrictions and extending deadlines. But I'm going to be talking about that in a second. There's also some additional restrictions, for example, in the parliament building, uh, journalists can't walk around the corridors anymore, you can't exactly ask MPs. Uh, if you try to go, there was an investigation a couple of years back, uh, an outfit tried to look into hidden assets of certain MPs. When they went to their hometowns to ask questions, the police was called and they were like... Uh, uh, the police was called because they, the, the MP said they were harassing people. Uh, and the Supreme Court recently designated uh, the son-in-law of the prime minister. Uh, he's a billionaire in his own rights, got rich through EU subsidies, Istvan Tiborts. Uh, the Supreme Court said he was not a public figure. And he already submitted a legal request to us to remove an article about him on this basis. So I think over the past 10 years, public affairs have gradually become the private matter uh, for people with power, and every relevant law, regulation, and practice echoes this shift in perspective. I think regime officials and politicians treat journalists asking them questions as if we were invading their privacy. Now, this was a very bad situation we were in, and then the pandemic came, and that, I think, enabled the government to go further with their agenda. Uh, in 2020, the digital advertising market collapsed. So as you saw before, there was not much of a, an advertising market, but was left of it collapsed because of the pandemic. Now, especially the spring 2020, we have elections next year, but back then it was two years away. The first wave of COVID spared Hungary pretty well, and the crisis resulted in a surge of popularity. This is not uncommon. In many countries, this happened. The government empowered. When it's a crisis, people, it's called a rally around the flag. And I think people's attention was generally focused elsewhere, not on press freedom. So the government, I think, used this moment to take new steps and introduce some new measures to further control the public discourse. There was new legislation announced last spring, which uh, uh, said scaremongering is, is an offense that can be punished by prison. And scaremongering is very vaguely defined. Uh, the, the law says anything that can hamper the state's defensive effort can be uh, considered scaremongering, uh, but it's not entirely clear uh, what those are. Now, this law was not used against journalists so far, but was used against everyday citizens. And these were like highly publicized arrests. There was uh, two pensioners uh, last summer. They posted some critical stuff about the government on Facebook. And then uh, after their post, the, the, the police came to their house in the morning and took them away. And they were all then cleared of charges. But the way this thing works, the, the chilling effect is has you don't have to convict these people. Uh, the police action, the publicized, highly publicized police action is more than enough. These are everyday Hungarians being taken away for, for Facebook posts. Everyone knows about it. And so if you're an average person, if you're not... Uh, native in the digital media sphere, then you began to think about, do, do I share this article? Do I post this stuff on Facebook? Oh, I heard about someone who got arrested over it. So I think this is very damaging. There was an extension of freedom of information uh, request deadlines and new exemptions. So basically, the government can now say, think for like 45 days before denying your request. And this makes getting information about the pandemic very difficult. There was also a near blanket ban for medical uh, practitioners, especially uh, nurses and doctors working in hospitals, to speak to the press about the situation that they saw. 
And then there was the, the takeover of Index, the largest independent website in Hungary, which followed the same blueprint that I described above. New owners came in in the spring. They said Index needed restructuring because they didn't make enough money. Of course, they didn't make enough money because of the pandemic, the economy stopped. The editor-in-chief protested, he got fired, and then most of the staff resigned in protest. I think it's important to note that press freedom in a crisis like the pandemic, it's not an abstraction, it's not just an ideal. People need to have accurate information to make the right decisions about their lives, health, and security. And if they don't have access to this information, it can be, har it can be very harmful. So last, uh, this spring, There was the third wave in Hungary, and that was a lot worse. Uh, hospitals got overwhelmed. There was triage. Some people didn't get access to, to the, the services they needed, and the, the death toll was very high. Now, the, in the government-controlled media, the picture they were showing was, yes, the pandemic is bad, but things are under control. Now, if you are an individual and you have to make choices about Are you meeting your parents? Are you meeting your friends? When Are you putting your uh, masks on? The access to information you have impacts these choices. And if, the, if you don't have access to the real picture, and in fact, the real picture was that many of the hospitals, especially in the countryside, got overwhelmed in the third wave, then you make different decisions. And I think this is where press freedom matters a lot. Now, I think what happened last year especially the takeover of Index, again, the largest independent website in Hungary, was a wake-up call for many readers. And many, many outlets began exploring uh, audience revenue models from 2016 and 17, just because of the incredible political pressure on the advertising market. But I think the readers realized in 2020 that if they don't pay for independent news, there, there won't be an independent newsroom less. The government will just come in and take over more and more. So uh, for 444 last April, when the pandemic hit Hungary, we lost almost half of our revenues, almost overnight. And uh, we had to start with this awful math of survival. We had money for maybe three months and then ended up introducing progressive pay cuts throughout the organization. We didn't fire anyone, but again, we had, we had money for three months, so we didn't exactly know where we would end. And then we turned to our readers for support and we told them openly that our survival was in their hands. We launched a donation drive, a crowdfunding campaign and sort of a pre-membership. And it was really successful. So by the end, uh, by September, we were able to reverse all pandemic pay cuts. And in December, we could give back all the money that people lost in the newsroom between April uh, and, uh, and September. And since last April, so since the pandemic began, We hired 11 new reporters, many of whom lost their jobs at Index or at other outlets because of the pandemic. And we launched, again, a proper membership scheme three months ago. And we are on our way to be profitable the second time in our history. I'm touching wood now. I don't want to jinx it. And uh, I don't know where we are for time. Um, there's one more thing. I spent the I spent the better part of this year in Oxford at the Writers Institute uh, For the study of journalism, I did a research on uh, audience revenue models in uh, politi problematic political environments like ours. Basically, I looked at uh, 16 countries in Central and Eastern Europe and the Global South, where democracy was you know, in, uh, in difficult circumstances. And I looked at uh, media outlets that are trying to get revenues from their audience, membership programs, donations, subscriptions and to see how they are doing and to see how these programs can help with the independence. And so I'm just gonna show you a few results from that study. Um, first of all, I asked these outlets around interference and it seems that interference around the newsroom and content is a lot more frequent than interference with the business side of things. And then second of all, most of the interference on the business side focuses on advertising. And there is very little direct interference with the ability to collect audience revenues, even the most repressive environments. That is to say that if you are in a difficult position in a country that uh, the democracy is in a bad shape, turning to your readers is usually still an option, even when advertising is tightly controlled by the government or even where there's a lot of interference with your newsroom. So I think for us, at least, that was a difficult, uh, that was an important finding. The second sort of important thing was around paywalls. In the Western world and North America, 
I think paywalls are a foregone conclusion. The, the outlets who want to make money through audience revenues are putting up paywalls. But in Central and Eastern Europe and the Global South, uh, there were a lot less paywalls. So you can see there was a study in 2019 in the USA and EU that found that 69% of the outlets in that study had, uh, had a paywall up. And in mine study, it was only 36%. So outlets, they want to, do, they want to make money through the audience but they don't want to put up a paywall. And this is mostly because they are worried that putting up a paywall would uh, impact their mission. They wouldn't reach as many people as they want. And then, uh, but that said, financially speaking, paywalls seem to work. So in my study, I found that outlets with paywall made more money through ad audience revenue, or the share of it was larger than for the outlets who didn't have the paywalls up. And the more content you put behind the paywall, the more money you will make. I'm not advocating for, for paywalls. Paywalls can be problematic. It, they do restrict access to content. So it's, it's not an easy choice, but it is, it is an option for, for many outlets. And I think the last point I want to make about this is that in these environments, uh, it's, uh, paywalls are, the, the, the reason why people buy in is not as transactional as in the West. So if you buy a subscription for the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times, you're basically paying for information or many pay, uh, people are paying for information. I think in the Central and Eastern European contracts and some places in the Global South, uh, it's more of an emotional attachment. People buy in because they believe in the mission of free pass. That said, even if supporting independent media is an act of personal political expression, so basically if you feel like your vote doesn't count or if your country doesn't even have proper voting, then Subscribing to a news outlet, an independent or critical news outlet can still be something that you as a citizen can do. But this is important for the initial conversion. But later on, if you want to keep people around, which is called retention, that's where more transactional factors come in because you won't have that emotional trigger. So if you want to keep people paying, you have to offer them uh, services that they use. And this is how you can keep them around. But obviously, we are just learning how to do this. So I think this is what I wanted to say. I hope I didn't go on too long and I'm happy to answer any questions you have about Hungary or the study. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Applause is coming. <laughs> so do we have questions? Yes, we have a question uh, up in the back row. Please wait for a microphone. Thank you for a really interesting uh, lecture on the younger and media landscape. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the public service media this morning and, and this afternoon here at the conference. What's your perspective on the Hungarian state broadcasting services, you know, when it comes to, uh, well, I guess, towing the government line or not? Um, in my mind, they are one of the most problematic actors in the Hungarian media sphere. We don't, there's this designation, public service. I don't, I don't like to use it anymore. It's just state media. The, the public service media has been taken over and there were like consecutive purges within. And by, by today, there's really no one there or almost no one there. I don't know, maybe there's someone hiding in the basement who still believes in the values of, of journalism. But, but the, the direction that they took is just to sort of uncritically repeat any, anything that the government wants them to repeat. Uh, they only portray the, anyone else who's critical of the government in a negative uh, light. And they are the most important conduit of, uh, of foreign state disinformation. So for example, Russian disinformation in Hungary, they use RT, Sputnik, they use the, their coverage of foreign affairs is basically uh, uh, based around what sort of Russian state media wants the world, what, how Russian state media wants to describe the world. So I think the, it's a very, very problematic uh, institution right now. It's subsidized by the state, by taxpayer money. A lot of money goes into it. And um, so I don't, I don't have a very high opinion on, of the work. But that said, uh, I think some of the, the, it's so bad that it enables some other actors in the sort of private media sphere to do good public service work because there's, you know, there's no one in that scene. There is state media. So... 
people want to have public service and some people are willing to pay for uh, public service and you know at least there's a silver lining there maybe a slight one okay yeah, it's not a very good situation to for a journalist my last question to you how you survive do you see any threats one is is financial but is political threats can you survive in this environment um I think it really depends. I think the situation is very different in the in the capital or in bigger cities, although the only really big city we have is, is Budapest, the capital. And it's very different in the countryside. So basically, the government, when they uh, conducted these acquisitions, was very conscious about what the electorate or which part of the electorate was reading and listening to what. So they took over the regional media uh, pretty intentionally because I think their polls show that th that's what their readers were consuming. But uh, sort of outlets in, in the capital, in Budapest, uh, that catered to a national audience were, again, this is not 100% uh, or 0%. They took over some of them, like index. But some of them were left to, to report independently, partially because the people who are reading 444, I think in the government's mind, they don't want to persuade them and it's it's fine because as long as you know they can uh, they can create their own parallel reality for the people who matter to them they don't care that much about uh, the the national media in budapest that said there are certain things that we have to account for there are uh, harassment and digital threats uh, that we have to deal with uh, there was a big uptake in that and we had to implement some protocols to to make sure that our reporters uh, are safe I can't, like, this is a complex system and not everything is state organized. You have far right groups, uh, you have various actors who, are, who try to interfere with public discourse. And some of it is encouraged by the government and some of it, they just don't care about it. What I'm trying to say is that I think the biggest way they interfere is through economic pressure. And then there are certain other things, but those are less significant and maybe not centrally organized. So for example, there is some harassment by authorities against some individual journalists. But I don't think it's government orchestrated in the sense that uh, somebody very high up uh, sort of gives an order to harass this or that journalist. Maybe it's an overeager prosecutor who knows that in this regime that we have a way to get ahead is to try to sue a journalist or try to put a journalist on a, on a, on a stand or in front of a court. But there's a difference, and I think there's a meaningful difference between state-organized systemic interference, which is, again, mainly through economic means, and these other stuff which happen, but I think less significant and not necessarily centrally organized. I don't know if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation, and we wish you good luck and keep going. That's important for keeping a journalist profession alive in Hungary, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And now we have a uh, next presentation is uh, coming from the Touch public broadcaster. Uh, NPO, please. Uh, this is a remote control. Hope it works. And Franz Klein, <laughs> director of the video production at Touch public Thank broadcasting. You. Thank you for having us. And first, I take off the, the yes, European, please. this is the official song festival uh, mask in Holland. <laughs> so you know. Thank you for having us. Uh, because uh, these are disruptive times for PSM. Let's see if it works. Yeah. However, we must let the fear of burning fire be less than the hope we envision for our future. Similar to the battle with the commercial TV stations since the 90s. I'm convinced PSM will only get stronger by the new challenges. But there's work to be done. The digital, trans the digital transition, with, which has been accelerated by COVID, has forced us to adapt and think differently in the way we present our content to the audience. This while realizing that PSM in the digital era 
won't ever be as dominant as we ever were with our traditional broadcasting channels. We have to prepare for a future of video on demand channels and digital media outlets, while finding the right balance in promoting both our linear and VOD channels. We can achieve this by keeping in mind that the combination of high quality content on both linear and VOD channels make for an incredible value, valuable USP. Our current organizational structure in which teams manage both the content mix and specific channels has made that we have a diffused variety of counters to order content for. More than once, we have seen that comparable content coming from the same genre was ordered for more than one channel. Working with these channel islands causes unnecessary duplications or even gaps in the varied content mix we like to offer our audience. For example, the genres drama and documentary receive loads of pitches, which of course can't be all taken into production. It means that loads of works around those pitch titles for several channel managers at the same time actually turn out to be a waste of time. In short, working this inefficiently makes us scatter financial and human capital. We make radio for over a century and recently celebrated 70 years of television. We are specialists when it comes to traditional audio and video content. Meanwhile, the new kit on the block, VOD, is taking its place in a fast pace. Traditionally, our audiences would turn on the TV at 6 o'clock and watch our content routinely, like an evening ritual. The consumption of content has changed from specific moments on a particular channel to consuming media throughout the day on a variety of platforms broadcast by several media outlets. In short, the loyalty of audiences to a specific channel is, is in decline. This teaches us that we should move from a channel-based strategy into a strategy which allows our content to prosper in a dynamic reality with loads of competitors around the corner. Recent research has shown that the half of our audience consume content based on genre rather than platform. Moreover, one third of the respondents state that they choose to watch content suiting their specific interests. We have come to learn that today's audiences which new and younger people are easily adapters, are drawn by genres and specific titles rather than their loyalty to a channel or platform. We notice that audiences with an age below 50 years are likely to choose VOD over our linear channels. However, during the pandemic, we have seen that older generations slowly find their way to our VOD platforms too. The shift from linear to VOD is disruptive and requires fundamental adjustments as a public broadcaster. After 70 years of TV experience, we must reinvent TV as a medium as such, get to know VOD and build a platform that can measure up to that of strong competitors. Above all, we have to master the right balance between these two communicating vessels to ensure that our content is displayed in its full potential. We simply need both. Therefore, a flexible organization is required, which makes us able to respond quickly to the ever-changing behavior of our public, knowing that the relevance, meaning and impact of our content is also determined by the context it is consumed. From, makes, 
for makes us believe that it shouldn't be content first, but rather content is king and context is queen. Thus, the attraction of specific genres and titles is bigger than the loyalty to a specific broadcasting channel or platform. The demographics of our audiences are changing, becoming more var varied and fragmented, and younger target groups consume content in different ways on a broad variety of platforms. Understanding our audiences and building a solid customer relationship is crucial for the continued relevance of PSM. High quality content and appealing platforms are at the base of a strong and highly valued MPO. That is why we treat third party platforms as following. You can have a snack outside, but you still have to come inside the MPO house for dinner. Like this, we are able to offer our content on a user-friendly and safe platforms, respecting the privacy of our audiences. So it is clear that we need to adapt in order to stay relevant within an incredible competitive market. The MPO broadcasts top-tier content and is valued greatly when it comes to trustworthy new sources in-depth researches and human culture. But how do you accomplish change in an organization which is used to work channel-based? A clear vision for the upcoming steps as well as the urgency for change are incredibly important to get everyone on board. We say goodbye to managing channels and instead we will specialize on two expert areas content and the offering of content. A genre-based strategy allows our teams to focus without narrowing ourselves down to put your own channel first. There shouldn't be competition between MPO platforms. That is why specialization, cooperation and communication are the key to success. With shared ambition, vision and clear processes, we create the perfect condition to broadcast high quality content in a society that becomes more and more complex. But how? Firstly, specialization. We want our highly qualified teams to become specialists on a genre or cluster of genres. Genre teams become the central authority for, for production houses, the media sector, the politicians, and above all, or our audiences. Secondly, we're, sitting, we're setting up teams that are specifically specialized in the programming of our content, taking our various platforms and channels into account, which makes for a multimedia approach. Like this, we break the culture of, we break the culture of having teams like islands, but rather create a chain in which professionalism and interdependency are merged. In order to achieve this change of culture within the organization, it is of great importance that we will become a so-called learning organization. And that is thirdly, testing, testing, testing. VOD is changing the way we consume content and forces us to look critically at the traditional broadcasting of our content. With A-B testing, regular evaluations and research analysis, we can track down format specific features. With this know-how, we can tweak our content into being single, double and triple hits. Another focus would be finding the right balance between first drop on demand content and our TV channels being the primary display window for, an, for our additional platforms. An example, before people watch a trailer and decide if a show was worth watching, 
Nowadays, people watch the first episode and decide within the 30 seconds if they will continue watching or not. As much as 80% will continue watching the complete series if they felt enticed by the first 30 seconds. It makes the first 30 seconds crucial. Another example. On our TV channels, we often use the so-called sandwich, meaning less popular content is scheduled in between two titles which have proven themselves to be very popular. Like this, you are able to attract more viewers for less popular content. Nowadays, on a VOD platform, audience pick and choose their own favorite titles. This too has a huge influence on the way we watch. People are browsing through content and switching channels even faster than before, meaning in all our content needs to be of top tier quality in order to keep our audience. In short, one team, one clear vision and one embroiled plan. With clear criteria on responsibility and expectations, we can manage a process that is like a well-oiled machine. In short, that is what we are striving for, a focused strategy and organization bringing high quality content to a broad variety of audiences via different platforms at the same time. The combination of specialists on genres and specialists on programming for us, for our several channels, channels and platforms, make that the MPO has more leverage to fulfill our public duty, namely broadcasting high quality content based on social values which targets a broad and different audiences. In addition, very much aware that our own reorganization won't be enough in the fast pace, the consumption of media and the demographics of our audience are changing. That is why we like to invest in our international relations, like with the VAT, our neighbors, the Belgians, and the RD, the CDF, our, our neighbors, the Germans, for example. As a member of the same European family, we hope to further explore and strengthen our bond with the Baltics by exchanging knowledge and insights. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm waiting for questions uh, in... Uh, here, it's not, in, uh, not here, but I have a question. All these needs and resources to have a top quality and everything well planned. Are you pleased with the funding of your companies right now as they are? Or do you need more money to take a risk? Uh, of course, uh, like every other PSM, we need more money eh, for high quality. And, and, and certainly uh, in the Netherlands, uh, the competition is fierce. Uh, we see uh, all kinds of new uh, streaming uh, uh, parties entering the Dutch, the, the Dutch market. Uh, and that means that our, that our audience uh, is getting used to more and higher quality uh, of global parties. Uh, we are a local, we are a local uh, broadcaster, but we are uh, in this time on, on a global, on a, on a global uh, uh, landscape. Uh, so yes, uh, of course, it's, it, what, what, what I thought about is a dream, a dream of uh, being excellent and being, being uh, well organized. And, uh, but at the same time, you need more money to make excellent content. Mm. That, that's, that is the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's not a question about the money always. It's about the new ideas and also the, the courage to take the risk to test yeah. new, new opportunities. Uh, that also is true. Uh, we are here, I, I hope I don't uh, offend you, we are in a small country, the, Estonia, but the Netherlands thinks they are a small country too. We have, we have 80 million inhabitants, but we are still a, a stamp, a post-stamp. Uh, uh, and one of the main 
main targets is uh, to, to let the, 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 the talent grow. Uh, when even on a, on a market of 18 million inhabitants, uh, the most, the most, uh, the search for new talent uh, is, is the highest, uh, is the highest uh, at, at this moment. Uh, mm -hmm. A question. How would content produced for video on demand platform will be different from content produced for traditional television, if at all? Well, we see that uh, on our linear uh, channels, there is uh, much demand for uh, act uh, actual uh, TV, factual uh, TV, for uh, uh, the things that happened here and now. Mm -hmm. uh, and on our on-demand platforms, we see it's, it's often timeless. Uh, and it's of, uh, often it has to do with the genre drama of, or documentary or human interest. You can see that on any moment, on any time, on any place. Uh, and there is also a kind of difference. Uh, linear television is more social viewing and on-demand is more personal viewing. So, in all this way, we try to tweak the content on the specific audiences. Yeah. Question from the audience. Yes, yeah, there is one hand I can see at least on the uh, back rows. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I wondered if you had uh, seen another public service media organization make this transition and you had a, a model in mind. And also, where, where are you on this journey? Uh, before we made uh, this plan, uh, we traveled all around uh, Europe and there are two or three examples for the, the, the Dutch broadcaster. The first uh, is the SVT, the Swedish company, who uh, uh, had a, a, a very uh, specific uh, strategy uh, around uh, linear channels. They have only one left. Uh, and uh, they say that we have uh, one big linear uh, channel left and uh, the rest we, we will invest in uh, an on-demand uh, platform. Uh, for instance, in, in Holland we have th still three linear channels, so we have a way to go to, to to choose uh, as, as sharp as uh, the Swedish uh, does. But also the BBC is one uh, of our examples. Uh, so uh, we noticed that uh, the BBC iPlayer is uh, in, in, uh, in priority and hierarchy uh, in the BBC environment uh, still growing and still getting important uh, to all the audience, but, but specifically to the younger audience as well. And uh, it was an inspiration to be there and uh, to look how they, how they do that and uh, uh, in which pace they do that. Uh, and uh, ourselves, we will introduce the new system uh, uh, from 22 on, from January 22. Thank you. You know that it was um, implemented by a Dutchman, the iPlayer. The? The, the iPlayer was implemented by a Dutchman. Yes, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I cannot see any hands more. Thank you so much. Thank and you. hopefully the transition will be very successful and we will make a copy of it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and next, uh, uh, next session will be a panel. I'm, I'm sorry we are a little bit behind of our schedule, but I hope these all the presentations are so interesting that uh, I, I'm really, really having a problem to, to cut down if the time runs over, but maybe my colleagues, you can keep the space and not... <laughs> okay, uh, yes, uh, there is a time for a coffee break, but before the coffee break, I would like to invite here, uh, we already have here uh, Rita Rudusa, Kuntas uh, Slogagu, who 
He is a co-organizer of this uh, conference from Politic Center of Media Excellence. Then we have uh, Monica on Zoom. Yes, we have. Hello, Monica. Hello. And we have uh, our own. Yekaterina, yes, please. <laughs> Hello. And it will be hosted by you. Thanks a lot, Andres, for introducing. We can definitely sit down. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I think there were many issues already mentioned. Uh, public trust, uh, how to attract younger audiences. And these are also issues which are very important when uh, working with minority audiences. And I will just uh, maybe once more uh, tell who are our participants at this panel. Today we have Yekaterina Taklaya, who is editor-in-chief of uh, ETV Plus, Russian language uh, TV channel at this Estonian Public Service Broadcasting, yeah. uh, Rita Rudusha, development uh, consultant at Latvian Television, uh, who is supervising introduction of new minorities multimedia platform, and joining us from Vilnius uh, via Zoom is Monika Yurshevichute Muraviova, who is a Russian service uh, editor. And to start with, I would like to each of you introduce a bit uh, about what you are doing and uh, how do you actually work with audiences because uh, although everybody thinks that the Baltic countries are very similar, I think uh, the approaches public service broadcasters have uh, chosen are very different. Maybe we could start with Yekaterina, because uh, like during few months uh, lately when I talk about Estonian uh, uh, televisions and uh, either these are government representatives or like your CEO, they are all saying, oh, we are so proud about ETV Plus, who is now number one. Please tell a bit more. Okay, do you understand correctly that we are not showing uh, show reels? Uh, or we do? Uh, it's just because we're limited in time a little bit, or do maybe, I have three minutes maybe well, to show? Andres is not here, so I think I you can, <laughs> you so, can qu quickly show the video. <laughs> uh, this is a question to technicians. Can you show Yekaterina's uh, show read? Yes, I no. had a couple of uh, slides and a very short show reel. I understand we're here for a panel discussion rather than uh, for a presentation, but I thought it would be good to give some background and context. Yes, yeah. uh, we, we can see. Thank you, sir. It's a song. It's always fresh and interesting news. Discussions on important topics. Journalistic investigations. Интервью с ключевыми персонами и экспертами. И, конечно же, игры и телешоу. Спортивные трансляции. Сериалы. Шедевры мирового кинематографа. Любимая классика и новое русское кино. А также потрясающие документальные фильмы. Спасибо, что вы с нами. Это В плюс. Каждый день свой плюс. Uh, the channel was established in 2015, and I've been with the channel for a little bit less than three years. And uh, we are a full length, full format channel. Uh, we produce about uh, three hours of original content every day, uh, an hour and a half morning program every morning with um, interviews on uh, current issues, reports, um, uh, morning news, and then of course we show the news in the evening for half an hour and then a 50-minute program which is again original. It's a different format every day, but it's more or less every day some current affairs, whether it is a, a talk show, maybe a political debate, um, uh, an investigative uh, program, um, a classical interview, 
or maybe a more entertaining, entertaining format, but um, uh, this is always the original production. And um, the rest is acquisition content, because television is not only information, but also uh, entertainment. And many people consume media and television, especially for entertainment. So the rest is acquisition, and um, we show a lot of um, fiction, films, drama series, uh, very good documentaries, historical uh, nature. And uh, we try to make uh, our program as, uh, as rich and uh, uh, different as possible, because I believe that uh, uh, the audience will find the channel. It has already found the channel when it is a one, one channel in one language, and when we offer uh, all the possible formats, information, infotainment, entertainment to the audience, when they don't need to switch off the channel, but they can get everything from, from one channel. And of course, it's very important that it is uh, uh, in the Russian language, because it is meant for the Russian-speaking community. And in Estonia, this community is quite big. It's about 30% of the population who speak Russian. Most of them are Russians, but there are also Ukrainians, uh, Belarusians, etc., etc. Uh, and for a small country, this, uh, this number, this percentage is quite big. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about us, maybe about our ratings, uh, because uh, it always takes time for a channel to, to develop and to find the audience, or for the audience to find the channel. Uh, so it took us um, about four years, I would say. We're doing um, very well now, in, in the sense that our reach of audience, monthly reach, uh, weekly reach, is... Uh, is number one if we are talking about um, other Russian language channels which are available in Estonia, and they are big Russia channels like RTR and TV Mir, PBK. Um, we are in the same boat with them uh, if, when we are talking about daily reach. Uh, we are also the most trusted uh, media channel among the Russian-speaking population in Estonia. Uh, a research agency, uh, Cantor Emmer, has a, had a, did a research in spring of 2020 in the first uh, wave of the pandemic, and they asked um, different sorts of questions, and two of them was about, were about media consumption. And one of them was, which media channel do you trust most? And uh, uh, the Russian audience said that it was uh, ETV Plus channel. So uh, out of radio stations, online platforms, television channels, they trusted us the most. Uh, so I think we, are, uh, we have um, arrived at the very good results. Maybe we're not, where we're not the first yet is the share of viewing time. That is how long people watch us, and we would definitely, this is one of our challenges to increase uh, this share of viewing time. We want people to watch us longer, but for that we need to produce more original content, more maybe entertainment content, and of course in this sense it's, um, it's difficult to compete with big Russia channels, which produce very um, expensive, uh, very good uh, entertainment uh, shows. Uh, uh, they produce um, good, again, expensive drama series, and of course people want to see that as well. But, but we are on the way there. If we had more budget, then I think we would have also uh, an evening program that we would run every day, and uh, we, we could produce uh, other formats that people would be watching. Uh, thanks a lot for this introduction. I think there will be some follow-up questions. And I also want to remind the audience that you can use Slido and write questions to us already because this is panel discussion and everybody is uh, kindly welcome to join in. But now I would like to turn to Monica from Vilnius. You have a bit different situation with minorities and also a bit different uh, solutions for... for your uh, programs. Could you tell a bit more? Hello. Uh, can you see my presentation? I want to show you more information about this. Yeah. Uh, yes, I can. Okay. So, 
Uh, more than 10% of the Lithuania's population are minorities. The two largest groups are Russians and Polish uh, people. So the LRT radio newsroom speaks to minorities about their issues. We create content every day uh, in Russian and Polish. And uh, less frequently, we um, create content in Belarusian and uh, Ukrainian. So we have a minorities department uh, with the Polish and uh, Russian journalists. Uh, the duration of uh, all programs for minorities in 2020 was uh, 231 hours. And uh, when we talk about current content for minorities, I can see that we have a uh, daily news show in Russian on LRT radio, which uh, reach about uh, 30,000 listeners every day. And then we have, uh, uh, we have a cycle of shows, which is called Santara in Russian, Belarusian, Ukrainian, the show about Lithuanian Jews. And those shows are full of uh, cultural and historical content. And of course, um, Polish news on LRT Klasika. Uh, the next one is a podcast called Polski Meet. In 2020, um, uh, LRT Polish service strengthened uh, the field of relevance by adapting it to Poles living in Lithuania. Um, greater attention is being paid to both national politics and local news and uh, feeling the expectations of uh, audience colleagues created Polski Meet podcast in 2021. It focuses on dispelling myths um, exposing propaganda and fighting uh, fake news. And another our platform uh, for minorities is a Russian version of LRTLT website. Uh, here people can find the latest world uh, and Lithuania news, um, our radio Russian service interviews, um, politics and uh, top stories. So also we have Russian version of LRT Facebook. Uh, it is called LRT Novosti. Uh, we will share our created on all platforms content uh, in Russian language. Uh, next uh, product of ours is the multilingual discussions. This is kind of experimental genre, uh, which we discovered during first quarantine. So it, is, uh, it was an uh, on-air discussion broadcast uh, in three languages by the two hosts at the same time, Lithuanian, Polish, and Russian. And uh, people sent their questions by email or asked uh, them over the phone. Uh, and uh, the show demonstrated us uh, how many unanswered questions uh, in, their in their languages they have. Um, during uh, the one hour show, listeners asked questions such as how do vaccines react with other medicines or um, is it possible to get ill instantly and can you infect another people after vaccination? To answer them, we had uh, two medical experts in studio and the show uh, COVID vaccination meets and facts was broadcasted on two radio channels, uh, LRT Radio and LRT Classic, and of course on the LRTLT website. Uh, I think that it was an uh, interesting experience. We saw that for the Lithuanian audience, it was not very relevant since they get their answers during regular programs or uh, from articles published uh, online. If Lithuanians were watching or listening uh, to multilingual discussions, uh, it was just because of the interesting format. Uh, but it uh, was for minorities more. Um, so following this experience, we um, uh, <laughs> gave, uh, following this experiment, I mean, uh, we uh, that gained a lot of attention from minorities. We decided to. Um, to do one more uh, discussion. And at the end of August, um, LRT Radio uh, held another multilingual discussion about migration and the situation near our border with Belarus. Um, 
uh, listeners were interested to know why Lithuania must uh, let migrants in and provide them with essential help. Uh, they also asked uh, how much it costs and were interested in uh, who uh, pays for this help as well as why most migrants are young men. Uh, so questions like these um, show that we must pay more attention to minorities uh, to make sure they are informed and provided with the most relevant information to help them to see issues from multiple perspectives. Um, as a result of uh, success of this project, we have a plan to hold at least four multilingual discussions on the most relevant topics um, next year. So uh, this was our main uh, content, which is provided for minorities. Uh, thanks a lot, Monica. Very interesting to hear about those multilingual discussions. Uh, and now we go to Rita. Uh, please tell about the latest uh, minorities project in Baltics. Thank you, Gunther. And two footnotes before I start. The first one is not really a footnote, but just a welcoming note. Uh, uh, thank you for, for inviting me, and thank you to the organizers for a, a very interesting uh, event. And I really commend, <laughs> commend you on all the challenges that you have dealing with this uh, uh, hybrid format, and you do it very elegantly. You, you get over all the glitches. And the second footnote is especially for Andres. I will will not be showing my presentation to save time. So all the 16, 16 uh, slides that I had uh, prepared with, uh, with graphs, uh, let's skip them. Um, and I will only show you one video, and I very much hope that the technicians uh, can put it on screen. With the sound. <laughs> Привет, это Говорим Латвийский. Меня зовут Интерс Бусулис и слово дня Тури Буру. Тури Буру. Дословно это выражение означает «держи парус». Если вы моряк, то можете услышать его на палубе от капитана. А в повседневной жизни это выражение схоже с русским «не вешать нос». Тури Буру. Это призыв не унывать и не опускать рук. Чего и вам желаем. Тури Буру вецит. Лабакес. Говорим латвийски. Thank you for that. Uh, just a, a quick note for those who don't uh, speak Russian. Um, it, it's a language teaching uh, video. Uh, the name of that format is Говорим латвийски, which is speaking Latvian, but the first word is in Russian and the second word is in Latvian. And that is uh, produced especially for uh, social media, and the presenter is a very popular singer in Latvia. And why did I choose that video as an intro into, into the very short story about the multimedia platform for minorities that LTV launched this year, is that because it illustrates very well uh, the essence of how LTV approaches the minority uh, the content in collaboration with our colleagues from uh, Latvian radio is that uh, that content is the place uh, where communities meet, where they interact, and this is our common home. In, uh, Ekaterina mentioned that, of course, the big competitors, the, the mammoths that are produced in uh, Russia, uh, have very high production value shows, and it is very hard to compete with that, particularly as in case of Latvia, we don't have a minority language channel, we only have a few shows at the platform that I'm, I'm going to talk about. Uh, but the power of local relevance is something that we do have. Uh, and that is something that no uh, Russian channel, however lavishly produced, will ever have. And so we don't have big budgets, but we do have this power of local relevance. We talk about the issues uh, that are relevant to this community, 
our community, our neighbors, and we talk in the language they understand, and we also build bridges between different communities within uh, Latvia. Um, to talk about the multimedia platform that was launched in September, you can't do it without uh, giving a bit of a historical perspective where we come from. Uh, because in 2014, um, after the events in uh, Ukraine, there was a very, very, very brief window of political will to invest in minority uh, content in Latvia. And there was even a, a project to collaborate with Estonian colleagues and maybe even have a joint channel or certainly build something together where there is a, a very close collaboration between the two countries. Our window closed very quickly. Uh, I was the commissioning editor uh, at LTV at that point and wrote a concept for the channel, but it uh, did not get the green light from the government, unlike ETV+, Plus, and, and I'm really happy to hear about your audience uh, figures all these years later. So that uh, window of political will uh, closed and uh, LTV and uh, Latvian radio were waiting uh, for a long time for the next window to open. In 2016, uh, LTV wrote the first version of concept for multimedia platform in the Russian uh, language for minority audiences, pre predominantly Russian speaking in Latvia. Uh, of a similar percentage as in uh, Estonia. We also have about 30% uh, of uh, minority language speakers. Uh, so in 2016, it was the first version, then there was the second version, and it just kept being postponed and moving from one uh, annual plan to the next annual plan. There was never that window of political will to invest in it. So there's a concept, uh, LTV is ready to produce in collaboration with Latvian radio, have this new platform, but there is no political will. Uh, the new window appeared uh, in 2020, but it, it didn't have really a, a full kind of budget coverage. So on the one hand, the regulator told us uh, please uh, go ahead and uh, implement the concept of that multimedia platform. On the other hand, we will not give you any money to do it. Uh, so we needed to go and do fundraising. We were lucky uh, to, to partner with the Baltic Independent Media Project, the British funded and also American funded Baltic uh, Center for Media Excellence was an excellent partner in, uh, in making it happen. So when we found the money, we could go ahead and build a new studio that is now available for minority language production. 24 uh, hours and uh, seven days a week. But of course, when you build uh, something like that, uh, you, you have to have a very detailed, very heavy, hard coming internal uh, restructuring because all your content production changes. Uh, and you also have to look very closely into what audience wants, how to work in, in a digital channel, because what we had before we launched the platform were uh, several uh, news and current affairs programs that were on LTV7 channel, on linear channel, but those programs were sandwiched between the Latvian content, therefore had no prospect to, to grow and attract uh, large audiences. And there was a Rus LSM website as a news website and Latvian radio produced audio content. So the best of all of that had to be combined into the multimedia platform. But for that, of course, uh, after finding money, uh, we needed to learn how to operate and how to work 
for digital, primarily digital audiences. The, uh, just a few more words about the audience focus. Um, what, what was in my presentation that I decided not to show, uh, where the audience figures about the uh, digital content uh, consumption, and uh, we see that in the younger audience, economically active audience, between the years of 25 to 55, uh, the consumption of internet and consumption of news on the internet is almost universal. So we decided to target that audience, uh, not the television audience that is 55 uh, plus uh, that prefers linear channel, but to target this particular segment. And that uh, particular audience segment doesn't just consume news on websites, actually consumes news on, on Facebook, on Telegram, on TikTok, on Instagram. That means that that content has to be present in, on all of these platforms and has to be able to speak in the language that is uh, specific for that particular uh, platform. So what you saw, uh, this, uh, this project, for example, it is, of course, featured also on the RusLSM platform, but it is primarily for YouTube and uh, for Facebook. It doesn't work on Instagram, because on Instagram you need to, you need to speak different language, so to speak. Uh, so the, the platform, after undergoing internal reforms, finding money, learning how to produce content uh, for digital consumption, which also means that you have to learn how to film differently, you have to have different formats, and so on. After all that, uh, in just uh, a year after uh, the concept was adopted and approved by the regulator. A year later, uh, the platform was launched in mid-September. It is uh, too early probably to speak about the numbers because even for digital content, you need to have some time for the audience to come, uh, to find it. Uh, it also meant rebranding, so people who used to consume uh, separately RusLSM or Ruskevishanie on on the uh, linear channel now have to get used to it being all in one. So it takes time, but at the same time, what we see is a very positive uh, trend, particularly on social media. If we look at uh, Russell SM performance, uh, so say uh, in January, February last year, before COVID, uh, the number of followers on Facebook for the Russian language content uh, and for their platform uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, profile was 20,000. Today, I just checked before uh, coming here on stage, was, is 193,000. So that's quite a growth. And also, Russell Sam as a platform uh, is growing and is, uh, is showing record figures in terms of unique uh, page views, uh, which has reached in October a million and uh, 600,000, which is an all-time high. So the initial results are uh, very good. There are questions, and maybe you will ask those questions, what happens with the linear yes, audience? Actually, actually yes. maybe we could stop uh, with your presentation, which is even, uh, even very detailed without slides. And actually, because we have already the first question from Andres, uh, who is actually asking this. Okay, you are talking about uh, young audiences and uh, multimedia, but how are you going to attract audiences without internet and those who are watching only television? Yeah, well, this was a question primarily for, uh, for the regulator, not so much for uh, Latvian uh, television, because there needed to be that political will to, uh, to invest into also linear content. Uh, so currently, uh, the way it is being dealt with is that the main evening newscast that is also on the platform and on all social media is also broadcast on LTV7, but it is not uh, viable long term. So the conversation continues on what will, what will we do not to lose that audience that is 55 plus. 
Um, and I'm not at liberty to say that there are some final decisions made, but, uh, but there is certainly an understanding and appreciation that if there will be no even that one newscast on linear channel, that we will lose uh, quite a lot of older audience. And it is the older audience that uh, now the research shows, for example, in the context of COVID, uh, has lower understanding of the dangers of the pandemic, so needs to be reached by local quality content. So conversation is ongoing at the moment. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, fingers crossed for it. Uh, but now I'd, I'd like to go back to Yekaterina. You mentioned the uh, rising trust uh, to your channel, and I remember quite clearly when it was established, and it was not only about ETV+, but also about Russian language broadcasting in Baltics. At that time, after Crimea, also Russian propaganda was using uh, those examples, saying that, oh, this is not uh, going to be trusted because it's, you know, it's going to be Estonian or Latvian or Lithuanian government counter-propaganda and some kind of government's mouthpiece. Uh, how do you think, like, and we are uh, talking so much about trust, how, uh, how can you win the trust, actually? <laughs> and what are those steps to do? Maybe some other media can also learn from you. I think uh, you have answered this question yourself. We are not doing anti-propaganda. When, uh, when uh, we are doing our own um, uh, programming and we cover current affairs, we open discussion on, on the issues uh, about what is happening within Estonia, outside Estonia. We, of course, cover um, major international uh, crises uh, and other events. And uh, we're just uh, being balanced, we're being uh, true, <laughs> at least we're trying to. Our journalists are uh, professional to that extent that, uh, that the audience trusts them. I think that the, the, the would be the honest uh, and simple answer. Thank you. And a short follow-up question from the audience. Uh, are Estonian politicians now pleased with the audience numbers? <laughs> actually work uh, to please Estonian politicians. Uh, could you please repeat the question? Uh, what uh, are Estonian our... politicians pleased with the audience numbers? Um, I think they should be pleased. And I think in, in the recent years, there is no more talk, almost no more talk about the, uh, the need to have ETV Plus, like it was in the first years when it was created. And um, even then, uh, yeah, the, the, the major issue or problem that uh, politicians would see is uh, low ratings against the investment, the money spent. Although our annual budget is uh, 2 million uh, euros, uh, which in terms of television production is not big money, plus another 700,000 for acquisition content. So uh, we're not really uh, doing uh, expensive television. We're trying our best to provide the quality, journalistic quality, and of course, uh, the picture quality, but it's not um, some, some huge money that we're using. But lately, I think uh, uh, when, when we do publish uh, these research and we were trying to speak and be proactive in media, uh, talking about our results, I, I would say, uh, we haven't heard for a long time any, any very loud protest about ETV+. Plus. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. And now I'd like to turn to Monica. Uh, you mentioned when you were talking about those multilingual discussions that you found out that uh, Polish and Russian language audiences are more interested in some issues like vaccination, migration. Uh, do you think it means that uh, they are not, ne not getting enough of this information uh, as, for example, titular audience, or, or what would be the reason? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's uh, why we used to organize our trilingual discussions, because we saw that uh, the minorities feel lack of information. They were lost, and... Uh, mm, 
because of different channels provided information. So from the one side, you hear one opinion about uh, vaccines and other side, people are talking uh, the opposite. So um, the media forms the opinion and I think that, uh, yeah, they feel lack of information. And uh, why do you think is this? Uh, do they don't have enough local resources or they are just not trusting them? I think both. We have uh, both problems, uh, trusting problem and different resources. Uh, Lithuania, small country, and uh, a lot of people watch Russian TV and trust Russian TV. And uh, we are uh, like uh, the opposite of their propaganda uh, with our programs and shows. So yeah, both problems. Any comments from you on this? On the information about COVID, I think that's, that, is, that is really a big issue, certainly in Latvia. Um, and uh, the disparity um, between uh, the titular, the Latvian-speaking audience and the Russian-speaking audience uh, about the information about COVID, information about the vaccination, uh, and everything to do with the pandemic, uh, you can measure and see the differences between the level of information, which is, of course, dangerous. Uh, maybe provocative question, but can actually media help? Uh, because uh, we see those vaccination rates are lower for, uh, for Russian uh, minorities, for example, in uh, Latvia and Estonia. I don't know how it's in Lithuania. And uh, media are doing their job, uh, like at least those who are working, but still, uh, is it the problem that they are not reaching out those audiences or those audiences are just not listening to those media? Well, both, but, uh, and of course, there's a lot of also anger in society, which sometimes lashes out against the journalists, just like in Lithuania, as Monica was telling uh, in the morning. Uh, Latvian television news crew was also attacked uh, by angry anti-vaxxers. Uh, it's I think it's an issue of finding the finding the language how to talk. Of course, we we uh, we have to keep doing our job, but we have to be looking maybe for other ways and other ways of storytelling uh, to reach those audiences. And what could be those ways? Uh, my personal opinion is that we need to be talking about uh, human stories, uh, bringing human to the fore rather than the statistics. I think uh, the, the even we can see from the comments, for example, on the, on the Facebook page of uh, Rus LSM that the people are angry and they say, no more COVID, you know, we're sick of all your graphs and, and uh, pies and charts, human stories uh, of, about real families, real people, uh, and the effect of pandemic on them, I think, could help. Do you have some special approach, Ekaterina? Uh, I, yes, I would like to say that uh, maybe at the beginning of the pandemic there was really a difference because yeah. uh, I think that uh, Estonians uh, realized very quickly that what we're facing is a very dangerous thing. Uh, the Russians maybe uh, not so quickly because the, the Russia uh, big language channels which they also follow uh, didn't start speaking about this uh, before maybe a month or two uh, later. Uh, but I think now the situation is not as bad, and uh, uh, I was reading news or listening to our uh, news, television news uh, on Sunday, and I understand that the, uh, in average, in different counties in Estonia, 70% of people have received their first vaccines, and in the Idaviruma region, which is uh, mostly Russian-speaking uh, 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 populated, uh, the percentage the percentage is fifty seven percent so there is a difference, but it 's not uh, twofold or threefold it 's not that huge and I also think that the difference is probably in the cultural 
is the cultural difference. If you tell Estonians that it is, uh, it is recommended to vaccinate, it is highly recommended to, to vaccinate, uh, but we are a democratic society, you don't have to do it, <laughs> then Estonians go and vaccinate. <laughs> And if you say it's highly recommended not uh, to go and visit your friends and families, then they stay home. If you tell this to the Russians, it is highly recommended, but it's not prohibited, then people, I think it's just the, uh, you know, the, cultural, uh, the cultural differences. Then people think, okay, it's not prohibited, I can still do it. And uh, yeah, I think this, is, this, is, this probably explains this uh, small difference that we're seeing in uh, vaccination percentage now. And of course, there are um, skeptics on both sides, but I would say, I don't know, probably the percentage in the Estonian society and uh, the Russian-speaking uh, community is, is relevant. Maybe I can just add one sentence about the differences in Latvia. Uh, in Latvia, there, there are larger differences in terms of the vaccination rate, and also in Daugopils, which is uh, predominantly Russian-speaking, the death rate of COVID patients is the highest. Uh, so uh, there is more kind of work to do uh, still to, to, make it, uh, to make that gap smaller. Thank you. Monica, would you like to add something? No, I think that we have uh, the same experience, like colleagues said. Okay, thank you. And then we have a question from the audience, which is addressed to Monica and Rita, so maybe you can then uh, go on. Monica, how have Russian communities reacted against the cases of blocking Russian propaganda TV channels in uh, Latvia and Lithuania? Any frustrations or changes in media consumption? Oh, it's hard to answer this question. Maybe colleagues will uh, be able to share their experience. Um, I think there's no difference for today. Well, I don't have any empirical data uh, at hand, but uh, I think the abundance of the Russian language channels that are from Russia is so high that even if you suspend one channel, there is plenty to choose from. So uh, the audience data now that I can vaguely remember when we were analyzing it uh, sh shows the migration just to other channels that offer similar content. So um, it, there, is, there is enough to, to serve the needs uh, or rather the wishes of, of the audience that wants to consume Russian language channels from Russia. Uh, okay. Uh, we've been listening to many examples today. How do different uh, media and companies are trying to attract uh, audiences, especially young audiences, when it comes to different digital platforms or so on? And of course, when we speak about Russian uh, language young audiences in Baltics, I would say it's even a bigger competition because they are fluent in Russian, uh, English, uh, local, like Estonian and Latvian. Lithuanian. Are you thinking about uh, the ways <laughs> to work with those younger audiences? The short answer is not at the moment. <laughs> that is really a, that is a big challenge, but on the other hand, the multilingualism of the young uh, people offers uh, opportunities and they, and they do consume content in many different ways and also in at least two but mo but often three languages so uh, you can't apply one fit, one size doesn't fit all so currently there are no plans targeting minority uh, uh, language and uh, it's a challenge and uh, and una also was talking about it that the current content is mostly consumed by older people or uh, economically active people over 25. And with us, uh, we have um, an online platform, uh, etvplus.err.ee, where we have all our content, also um, acquisition content available for some time. 
and um, we are targeting uh, maybe not the children or teenagers, but we are targeting uh, a little bit older audience, those people who um, actually begin watching TV, because I think it's just uh, uh, maybe a result of uh, natural uh, growth or development that people at some certain age, when they uh, become more uh, stable when they become having families, partnerships, when they start spending more evenings at home and they watch more television, uh, which is at the age maybe 30 plus. Uh, so if we cater for this audience, 30 to 50, this uh, audience will be growing a little bit older with us and watch our channel and then uh, those people who are, pri who are now teenagers will be you know, moving into that segment and also continuing with the channel uh, later on. Because we have tried with the children and uh, uh, we did show and produce uh, children's content, but it was, um, uh, the, the ratings were really very low and I understand that uh, there are, first of all, quite a few uh, uh, channels in Russian, cartoon channels, children program channels available in Estonia and young people are used to consume media on demand. They want to, to watch all the uh, series uh, now, not tomorrow, not next week. They want to watch it on their mobile phone, on some other device, uh, at wherever they are, whenever they are, and uh, it's uh, very difficult to compete with that. And smaller children, of course, who don't have these devices, for those there are television channels, cartoon channels in Russian, you switch them on at any time and please you have this content available. And uh, we did have this experiment, but, uh, uh, but uh, I think we're almost finished with this, but we still uh, cater for a little bit older audiences. And actually last year we produced um, a drama series, Still Waters, uh, which was um, uh, targeted for um, younger audiences and also uh, their parents and that was very successful both uh, not only among um, our Russian speaking audience but also among Estonians and uh, also had very good ratings on our online platform. So uh, when, when they want to find us, uh, they do find us. And talking about uh, maybe a couple of words about um, our social media, uh, uh, we are probably uh, very different from everybody else, but we don't give our content to social media, to other platforms, because our strategy is to develop our own online platforms. Uh, every channel has its online platform. We have um, uh, Jupiter, our small Estonian Netflix, where we uh, show on-demand uh, acquisition content. And of course, we work uh, with the audience uh, on Facebook and on Instagram, but uh, what we do is we advertise our content and make those people go and watch us online or on our own platform. For example, if we have a talk show and you have an interactive uh, um, voting by telephone, then on Facebook we say that you can, you can vote on Facebook, you can vote by making a call into the uh, linear show, but if you want to form your opinion, you need to, to watch the show on television, not on Facebook. And this is, uh, um, the reason is not only developing our own platforms, but also uh, because we have uh, no control, actually, over Facebook uh, and other platforms. You never know when they change their algorithms, when, when some content may disappear, and it's not strategically very secure. Thanks a lot. Uh, Monica, would you like to add something? I think that uh, our audience is being aging and we are trying to reach younger people, audience, in digital platforms, but um, we are at the beginning of uh, the path. Currently, we don't have uh, TikTok, Instagram or other uh, platforms uh, where we can find uh, um, younger people but i think we need uh, maybe more time to reach this audience we will try it if i may add just yes. one, one uh, quick uh, remark i think this is not just an issue of minority audiences this is an issue of the generation 
is that uh, certainly in Latvia, public media are not really talking to the segment of the 12 to 15, a little bit 16 plus, but really how do you talk to, to today's teenagers who actually use not Latvian or Russian, they speak English to each other. Uh, so how do you talk to them? Uh, how do you reach them with public uh, public value content? That is a big, I think, challenge for, for public media. It's a big challenge. Also, I think it's a big challenge to the audience as they are all thinking about the coffee. So, <laughs> But we are also approaching our time limit. Uh, and I'm just asking, uh, do you have some questions? Please, this is the last minute uh, opportunity for you. Yes, uh, in the last row. I can ask the question in uh, Estonian, also maybe not a specific question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so maybe a little bit different point of view, because so if there's been a question, what is the role of the media? Is it to reflect success or is to uh, provide guidance uh, to the uh, how life should go? Okay. Oh. So what is the question then? So I don't really have a specific question. It seems to me that uh, maybe it's my experience. In August, um, I went to this uh, Baltic Way, uh, which is a re sort of reenactment, so that we could be all united. And uh, that evening, when I watched the news, I don't think it was a dignified coverage. It wasn't really proportionate. So it wasn't like, a, I thought that human rights were not valued. So it kind of um, hurts. So I don't think it increases understanding. So the, there is a, a, as a, a keeping some information. Actually, it would be good to ask a question because it's a panel, because it's it's kind of hard to answer. when something is selected and something is unselected and filtering. But as I said, this is a quite a philosophical question about the role of a media and it's not the right... It's a it's totally philosophical question and we could, we could uh, like continue talking for, for many hours, but it's really a coffee time already. But I totally understand what you mean and all the media, as a former journalist, I, I could say all the media are striving to be balanced and objective. But of course, there are sometimes some questions, some questions about this, but everybody I think who is in this room and is media professional will tell you that they are all striving to be unbiased, professional and objective. Thanks a lot for all the participants, especially Monica who joined from Vilnius today. Thank you, Yekaterina and Rita. And now it's really coffee time. Uh, for how long, Andres? As short as possible. <laughs> and because there is no coffee available, coffee, Ayola, uh, but we have these small drinks by vita my vitamins. Okay, but okay. But uh, please come back really in 10 minutes because now we are uh, behind of schedule about 45 minutes. Thank you. Uh, you are, thank you. Oh, oh sorry. I, again.
Aitäh kõigile väike paus ergutuseks kulus meile kõigile ära. Thank you all. I'm sure this break was very refreshing, but now we are going back to the UK once and uh, we have Professor Rainer Kottel, who is the next person to speak. So we've had a change in our agenda because uh, a very important member of the panel has to leave and we are uh, now three quarters of an hour behind the shuttle. So that means we uh, first will have uh, Zoom with Rainer Kattel, uh, then we'll have a discussion round and uh, Media Studies 2 presentations will come at the end after the, after the discussion. But now I'm very happy to share the screen with Professor Rainer Kattel. I apologize for the delay, but, uh, delay, but now we are live. Thank you very much. Um, I will try to save on some time as well, and uh, I'll try to um, be as quick as possible. First of all, I'm very happy to participate in this conference, so thank you very much for inviting me. I have not been linked much to media studies, so uh, therefore I'm not going to talk about media much. But I'll talk about more of the sort of uh, trends in the economy and the society uh, where media has quite a bit of a role already today and will have that role in the future. So, um, uh, so my uh, short presentation should have an alternative title, which could be also a bit more provocative. But uh, this uh, covers this entire topic, whether this um, uh, capitalism can survive from itself. And should we say, say capitalism from itself? So, um, uh, capitalism has been very self-destructive, and uh, all of us have had, uh, will see that there's a great impact, especially for people who are working in media, who are studying media. So, there are a couple of things I'd like to mention. There's not going to be a surprise. So, we we'll look at the climate justice and the uh, expected outcomes and the problems we uh, need to face over the next years and decades. And at the other hand, the same is true for digital economy and the value creation and also value extraction from this economy. So, uh, and this is not how this uh, would help. So if we start with the climate justice, uh, then uh, the COP26 is, uh, is um, just, just ended. So it, it's interesting to see what's happening in the field of climate. And I think that one of the uh, uh, one of the most complicated questions in the global uh, arena, and on the slide you can see that if you look at the consumption, then uh, capitalism and the free market economy is consumer-based. Then we can see that 10% of the wealthier people in the world produce uh, almost 50% of the consumption-based uh, environmental emissions. So starting from clothes, uh, food, shopping centers, and uh, people who are participating in the conference, we are all a part of this 10% on the global level. So this consumption, uh, or the uh, biggest, uh, uh, we are very much linked to the biggest polluters because our habits, how we eat, uh, how we uh, go on holidays, the clothes we wear. Uh, so this is uh, very much linked to our uh, global positioning and environmental pollution. If, uh, if you think about the economic development and uh, states and consumers and citizens are aiming for is copying the same consumption patterns, so uh, uh, our economies uh, are uh, built to the same way so that they would 90% wants to consume the same way as the 10% do now. So that means that the environmental uh, impact will be uh, the same. So we see who will suffer the most. We can see that uh, today, if we look at this, um, uh, this COP26 promises, um, the article uh, of this week, uh, it's this two degree uh, increase of uh, temperature because they said actually it could be 2.6, uh, 4 degrees. So bigger environmental impact than we would uh, really believe uh, 
um, that it would be, or in Paris as it was promised, uh, that it would be 1.5. So you can see that this um, one of the examples is that uh, one billion will be suffering under extreme heat. So that means that there is uh, days or weeks or months people when I cannot be outside due to the heat. And these uh, areas of the uh, world are so large and important. Here is one calculation. And climate science is becoming more and more specific and detailed. So that means that it's uh, possible to uh, predict it better. So there's a great deal of consensus. And we uh, we have seen that predictions have come true already. So you can see the a very great deal of um, injustice uh, on a global level. And we have uh, 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 not so many people who produce the problem, but a lot of people will suffer because of it. And the if you look at the context of Estonia or the Baltic countries or Europe, then we will not maybe see so many climate disasters or complicated weather patterns, but rather there's an issue is the migration. Uh, so that means that people cannot be even outside, uh, never mind uh, being uh, engaged in cultural activities. So there's going to be a higher migratory pressure due to the climate, which has an impact on uh, uh, security and our uh, neighbors uh, nearby can uh, make use of it under certain conditions which will lead to conflicts because resources are limited and they'll become even more limited so this uh, is just uh, flaming uh, flaming this conflicts and this uh, entire uh, region we are talking about, then we can see a lot of uh, uh, population growth compared to the region we are now in Europe. Um, we can see that the population growth is very slow. And due to that, the migra migratory pressure is uh, higher and higher. And so we can see that all these different factors are meeting. So there is an important pressure uh, to uh, leave uh, the uh, areas. And if you look at uh, Germany, the Germany, German industry uh, says that, that they would have to accept about half a million immigrants in order to uh, make sure that the social system will survive. So there is a need for migration as well. Uh, so here is another uh, idea. If you look at the global revenue increase, uh, then on the B, you can see that this is the European Union member states, the so wealthy countries. Uh, so this is the bottom of the uh, middle class, the lower the middle class. Uh, so if the migration pressure would bring in more people, who would uh, start competing for this uh, lower middle class jobs, then uh, the salaries actually have not gone up for 30 years either. So we are there are even more poverty stricken groups. And then there's you can see the uh, the wealthiest uh, whose revenue has gone up. So um, we have a greater uh, migratory pressure because of the climate change, and it's constantly growing, which means that there's conflicts. Uh, conflicts. Uh, we have security risks. And in these societies where this uh, migration would uh, aim, there is opposition to it as well, or due to economic reasons. So you can see this, if you look at the Poland, if you look at Poland and Belarus, you can see what where this conflict is coming from. And uh, this uh, situation is not going to change very quickly, and uh, I'm sure that this is going to be with us uh, for the entire duration of our lifetimes if we talk about the climate issue. And I think media plays a very big role here how to cover this topic. So if you look at the uh, Belarus today and what's happening there, so we are thinking about the point of view of migrants which have been covered in media. But it's a complicated topic, and if you look at the society at large, then uh, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. So what can we do? If you look at the existing um, economic policy, this is based on competition, constant growth, and it's been working for the last 200 years. 
So that means we need, need to see some drastic change because otherwise um, uh, the societies will break down due to climate change because people are uh, escaping or there's some other impacts beyond conflict. So we uh, have to behave better if we look at the economic policy. So that means that we have to have a, a bigger uh, common denominators. So here is an example how um, uh, if you talk about sustainable energy production, it's not only really one area you need to uh, invest in, but it's a whole lost a lot of investments, including also behavioral changes. Uh, for example, how to consume electricity at home and so forth. So it's not a classical it's just indu industrial policy that we choose an area where we invest more but rather we have to invest uh, into uh, many other areas uh, because otherwise uh, the societies will break down and it's a path of self-destruction. And another thing, if we look at the uh, lack of balance, uh, so if they say that countries are saying they will reach this uh, desired outcome by 2050 or 2060, then this is a bit of a mirage because we need to um, think more about uh, 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 biodiversity. A colleague has looked at the financing of the central banks. Uh, so, um, because uh, uh, if you, uh, since the financial crisis, the financing have gone into the uh, financial markets to support them and activate them. And here we have different acronyms. So we show the first 70%, which is the European Central Bank. Uh, financing uh, program uh, uh, actually supports uh, the uh, loss of biodiversity. So um, the money which is invested in economy today actually uh, expands this problem as we started from. Uh, today we are on track on the 2.4 degree uh, temperature increase that is catastrophic for most countries in the world. If we look at the largest um, funds in the world in Norway, a trillion dollars even there, a large share of that is not invested in handling climate change, change quite the opposite. It supports this field. And here we're also going to face major changes. The force of that change is the better. On the other hand, we need to see today how we should behave personally. Which kind of clothes do we buy? Do we throw them out? Or what? Also, the food we consume, the diet. Uh, reduce the consumption of money because um, of meat because meat is the um, highest contributor to climate change. Uh, meat uh, production, also behavior pattern needs uh, need to change, and maybe we can see a chance here uh, for new companies, for new business models to come up. But the change in behavioral patterns is something that we can't overestimate and we can't speed it up. It's a long-term process. And the window of opportunity that we are talking about is mostly linked to cities. Cities as the centers where the cli uh, climate change is focused, where the change behavior should happen. This is a um, Drawing here a pattern of Paris. Paris is a 15 minute city. All activities you need for your life are available for you in 15 minutes, where you can handle it all without a car. To intensify um, city space or urban space, let's, uh, let's talk about Stockholm and others. It's not about one city improving it, but all cities must have an option of handling your everyday business easily. We can't have cars taking back, uh, um, taking over the city. We need to take the city back from cars. We speak about economy, we speak about climate change and technology. To a large extent, that means replanning, rescheduling our own processes for cities to be a lot greener with a lot le a few, um, much fewer cars and therefore 
much more receptive to all the issues related to migration. It should therefore generate new jobs and cultural diversity. So the stress here is on people. Many cities have started work on it, and they see that as an important um, indicator. This is Stockholm for prototypes. They try to take back urban space from cars, either uh, introducing trees, having more parks, pedestrian lines. This is what we're going to see in the future. But to sum up the first block, namely the block on climate and challenges from there, then as regards the understanding, what are we trying to offer as a society? On the left, there is a model of Stockholm. As a department of transport, that looks at the city only from the viewpoint of cars. We want to make traffic faster, reduce jams. If we look at it from the lens of healthcare or culture, we see totally different values that we are able to provide. So all the governance processes needs, need to be reviewed. How do we run a city? It can't be run in silos where we see cars separately, making them move faster. And on the right is the well-known Barcelona model where they try to take the city back from cars. Um, making fewer cars able to drive in the city. So the whole capitalist idea focused on fast growth maybe needs to be brought back. As we take the second topic that I wanted to talk about, and that is digital value creation. If we review very quickly, where are we in the digital economy? We see there is major growth over the past 40 years. And we see that not only in Western companies, growing ever faster, ever bigger, but the growth of Chinese companies. As we go to the next slide, we can see that Europe is lagging behind significantly. This is a polarized world. Digital companies are usually, if they are created in the US, they are located in um, China. Europe is just a desert here. In comparison with bigger countries, and that has whetted the appetite of European politicians for a more active economic policy, with whether we look at Germany or France, which are very interested in intervening in industrial policy to avoid Chinese companies buying up German companies. And on the other hand, creating huge IT companies in Europe, whether we talk about infrastructure investment or others. One of the recovery um, project uh, programs of the EU is about digital economy. On the other hand, as we look at what are the companies that are located in Europe, digital platforms, they establish their offices in Europe not to pay taxes. So they take advantage on tax evasions, as we will know, Many of these companies don't pay any taxes to countries at all. And therefore, both Europe as well as Biden's administration are um, trying to regulate these big companies as well as China does. It's a big, very important field for the next few years. Many countries are able to keep up with these companies, regulate them. But as we look at the artificial intelligence, the whole field of that, these are the companies that are the biggest investors, not countries. Basic science research, the highest number comes from Google, a company called Alphabet. So states 
are encountering serious problems and serious lag. Um, you can't probably read it all, but let's just uh, just read what has been underlined. The Silicon Valley type capitalism, uh, the breeding ground for the digital economy, is usually built on digital uh, on financial leverage. They are trying to focus not that much on uh, profit, and they probably won't gain any profit anytime soon, but they do increase their market uh, coverage, which in turn destroys the innovation ecosystem. These companies may access money, but they destroy competitors, and especially they are destroying infrastructure companies like taxi companies. This is where we are today. We are facing a very problematic issue. How do we recover? The labor law, legal systems, with the very same companies, people that are doing courier service or performing deliveries, how do we guarantee them getting at least minimum pay? The model that Silicon Valley, um, the model uh, that Silicon Valley has um, created the hockey stick growth. In Estonia, we are proud that to have the highest number of unicorns per capita. I'm not sure how long can we keep on going being proud of it because the business model is destroying the environment of innovation, not supporting it. How does it happen? For Google and Amazon, it's exactly the same. Platform, Google itself, gets a lot more benefit from the Google ads than companies actually advertising Google systems. Google itself, providing the platform, earns a lot more than companies do in Amazon. The choice is so extensive that if you want to get your goods to your clients, companies pay Amazon to be on the first page in research. Once again, Amazon is capable of taking major profits out of it. And it's very hard to justify that with any kind of a capitalist business model. That is an abuse of a capitalist business model. And what has gained interest over the past few weeks, the role of media, is research into Facebook algorithms. The more polarizing are the news, the more people use Facebook, so it's arranged. This is built on the platform, and the more people are engaged, the more ads you can uh, show them, and the growth of marketing revenue is uh, what's behind all that. What was most interesting was the elections in um, the US where Facebook was willing to change or stop that algorithm uh, for three or four years. The algorithm that was behind the news. So they preferred news from mainstream media. And that led to significant decline in Facebook usage. It led people to mainstream news, but the number of uh, users went down. If you don't have polarization, then um, this shows that the model of immense or very sudden growth, what are the tentacles of that? And if we think about the question that we are facing today, do we want to continue with Silicon Valley capitalism model? Today we are very proud of that in Estonia, that we have different companies that are wonderful in uh, taking advantage of these models. They have been able to grow very fast, become big. Or are we willing to destroy the model and build something instead? What's going to come instead of it? On one hand, yes, 
It needs to be linked with uh, data that big companies of the world are generating. Private companies generate the highest amount of data. How do we regulate that data? Coming back to, can we save capitalism from itself? I don't think there is much choice in being against bringing this data to the public domain. Otherwise, capitalism will suffocate under its own woes. There are some wonderful books how in real places Innovation in Real Places is a wonderful uh, book that, on that. Many cities, regions try to imitate Silicon Valley and it shows how harmful it is for them without gaining much. And just as with climate, we come to cities. Barcelona is a very interesting example where the city has become very radical in uh, uh, stepping up to digital platforms, Airbnb and others. Yes, there is climate and use of energy, as well as the living standards of cities. Can people afford to live in the center of the city? Here again. The key here is to open the data for people living in the city. And the capitalism that is uh, 200 years old, giving meaning to competition, climate, as well as data, are the most important steps in economy. How do we take data, cooperation, how do we handle that as a collective property, not as private property, which is self-destructive for capitalism as well? And finally, Marco Steinler, a um, quote from a man from Finland who has tried to show with its brief quote, quote that we might understand problems in a society very well, but reaching a solution is a lengthy road. It might take 20 years to ban smoking in public space. That's a long process, and I'm not sure we have time for it. What we are seeing in migration and in climate and media, polarization, vaccination and all that, it's obvious that today we don't have the time. And here, media shows how important its role is. As an institute of uh, truth, it should play a very important role. That's it from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. It's a very difficult moment here. Your um, prediction uh, on the end of the world is um, very compelling. The whole Armageddon uh, show was um, compelling, but the, what you, the advice you worded for media, on one hand, it's very clear and reasonable, but on the other hand, is media trapped in capitalism? Is it unable to live without the clicks and advertising money? And on the other hand, Washington Post is not read that much as Facebook story ran. What do we do? That's a wonderful question. I'm not a media expert and I can't really comment on it. But I believe that it's important to see the models, how media operate. Media is a prisoner to clicks. And we need to find solutions. On one hand, it's polarizing. On the other hand, people could leak. Think what are the forms of media 
that are not financed on advertising money. Does it mean that the role of the public sector should be bigger? And I think it's a wonderful question. Where I am, BBC today is having a very heated debate. How, uh, BBC is financed by taxes and everyone consuming BBC should pay for it. And I think the debate is very pointed because BBC is a very visible organization and many politicians know and business people absolutely hate it. And that is the question, what is the role of public media or government-run media? That is a fundamental question, yes. Right now, thank you very much, Reiner. We are going to look for answers here, so the next discussion panel is already introduced. Thank you very much. Thank you to uh, all the best to you in London, and we'll keep an eye on BBC. And we'll continue the debate panel. The panel discussion and media study will finish the day. Let's have here Rita Rudusha here from Latvia. Next, uh, Marilis Rutsalo, CEO from the Express Group, if I was right in your uh, title. And then Erik Rose, CEO of Estonian Public Broadcasting Company. We have Mindaugas Kauskas from TV3 Latvia over Zoom. So it's more or less a balanced public service broadcasting and commercial and private broadcasting. The language welcome all. And Rainer Kattel formulated a very difficult question. It's, uh, as you, the private companies, representing private companies, are, how to put it politely, politically correctly, tools of capitalism, if I be poetic. Is it the fault yours that we are running on the final, final meters of end of the world? Sorry, that, that was a rhetoric question. Now I will go <laughs> give over to Rita to take it seriously now. Thank Please. You. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, the, the previous speaker, of course, uh, painted quite an apocalyptic uh, picture. And also the title of this uh, discussion sort of invites antagonism. But I would like us to try uh, and find a common ground because there's been a lot of antagonism and, and drama when it comes to relationship between the commercial sector and the uh, public media in all three our countries. There have been statements, uh, petitions, uh, quite charged meetings and, uh, and uh, heated rhetoric uh, around the relationship uh, between the two. But I would like us to st start from the starting point that on the one hand, there is actually empirical evidence that pu public service media are good for democracy, uh, and particularly in smaller, uh, smaller media markets. But so is media pluralism. And uh, commercial media represent that, uh, that media pluralism. Um, in the uh, conversations between commercial and public media, the word that is very frequently mentioned is balance. And I would like to start from that and maybe ask uh, Marie Lise, what do you understand by balance? If, if you were tasked to find that balance uh, and, and go, go for it, what does it entail for you? Balance in what? Balance in the, the media market uh, mm -hmm. between the public media and commercial media. Um, I would say that all the market participants uh, should be treated equally. Uh, this is the... Uh, this is the definition how it uh, uh, drives uh, the situation, the balanced one. So currently, uh, the markets in the free Baltic states are not uh, working like this uh, as the market participants, uh, to my mind, are not treated equally. Treated equally by whom? Uh, treated equally by the government. Uh, because... Uh, um, at this moment, like media houses mainly, have um, three big revenue streams. 
as we don't have television in our group, uh, but from our perspective, uh, that is like disappearing in time, disappearing um, paper media income. Advertising plus subscribers. Then there's other, other one, which uh, also the previous uh, speaker mentioned, was the advertising revenues, online advertising revenues. And the third one, the new one, uh, and it's not very new for our group because we have been uh, working with the digital subscriptions already for 10 years in Estonia and two years in Latvia and Lithuania. So um, if we're taking the, um, the mentioned two, uh, the last two ones, uh, the second one was uh, about the advertising market. So who are our biggest competitors? It's not like the only one competitors are our competitors in, this, uh, in these countries. I mean, Experts Group is not only competing with Postimus Group, but also the platforms. And we see that the platforms are not responsible for the content what they are providing, we are responsible for the content and we have to deal with the mess what they leave behind and from the other angle they are not paying taxes in here we are paying all the taxes and about the digital subscriptions is that uh, we are now uh, like i said we have been doing that already for 10 years and we are having significant revenue streams from there and now there are also market players who are providing uh, almost the same content free. So we see that as unequal treatment in the market. Uh, I see what comes out as the issue of uh, the presence and the growing presence and the stronger presence of public media online. Yes. And we will return to that because this has certainly emerged in, in recent years as, as one of the biggest maybe uh, points of contention, but uh, Mindaugas, uh, what's the balance for you? What do you have to add to Marilisi's uh, remarks? Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting, first of all. Uh, I think next to what Marilis has already mentioned, uh, which is a very commercial part of the equality as we see, I think, I think that historically we have had a problem of, uh, that came from the equality. You know, currently we're speaking public media, commercial media, and we're treating them as two separate. But at the same time, if we get one step back, actually, if we try to speak about the democracy, about what the role media is playing, actually, there is no really big difference. You know, this is the same media, uh, only we have a, an issue with the uh, financing streams. One is basically, it has to uh, find their ways to, to finance their businesses, and we call them commercial, and the others are, are funded fully or, or almost fully uh, by the public. So I think that uh, by balance, I mean that the first thing that we have to get around the, the same table, as I'm happy that we are doing uh, tonight, and to fully understand that we are the players of the, the, of the same table, and if we are looking for the competition or, or for the enemies, actually they are not in our local markets. They are somewhere out there, which Marilis has also mentioned already. Thank you, uh, Eric. Uh, we are all uh, knights around the, around the table of the same kind. Do you agree? Well, yes, for me, I think this is uh, the way uh, how, how it was uh, told uh, uh, right now. It's. Uh, I think it's too narrow in this sense that it's a very mercantile way. Uh, and also the, the uh, definition of balance is uh, definitely much wider and, and should be uh, taken into um, account uh, in, in, in different aspects. And, and the main aspect still is, uh, I think what also Rita you, you asked, is that is it balance also for, for the need of democracy, of society, uh, uh, of information, of, 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 of protecting freedom, etc., etc. There is uh, nothing to say about uh, either one or another uh, commercial media group is, is uh, profitable or not. Despite, of course, it is important, otherwise, otherwise it's, uh, it's, uh, it's harmful anyway. But still, this is a technical issue from my point of view. Uh, commenting uh, this aspect that, uh, that uh, all market, not only actually players, but, but uh, let's say, the participants should be treated equally. Uh, this is a very theoretical issue because uh, 
uh, at some point of view also as a manager or, 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 or chairman of a public broadcaster who is financed, uh, financed totally differently, uh, we also uh, might say that, that it's, it's not equal treatment because we cannot sell advertising or commercials. Uh, and, there, there, and it's not the case, for example, in, in many other European countries. So my point is that, yes, if you take out one or another aspect, then you can say that somebody is uh, in some preferences. But uh, in, at least in Estonian cases, and I think, I think also these neighborhood countries, uh, in this media landscape, uh, this everything goes back to kind of uh, uh, treat or, or, or commitment in society that uh, all participants will have some restrictions or some demands or some, some obligations. Uh, but, uh, but the overall balance must be that, uh, that the press freedom and quality of press uh, is, is prohibited and, and, and uh, preserved. Uh, but when we talk about public interest content production. Let's narrow it to that because, of course, commercial media also perform that function. Uh, you also produce content that is of public interest. And one of the issues on that table that we are sitting around is the funding for that sort of content production. Uh, I would go to Mindaugas because that has been in Latvia certainly uh, one of the top issues uh, uh, discussed. How would you like to see uh, support uh, for public interest content production, which is not kind of commercially uh, of, uh, of high value maybe, uh, but is uh, for society of high value, how would you like uh, to see the models of support for public value content that is produced by, com by, co by commercial media, I mean? Mm -hmm. um, uh, good that you have mentioned, Rita. I think that uh, here in Latvia, currently, this is an ongoing topic, and we have had uh, some experience in the recent years how it's being done. So I don't, know, I don't know if the other participants really fully understand what and how it's being done, but currently uh, commercial media is also being able to produce a particular amount of the society important content and to get a full or partial funding for that in Latvia. Uh, and that, here, and that, think... sorry, sorry to interrupt, but this is uh, taxpayer funding, receiving taxpayer funding for commercial media for content production. Yes. Uh, that is uh, that is taxpayer money or, or state money, basically, which consists of the same of the taxes that we all pay. So, uh, with regards to that, uh, I think how it has been currently done. So, we have had two organizations in Latvia. One is the regulator of uh, the media market of the TV broadcasters and the radios called Nepal P, and the other is the media uh, support fund uh, administrator, if if I may call it so, SIP who were actually organizing those particular tenders uh, with a particular topics uh, that uh, they see uh, social interest in. And by that, uh, those particular tenders uh, were launched and commercial media market could be participating uh, to get the financing. Um, I don't know how it is currently done in Estonia or in, in Lithuania, but I think that uh, from the content funding point of view, that is the first, and I would say a good step uh, towards that, because this is the way how commercial media can participate in a production of such content and actually uh, to, to, to tell the full story. I think the current support fund is working both for the existing content support and both for the new. Because what is important to know that current media players already produce a lot of high quality content that is of a high value for the society, beginning with the infotainment programs, with investigative journalism, which is also something that needs to be retained or the, that the quality needs to be uh, leveled up. So from that particular point, answering Rita, your question, uh, how it should be done, I think the base is already there. So, uh, so the model is there. There are organizations who are distributing that particular funding through the transparent funds. Maybe the minus is that still we need to develop probably here uh, that we have not one organization responsible for that with a very clear KPIs and that should be set. Uh, so, uh, and uh, 
probably uh, the other part is uh, that it is still a little bit too much. Uh, the, okay, the support uh, giving body is still trying to get involved into the editorial a little bit too much, and that is something that I think needs development. Uh, thank you. And before I, I turn to Marie Lees to talk about the Estonian uh, experience, just uh, one quick remark. Uh, the funding that Mindaugas is talking about also applies to regional media. And I think this is something that is very frequently forgotten in all discussions about commercial versus public, that they are small local newspapers uh, that would not be able to perform uh, their function without such support mechanisms. But Mary Elise, uh, do you think that would be a step or is a step in the right direction, uh, a clear, transparent uh, funding mechanism for public interest uh, content production? Would that uh, uh, take us closer to the balance? Mm. At first, um, it is very good that you mentioned the, the local newspapers and uh, I salute to Latvians who uh, took the decision to forbid uh, the political, uh, like um, those newspapers in, in, in smaller places and uh, in Estonia it's still uh, the state is uh, spending or the local mun municipalities are spending 11 million per year to produce uh, this kind of content and also to compete with, uh, with the local uh, uh, little newspapers. We don't own any of these assets, so I don't have any interest in here, but I see that as a very big problem. And I think that everybody knows that uh, the, the elephant also uh, in this room and in Tallinn, the biggest one is the Tallinn TV. Uh, and also all these uh, Tallinn's um, uh, political uh, money which is spent on, on media. And, um, but um, what Mindaugas just described, um, maybe I'm, um, I'm too a commercial person, but I personally don't like these uh, funds which are distrib uh, distributing money to the private media uh, to produce some kind of content, or, or it should be like super transparent, only then it works. Otherwise, it will start that who washes whose hand and uh, uh, who will get more and who is more entitled into what. So I'm, I'm maybe too capitalistic, but I see that in Estonia we are getting not like any money uh, for support to uh, produce any content. So you are skeptical and in general about this? In general, of, um, I would like to, like I said, I would like to have an equal ground for every player in the, in the market, uh, which means that uh, I don't like the subsidy funds. I know that also like many uh, Nordic countries which consider themselves like being uh, super small countries like Norway uh, and Denmark. So they are approximately 50 to 80 million uh, giving support to private media as well. Uh, I would more prefer uh, like uh, equal taxation or this kind of support to the media than it's not like giving money. Uh, and our group in Estonia is producing all the investigative journalism and everything uh, through our own funds. So uh, we, have to, uh, we have to sell either that content, either sell advertising to produce a quality content. And I think that we can be very proud of our quality content uh, in investigative journalism. I'm pretty uh, confident that it's the best in Estonia. Uh, when you talk about the quality content, uh, Eric, do you think that uh, say you and Mary Lise mean the same thing? Or do we have we play by the same rules and we have the same criteria of what it actually means the, the quality content? Mm -hmm. What well, are I, the measurements well, of quality? Well, I think there is there is no any KPIs uh, over the over the uh, ocean in Estonia. There is a code of ethics and and then some other documents which uh, I think all big media houses uh, obey and then it works quite well I think all this uh, control mechanism. Uh, I'm, in this point I absolutely agree uh, in many aspects with Marilise that, uh, that uh, we can see and uh, of course in most of countries uh, at least in the uh, free world uh, the situation is not uh, gone so far as we saw today uh, in, in Hungary. Well, this is already kind of <laughs> all good capitalistic uh, possibilities as um, has used by government and, and uh, they are biggest capitalist owner kind of. But 
in, in this case, uh, however, in any country, every country, uh, politicians and government tends to have uh, expectations after giving some funding. And uh, this is already, by definition, uh, problematic. Uh, another issue, what also was mentioned, that uh, if we uh, watch a regional uh, view, then I think this is uh, uh, realistic or reasonable, as it's at some extent, and, and if uh, to, to, to make some steps or to, uh, to use uh, best practices, uh, what have done somewhere, uh, like mentioned, uh, in Norway, this is done uh, in, in some way also in Luxembourg, uh, Netherlands, if I'm correct. So it's, it can be done, but it's not very widespread. So uh, to be clear and, uh, and independent, uh, this, is, this is the better uh, that, that still this public broadcaster has this obligation with all this uh, burden uh, with, which, which comes uh, with that. And, and in other, other uh, big uh, players are kind of supported equally also compares the, the uh, over ocean players. So equal burden for all who receive public funding? No, I mean, I mean rather this tax taxation issue, what, what yeah. we have uh, compares uh, social networks from, from the United States or, or, or some other places. Mm -hmm. So this is these rather the, uh, the funding or this, uh, I would like to have this even, it's very simplified uh, point, but uh, even if we uh, might have some uh, extra taxation to the uh, conglomerates uh, internationally, then why not this uh, uh, startingly uh, very, not very big uh, sums or amounts of money, but why not they are uh, sent uh, without any um, commitments to the private media of, of local private media. Mm -hmm. it's, it's totally okay for me. Mm -hmm. Because we have uh, super limited time, I'll jump uh, to the next topic straight away, or rather not the next, but the one that was already mentioned by Marie-Lise. It is about the uh, online presence of uh, public media. Uh, this seems to be a very, very hot potato um, in, the, in the conversations about balance, and there are there have been historically various ways of limiting uh, online presence uh, of uh, public media. In Denmark, public media can't produce long reads. In, there are some, uh, some restrictions in Germany, some restrictions uh, in France. Has there been uh, any similar attempts, Eric, in, uh, in Estonia to limit uh, somehow the uh, online presence or to, to use the uh, website, for example, public media as just the repository of the content that has already been produced? Um, not exactly. I mean, um, uh, the regula uh, regulations uh, under what uh, public broadcaster in Estonia uh, is, is working actually uh, goes back to uh, 2007. And uh, despite uh, different uh, attempts, uh, this uh, law basically is not changed. Uh, maybe some technical details which are not uh, relevant here. So, uh, and uh, I have arise also personally this issue uh, during the last uh, four years uh, amongst top politicians uh, also uh, with one among other points that this uh, new media issue should be um, a little bit more clarified or kind of, uh, kind of explained. Uh, in many different reasons, uh, none of, uh, none of uh, parties or, or politicians uh, had any, any eagerness to, to do it. But uh, saying that, I think this is, uh, I think the, the trend what has taken most in German-speaking countries in Europe where, where public broadcasters are different type of limits in new media. I think it's a dead end way and it's not good. Uh, I'm not going even even kind of monetary detail, but uh, but basically uh, we all see we should react w the outcome o outside world. Uh, today's rea uh, realism is that uh, households uh, under 30, 35, at least in Estonia, but I expect uh, the same trend uh, around the, the Europe. Uh, they don't have any TV sets or, or radio sets at home. So, but they are taxpayers. So why would they say we could say that these taxpayers? Uh, should not have any uh, the part, fair share of of, uh, of public uh, media service. 
because they, uh, let's say, if we restrict, like it is, it's done in, in Austria or Germany or Switzerland, then uh, they uh, must use only commercial media because they consume this uh, new media uh, as, a as a technical tool. So this so is this, this way you would not be performing fully your public exactly uh, exactly. So this, this main corner, the other all, all other aspect already comes after that basically. Marilis, so what about the balance online? Uh, what are what are your thoughts on that? Uh, my thoughts are very simple in here. Uh, mm -hmm. If I see that there is no market barrier, there shouldn't be uh, illegal state aid to these uh, functions. And um, I really believe, uh, once again, as already said, uh, in in capitalistic way of, of doing business. And if there is, uh, I think that uh, in all Baltic countries, there is uh, quite a big competition uh, between the uh, news portals. And I don't see any uh, need in here to uh, do that also from the uh, like public, uh, with the public money, uh, because the product is there, the competition is there, and I, I don't see any violations there or, or, or un, undone things in there. So, so this, is, this is my simple view. <laughs> Mint August, your remarks on the same topic. Uh, with regards to that, I think that we are on the easiest terms right now here on this question in Latvia. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, uh, my, my view on that probably is very simple as well. From one side, we have to f fully uh, act accordingly to the legislation and what is in, le in the legal acts. Uh, so that is no, no matter which, which country we're speaking all about. But another matter that actually Eric was speaking about, uh, about the possibility of the uh, public uh, broadcast to create that content to reach people who actually doesn't have the TV sets or the radio sets. We have started raising this topic in Latvia, actually in, in a little broader consent. So if uh, commercial and public media can actually become a, a cooperative parties, and commercial media could help the publicly uh, uh, created content of the public broadcasters uh, enlarge uh, reach by that. I mean the distribution, the ways how to do it, what particular content and what quantities, etc. That's another topic. But I think that uh, commercial media can play a huge role uh, of making sure that uh, public broadcasters created content also reaches audiences in the digital world as well. Uh, would you please go a bit more into detail, how would it look? How would the commercial media help reach audiences? Just, a, just an example. Uh, probably not going to the, to the detailed level uh, of, of how do we see. Let me give you an, an example, example, probably yes. how public media is currently are using the international uh, platforms, so to say. Uh, which is probably another topic. You know, we are mm. speaking about how we should be limiting uh, and how we should be competing with them, but at the same time, we are putting our best local content on the platforms. But this is another topic. So looking from that particular point of view, commercial media has huge reach. Take Estonia, take Latvia, take Lithuania. You know, this is a highly competitive market and they have their ways of reaching the audiences and also on a digital platforms that they have of their own. So uh, there are, we really see ways how some particular uh, types of the content created by the public broadcaster could be put there and widen the distribution instead of trying to uh, compete for the higher rating for the platform, for the online website or for the TV channel. So basically, as uh, collaborators who are, who are trying to reach uh, wider audience and you see mutual interest uh, in there of, of both parties in that. Yes. Okay. Would you agree, Marie, Lise, to, to uh, such an idea? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would like to reach my hand to Eric and say, give me your content, I will distribute that. So uh, <laughs> I would like to say what he uh, would have to say to that. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, I would... Uh, in technical, uh, technical uh, to, to in small market, in small uh, audience uh, number, uh, there has been said that in Estonia at least any any segment where it's more than three players, this is already a lousy lousy business. So in order to make money, you must be monopoly basically in the small market. So uh, going, uh, going from or starting from that, uh, if we find uh, uh, possibilities of technical cooperation, for example, just a bit 
other, other, other uh, segment, but still, uh, for example, uh, despite uh, um, newspaper companies were very uh, heavy competitors, uh, they uh, united the home delivery because it's technically it's reasonable. The same type of things uh, is doable and, and very, very good to do. Uh, if going to content as itself, then I would like to, or just as a kind of ex ex uh, experience of Estonia, I think one of reasons of our even, even success in democracy, in success of, of, of uh, 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 journalist freedom, where we are in a top 10 uh, normally in every, every year, one reason is, or main reason is, uh, that uh, we always have been at least three, maybe four, uh, big media houses which have independent uh, ability to really to compete to, to producing best quality independent uh, investigative media. When we start to cooperate here, then in, in the final day or in the end of day, we will have, I don't know, one big central committee of, of uh, editorials who will send this news. So I would be a bit careful in this uh, as, uh, as we have seen that uh, 30 years ago. So you see some technical collaboration, but not in terms of content. Yes. I don't know if people present have noticed, but we already found, have found two points of uh, where we agree. So one is uh, support for uh, local media um, uh, and finding for local newspapers that, that they, they need, to, need to have support from taxpayers. And also that there is a possibility of uh, collaboration on kind of technical side. So, so this round table is already working well. Uh, and my last kind of topic, because we really need, need to go uh, and move on to the uh, next uh, speakers, is about the current situation uh, with the pandemic. Uh, how has that, if at all, changed the conversation about the balance between the public uh, and the commercial media? Eric. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I think, um, the, the major trust of media, the need uh, of media uh, by audience has uh, increased. And uh, there is, I don't see any difference actually here, uh, uh, compares uh, commercial media or private media and, and, and public broadcasters or public, public media. So in this sense, uh, uh, I would say that uh, how, how tough it is to, to say this way, but this type of crisis and even, even catastrophes uh, shows that uh, we can beat even social media. We can beat Mark Zuckerberg if, we, if it's really, uh, if a problem is, 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 is hard. Then uh, audience turns to uh, re reliable commercial media, which has been in the market uh, 20, 30 years, at least in Estonia or, or Latvia, Lithuania, and also public broadcasters. So trust and uh, willingness to consume our um, content is increased quite heavily within the last two years. Also, uh, morally, is very modest, but as I, as I informed, as, as Express Group is also a stock company, I understand that the last two years uh, has been uh, economically also very profitable and good, and also the, the acceptance to pay uh, for, for uh, a monthly uh, revenues for, for subscription. Uh, for, I, th I would say even, coming also from commercial media and, and uh, having seen this beginning of this, how, how tough it was and how, how small a willingness was to pay for, for, um, uh, for new media, then I would say that this jump last uh, two or three years was very heavy and one reason was that they need, audience needed this uh, information. Trust for the information. Well, the reason why I asked and, and brought uh, COVID into the room which is on everybody's mind anyway, but uh, was because in Lithuania, in the conversation between public media and, uh, um, and commercial media, this has been an issue uh, and the commercial media, uh, the ref in the rhetoric of commercial media, they said, well, you didn't have to fight for survival uh, and you, you, know, you, you were cushioned and kind of comfortable at the time when commercial media really had a very, very hard time. So that, that was the reason why I brought that into conversation. But Marilise, uh, how is it from your perspective? Uh, has, it, has it affected the... Um, 
the relationship. The relationship yeah. I don't think so. That because uh, um, I wouldn't like to uh, bring this like this battleground on the, on the like the journalistic level. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no battle in in between there. I think that our journalists are communicating on a daily basis with each other. So uh, if they need something, of course they are competing. Uh, but if they need something, so we are acquiring content from uh, pub public broadcaster. But of course it should be free for the private medias not to uh, charge for that. But this is another issue in here. Uh, and uh, uh, also, like Eric said, that um, uh, this time of the pandemics, like uh, before and after, has been there raising trust for media, also for private media, also for um, uh, for the consumption of media. So, as we saw, the the like in US they called it Trump pump. So mm -hmm. we had our COVID pump. Uh, and uh, it was like um, in, in viewership and also like the digital subscriptions, we have been like growing heavily. I mean, uh, it was uh, the last quarter showed us the annual growth was 75% uh, per uh, year on year. So which means that, as I already said, we are earning significant money from there. And uh, it shows that people are more ready and ready to pay for the content also in online. For quality content. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, COVID factor, Mendaugas? I don't think that, that I could contribute anything new available to that. I think in Latvia, nothing really has changed much prior COVID and after COVID when we're speaking about the relations. Uh, COVID itself, of course, it has in, involved uh, all of us and influenced. So the, the uh, advertisement businesses were hit more, but the subscription businesses has started booming. So in a sense, uh, I feel very, uh, very much alike to the colleagues uh, who had just commented on this. Thank you. It's a very optimistic note and a very friendly conversation. So the answer to, to the question in the title of this discussion, I think, friends, is more like it. Uh, but now my question is to Andres, whether we have a, a time for a couple of questions or should we move it's, uh, it's a question to Marilis because uh, we promised her to, to start with uh, this panel at four o'clock and now a little bit later. <laughs> and how much time you have? Yes, yes, we can Couple take questions. A couple of questions. Yeah. Yes, okay, yes. Then it's, please, please ask your questions. Uh, the, uh, Andres has his magic uh, book in front of him. So you can ask your questions digitally, or you can uh, raise your hand, or maybe Andres has a question. Uh, there is already a question here. In, uh, should we have any further measures in media-related legislation to prevent repetition Hungarian scenario? This was meant to Hungarian people, it mm -hmm. presented, but this is very relevant to you. Um, yes. Um, um, that is why I said that I don't like this uh, private media doesn't like to uh, get money from somewhere because like also Eric mentioned there is always uh, when you receive money you receive the expectations mm -hmm. and uh, uh, for the equal treatment in the, in the market and to be strong in democracy I think that the more there are uh, media houses and media outlets in the market, the better it is for the market. And also uh, to initiate uh, the newcomers uh, to come to this segment, to invest in this segment, as we have seen in Estonia. I think the Estonians know that we have like these new portals like uh, Gay News, like Edasi, like uh, um, Levila. So, uh, and I asked from our Latvians, do you have any new portals coming up who produce like quality content? And they said, no. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think that uh, the state uh, should encourage in that sense uh, with, the, with the taxation uh, and also equal treatment to be uh, um, as uh, this um, like a fruitful place for the competitors to be. And I don't agree with Eric that uh, there is only, you need to be in monopoly in the small market to make money. I think that uh, it is also possible for several media houses in the market to make money. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it was, it was a simplification just to describe this big money, because big money, uh, only a few banks or a few uh, electric companies does. But 
I would say that uh, this is very good uh, question of Andres or, or whoever uh, gave it. That uh, and you can do it personally. Actually, uh, you should ask uh, our Hungarian uh, friend and colleague uh, presentation and send it to one hundred and one post boxes, which uh, sits in Tompea, because <laughs> it was quite terrifying uh, and short presentation, and I absolutely. Without any, any doubt or, or joke, I say that our politicians should read it. Mm -hmm. Actually, I agree. Yeah. Mendaugas, uh, about the uh, Hungarian question. I think uh, referring probably from the Latvian point of view, as, as in Latvia, we have the situation where the commercial media could apply for the content support. I see this only one thing. Clear, clear, transparent, you know, crystal clear transparency. This is probably the only way uh, how to control such processes. Even I would like to, um, to, to support what Mari Lee said with regards to that, that in commercial media, we rather not have any support mechanisms, rather let us compete uh, in the best uh, commercial ways. But we have to admit that there are a lot of regional media, a lot of small outlets that without that, we would have even fewer media than we have today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question, if I may. Uh, if the online will be prohibited for public service broadcasting, I mean the news feed and on the smartphones, and we know that majority of people below 50 use smartphones and don't watch television, and if this discussion panels and all this kind of what happens in the media platforms will be behind paywalls. Does this secure equality of media? And it mm. will be balanced media landscape if a couple of people will be left out because everything is behind paywalls. Uh, how many free things there are in the world? In that sense that uh, people are paying for their food, for their... Uh, yeah. That's a, my question. Should it be yeah. so that people must pay for information? Yes, I think so. This is uh, our like news feed for the rapid news, uh, and also for the news which are covered by the others. Uh, we are not charging, yeah. Uh, so we are yes, charging yes. Uh, for but the but journalistic content, and I I don't see anything wrong in there. But does it? make limitation to this discussion which are available for the public because uh, public service broadcasting which offers a news free and this a free discussion forum and people definitely will be I'm not sure how many subscribers are in, uh, in private media I believe it's somewhere around 200,000 approximately it's less there right no, now okay we but have meaning like that meaning that 1 million in people in Estonia are using free media Meaning but not services. free. Taxpayers have paid. Yes, education is also at the same level. <laughs> it's, should we turn educational system or medical system to, into the ways that everyone will pay? I just maybe maybe just comment commenting this uh, in theory also. It's it's doable and it's uh, definitely also negotiable or not negotiable but 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 uh, thinkable and and uh, must must be at least evaluate uh, the possibility. But uh, the like a threat or, or, or very big question mark here will remain if, uh, again, coming from uh, long uh, and serving long time in private, in private media, if uh, I would have been the, would be the uh, chief editor in this uh, uh, private media and deciding, okay, this news, these three uh, topics, you will get free today, but you know, we have this quarter, the business wasn't so good, so next quarter you will have only two headlines. So I would say, it's of course in theory only, but I would say it's quite a complicated issue, so uh, I wouldn't uh, delegate this decision-making pure, uh, like a monetary point of view, how, 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 how much information you get free and for what you, you have, to, uh, have to pay. Mm -hmm. I think we need to wrap up. Yes, to, because there's still, still more uh, great presentations uh, awaiting us. Uh, thank you very much for a friendly and engaged uh, conversation. Uh, Mindaugas, Eric, Marilis, uh, thank you to the uh, audience and to the organizers. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your presence. Thank you. Thank you.
Palun. Ja, ei. Ei ta. 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 And esimene ettekanne, kes meil nüüd kahest viimasest tuleb... And the first of two presentations is not with three people. A professor from Tallinn University, Indrek Ibrus, will make a presentation on local press. Please bear with me. And after Professor Ibrus's presentation, I will introduce a review of a major study on Baltic media. It will continue for some time, but we can draw some interesting conclusions. And we'll do that together. Colleagues from Latvia and Lithuanian universities are here, and I will be part of that panel as well. But now, Let's give the screens to Indrek Ibrus. Tere, õhtu poolikud. Ja ma alustan siis ettekannet jutu sellest, mida teha võib olla kohaliku ajakirjandusega ja mis üldse teist moodi läheneda. How do we approach it in a different way? As you can see from that slide, and Andras mentioned it as well, um, it was the three of us who carried out this study. And it was financed by the embassy of the um, German Republic, which, because they simply happen to have a program where they finance studies um, that regard the development of democracy in Baltic studies. Why this study? Why local press, local newspapers? Just as we heard, local press in many ways, compared to other bigger media organizations, other platforms, pressure on them is the highest, and we know the reasons. Um, Advertising revenue has moved to platforms that have monopolized the relationship with users and consumers. And they got this contact with consumers jealously. This trend is exasperated by urbanization, people move away from rural areas, and media has become more versatile, so attention and time seem to be limited resources, and it's not spent on local media anymore. A planned investment by the newspaper Aribab to provide more local news, we know similar attempts from the Nordic countries. Because of these problems, it is a field that is most ripe for innovation. We should innovate what can be done better. We should investigate what can be done better. At the same time, we must be worried about the development of democracy in, the light, uh, in light of the current pandemic. Do people get the most appropriate fact-based information? If different locations in Estonia or in the world, there are deserts of information for whom no independent media is provided, people in these areas. Have a risk of being unaware of their environment. In this background, the existing information about regional development and the development of public space, and it is accompanied by virtual space for discussion. And the most recent human development report in Estonia paid attention to that. We show that the regional development suffers because in many areas of Estonia there is no active local press that would involve or initiate local debate, giving people a voice, giving them an understanding that they have a say 
in local development, and these places can actually develop. They are not in a frozen state. We do have examples, though, of local debates, and since they are hard to manage, they've gone totally out of hand. Development projects have been um, frozen. I will not give an, I will not assess or give an evaluation of these debates. Maybe if that debate had been run in a better way, the result could have been more of a consensus. And there should, could have been actually some sort of a negotiation. And as the debate mentioned, the future of local uh, press is a topic ignored in political processes quite uh, differently from Latvia. I'd say right away, so I don't forget it in the evening. I brought a whole pile of the um, outcome of the result. You can bring it, uh, pick up a copy if you'd like one, because I only have about 10 minutes to speak about the study. I'd like to introduce the theoretical framework. Often we speak about journalism as the fourth power, and we love describing it as a political process. Journalism is facilitating democracy, giving a voice to different uh, democ democratic powers, giving them opportunity to participate in the public debate, and letting citizens know what are the important developments taking place in the region or in the country, so they can make informed choices. But maybe the role of journalism could be or should be seen in a slightly different viewpoint. Um, innovation studies. In innovation studies, we often use the term innovation systems. They consist of different public organizations and private ones. Uh, in cooperation, they exchange knowledge. And if that system works well, uh, the exchange of information and knowledge takes place in a proper way, then yes, it generates innovation in cooperation. And as I said, the resource of knowledge. Communication companies, well, for them, communication is very, very important, and we don't need to speak about whether we have encyclopedias or whether we have events for startups or do we have uh, libraries. We always need to ask whether have media that functions in such a way that citizens have information about different aspects of how the society functions so they can make better decisions. So in the context of this research, we started from the concept of information. It is a concept that has been studied in universities, but the system of innovation is not has not been studied at local level. And we introduced the term creating public value. Both private and public media create public value. The more beneficial they are for the public, the more value can members of the society use, uh, get from their work. The more opportunities are there for them to create private value. So media freedom is a paradox. And we investigated whether media plays a role in uh, activating local dynamics. The empiric work was quite intense. We carried out interviews with local and um, uh, all uh, Estonian Pub, uh, politicians, we investigated cases in Pernoma, in Itaviroma, and central Estonia. We spoke to people that are important in these areas as well as the wider public. 
carrying out questionnaires and whatnot. Let's continue. I have some beautifully drawn graphs that you can uh, study in these publications, and you can find them on the MEDIT website, which is the um, Center for Research um, at Tallinn University. The questions, questionnaires proved that, contrary to expectations, the image of local publications is quite high, higher in Pärnu than in Viruma, but most uh, respondents said that the image is high. They are positively evaluated, uh, they are evaluate positively their objectivity, so the basics are quite good. So what was important for us is that what are the expectations of the readers, uh, because this is uh, mostly the local activists, they were not interested in the critics, uh, the opinion of the people who are tend to dominate in these uh, local uh, municipality papers. So that means that these uh, alternative voices, debates between these different voices, was um, very clearly what the local people were expecting. And in our samples, we had local businesses, the heads of these businesses, and uh, maybe in a little bit unexpected uh, way, they admitted that local media is beneficial for their business, and they also were looking uh, mostly for the uh, voices of uh, local community leaders and other businesses. So we moved on, so uh, look, we talked to the local municipality employees, and maybe it was a surprise, but um, they, uh, they did not really want to talk about the uh, county independent press. It did not seem to be important to them, because as it turns out, when you talk about the uh, local uh, county press, it's uh, not imp so important for them. And a part of the problem was that um, they felt that this uh, regional press is uh, focused too much on the, um, the local hub, so very, very local life is outside them. And they justified that this is why uh, they uh, thought it was necessary to um, have even smaller papers. And they also found that there was a lot of uh, unpredictability, so they wanted to uh, control the communication flows themselves. So therefore, uh, so they had their own papers and carried out all sorts of activities in social media. But there were some uh, interesting examples across Estonia where the local governments uh, were quite productive uh, in cooperating with the local press because they uh, they were subscribers and uh, also uh, made sure that all the information what they generated uh, would have reached the uh, local uh, independent press which uh, means that they uh, uh, we wanted to study this in a more systemic way because the local governments uh, tend to receive a lot of complaints, but uh, uh, these positive uh, communication cases would be uh, informative to other regions and local governments and counties. And well-known topic, which has been covered for years, is that uh, if you talk about the uh, municipality papers that they are competing with regional and county papers, it's not direct competition because often they are often uh, published only once a month and there is not much advertising. But at the same time, uh, the local publications, because they uh, they don't tend to do very well anyway. Um, so, therefore, they think that in municipality papers, uh, the advertising is very cheap, sometimes even free. So, therefore, that means that it reduces their uh, potential advertising uh, revenue as well. So, the final question was that if we know that the local publications, independent publications, have a, a positive impact on a local level, then how we can solve these problems, as we know that they have a serious problem with income. And the main issue, which they wanted to uh, uh, want their regulators uh, to solve with the, uh, the home delivery, 
because uh, delivery is important uh, that it will be there in time because that means that you could uh, uh, develop a Trump critical advertising model. And as uh, Morrill has already said today, uh, they are a bit afraid of the direct subsidies because they see it as a threat to the independence. But uh, outside the uh, bigger media groups, uh, then they thought that an, uh, one measure would be important would be to have this digital commissioner at this position who will be a, a multi-annual position so uh, that there will be somebody who would be carry out a digital innovation within this organization. So the salary cost will be covered of this person because if these uh, subsidies are offered as a project, because then there is some IT company coming from outside. And this know-how, how to develop things further, how to adjust and how to improve is not staying within the uh, paper. So things become obsolete and uh, afterwards it's very hard to manage. And the papers don't have the resources to carry out these innovations in a systemic uh, way. So this is something which the sustainable policy makers should uh, think about to finance these um, digital developments uh, through financing the digital commissioner's uh, position. Then if you talk about cooperation with the local press and uh, a public broadcasting company because public broadcasting company uh, does a lot of news locally could they use uh, a local uh, press uh, as a resource sharing resource uh, and also guaranteeing some stability or if the main uh, problem is a uh, digital and internet maybe having a corporation and offering some uh, platforms because I'm sure the public broadcasting company will be will have a lot more. Again, uh, the independent uh, press uh, would be afraid to be uh, dependent of the uh, public broadcasting company, but at the same time they were expressed their careful interest. Because at the beginning, when I talk about the media and the press uh, producing public value and. Uh, if this is uh, effective, then this entire system uh, raises up. So uh, public value-based, uh, uh, public media, local media, local level public value creation, this kind of cooperation between these different parties will be an important uh, direction to take. But I would also like to say that uh, this uh, study is not over. I had a focus group uh, with uh, North East Estonian businesses, so this is mainly Russian-speaking area, read regarding how the businesses can be included more into the public space uh, creation, so and to um, include, include them more where the local press could uh, create a good debate, uh, so which will be uh, uh, beneficial for the uh, uh, for the local uh, uh, press so but we'll continue this work thank you very much uh, and now the few brave who are still here can still ask questions so I don't see any questions right now anyway thank you very much Indrek. And we'll continue. So thank you very much for you uh, as you're still here. So, last but not least. I'm really happy to invite my colleagues from Latvia and Lithuania uh, to join me on the stage. Yeah, yeah, let's. Actually, I will take the clicker and we can be somewhere around here, where you feel it's convenient, actually. Let's well, stay here. To it's you, of course. <laughs> yeah, I would, yeah. <laughs> so, Istuga, ah, please, we have uh -huh. a seat. Why not? Here, I will take this one, somebody's control. And we have opportunity to just to give a first, first introduction of a bigger... Uh, 
uh, study on the media in the Baltic st states, and it doesn't happen too often that we will have a really comparable uh, data from three countries. And uh, the data arrived just really a couple of hours ago, we must say, you know, two days ago. So this is first, first int introduction. But uh, well, I will start with very briefly describing what I found interesting. It is so about these Baltic countries introduction. We had uh, 3,000 respondents in the age of 15 to 74 and combined uh, interview methods. First uh, finding what I have here in it is uh, description of countries uh, and the consumption of media by age groups. Here you can see that television for younger people Estonia is almost dead which is a blue line and uh, these other lines it's a portals and social media the red one it's a social media it's quite strong even among people elder than 65. If we go to Latvia we can see it is quite similar the television is much stronger in elder or a little bit elder people uh, but we can see that there are not too big difference between social media social networks platforms and television in Latvia in Lithuania social networks which is a red line I remember uh, remind you then it's lower among uh, little bit elderly Lithuanians but television is uh, strong in all countries and the gray line representing uh, portal news portals is strong in all all countries so and there are a slide about people who don't follow news at all because this one was about people following the news on a daily basis and i picked up uh, differences between countries among people who don't follow news at all and you can see this printed newspaper is something which is not very favorable and uh, news portals in all three countries are uh, used quite a lot jumping into audience assessment on about information channels it's a slide where i would like to just to say is that in estonia the most important uh, and it is the same in other countries is uh, getting information from news uh, from friends and uh, and family and then it follows public service broadcasting television channels and the less important are Russian uh, media and Russian uh, social networks. In Latvia we can see it, it should be also the first one should be uh, uh, friends and family but in the second place it is uh, national and private commercial media uh, portals and Latvian television uh, uh, with two channels is, uh, is a little bit below. In Lithuania it's the same. Firstly it is friends and families but then it comes mm, uh, public service broadcasting. Jumping into the third uh, point here, how reliable the assessment by the audience that how reliable are the channels and here you can see that uh, the public broadcasting actually is very reliable among all citizens of all countries and the less trusted are the blogs and podcasts and Russian media and social networks. Same it is here also public service media in Latvia is the most trusted and Russian channels and alternative media is less trusted and the same picture is uh, valid also for description of Lithuania. And evaluation of uh, importance of a public service broadcasting the first slide it's uh, describing Estonian situation, we ask the question if you have a 10 point scale, how valuable to believe that where you assess the public service broadcasting is? And here it is, uh, sorry, there are all countries together. Uh, Estonians have a, a little bit uh, more people saying uh, or giving a 10, po 10 points for a public broadcasting. And Latvia, Lithuania, this is a little bit uh, lower. But the trend in Estonia here, uh, when we look at this uh, uh, trend from 2014 and 2021, we can see for some reasons uh, among uh, non-Estonians uh, there is slight decline in, uh, in this 10-point scale give, uh, given to public service broadcasting. 
And comparable data about private broadcast, or private media, you can see that uh, none of uh, Estonians or uh, Russians didn't value a public, public, sorry, private or commercial media very, very high. There is more, uh, more uh, this neutral approach. What we can conclude from here is alternative media and uh, social media and Russian media are not trusted and high confidence in the public service media. And last points here, the evaluation of professional journalism is that almost 80% of respondents trust the professional journal, uh, journalists during the crisis are doing a good job. And and also two-thirds of uh, respondents say that uh, they believe that the contribution uh, for democra uh, democratic development uh, still is there. And um, on the negative side, uh, side there are roughly about 15% people who are more suspicious about uh, contribution of media. And and the question was, do you agree or strongly agree with this point? And 5% strongly agree that the role of professional media has diminished. And 17% almost agrees on this, this statement. And 4% agree that I don't follow, up, uh, follow professional media because it, I know the most of important news uh, comes from uh, social media. And uh, the same amount of people, and these are actually, actually the same people say that these are, uh, they believe that truth is in alternative media. So, and now I will give, give over the sticker to uh, Anda, and it's your turn now. Yeah, thank you, and good afternoon again. I'm jumping uh, to continue with data, and only one remaining, because those data are collected in the deep crisis situation in all countries. And I, I was thinking uh, that the um, theory of uh, uncertainty reduction uh, could be used to interpret data, because I'm really interested how uh, people perceive this information, how they uh, uh, what's the effects of this information, what they are doing when they notice uh, some suspicious or false information. Uh, uh, and uh, according to the theory, sometimes uh, new information during crisis when people turn to various uh, sources of information could not uh, reduce uncertainty, but because of uh, this information, uh, uncertainty could be um, uh, increased, like growing up. And now, a uh, few uh, slides. The first uh, is related with data on Latvia, uh, on how uh, people answer a uh, question, how, how, how they uh, perceive uh, suspicious information or, or false news. Uh, on various uh, channels, and then you can see, uh, <laughs> responding to the last uh, discussion, that in Latvia, uh, audience uh, do not differentiate between public service media and uh, private professional media, and there are uh, quite a big, uh, big number, uh, big proportion of respondents who uh, more than half of uh, those who see uh, or notice uh, this information in professional media, and then those problematic, controversial situation ar around social networks, where many, uh, even more, <clears throat> close to 80% respondents uh, notice uh, this information, uh, alternative media, problems in Russian, uh, Russian language, like media which belongs to Russian uh, landscape, uh, how they uh, uh, perform uh, content according to their quality and, uh, and false news. And uh, then I, I was looking, at, I was very uh, curious, is there any, any uh, particular differences? And in Latvian data, I noticed uh, that there is a difference uh, according to nationality or uh, 
what language respondents are speaking in their families, and these are data that's, that uh, explains uh, differences uh, according to nationality of respondents, uh, according uh, general data uh, be between uh, respondents, women, uh, Russian-speaking uh, people, and those with lower education are more uh, more uh, tend to uh, see uh, false or, or suspicious information in professional media. But when I when we look on particular groups like public public service, uh, then Western media uh, as an example and. Uh, Russian, Russian media and alternative media, then we can see that people are uh, equally agree that social media and alternative media uh, pro uh, provides a uh, big amount of suspicious information, but uh, there is a difference uh, according to national belonging how they see uh, public service media, Latvian speaking, uh, uh, see less suspicious information uh, and uh, Russian speaking uh, people more and vice versa with, uh, with Russian media channels. And situation it's not the same in Estonia. First of all, uh, as we uh, have learned for many years in Estonia, everything is better than in Latvia and twice better is perception of uh, this information in, in a public service media and then comes quite a similar situation, but still less, uh, less proportion of respondents uh, notice, uh, uh, notice suspicious information in various media channels. Uh, and again, social networks, alternative media, Russian-speaking media are blamed more than others. And then again, detailed a bit detailed picture where we can where we could see that uh, Estonian differences, how Estonian, uh, Russian speaking, on other uh, those who uh, belong to other uh, nationalities, how they uh, see uh, suspicious information in Estonian media. Again, really a good situation with the public service. Uh, which is interesting. Russian uh, Russian media are treated uh, almost equally. Big difference uh, on perception of Western media. Very close, uh, very close uh, opinions regarding uh, alternative and social networks, uh, where we can see what's going on uh, with the Lithuanians. And uh, Lithuania, again, in the middle, in, uh, in terms of noticing uh, suspicious information uh, in uh, public service media uh, and uh, situation is really similar uh, when we speak about Russian uh, uh, Russian uh, media, Western uh, uh, blogs, podcasts and up uh, in uh, there is a disappeared those uh, legends but on the first line there is an alternative uh, media. And again, uh, Lithuanians uh, and uh, Lithu uh, according to nationality, we can see Russian speaking or other speaking people are most suspicious towards public service media in terms of disinformation, false news. The same situation goes with the uh, Russian, uh, Russian media. And there is a one uh, more new line, Lithuanian media and Russian or Polish, and those are treated equally. The perception of uh, are they uh, involved in, uh, in dissemination of um, uh, suspicious information, uh, false news, um, there is no difference according to nationality. And the same goes with the social networks and alternative uh, media. We can see this, those data uh, uh, all together. When uh, in Latvia there are more suspicious people, Estonia, uh, Estonians are more uh, like um, be, uh, believe that in, in Estonian media landscape there is a less 
suspicious uh, um, information and false news. And I think we should, uh, we can see the uh, differences. We can see the mirroring of uh, trust, uh, distrust climate in each country and um, speak about some uh, cultural uh, characteristics in, uh, in the each countries. This is, this is uh, the reason why, as a conclusion uh, part, I put only, uh, only questions for further uh, um, analysis, um, as we didn't have opportunity to analyze properly the old data. But uh, for me, uh, in relations with trust and um, false news, uh, there were great data uh, presented by, by Andres on importance of media. And according Latvia and Lithuania data, we could, we could see the, this contradiction there is important media, but still, uh, and people keep using those media, but still uh, they notice uh, that there are problematic information, uh, suspicious information manipulated the uh, news. And we should find out what does this mean. Is it the effect of hostile media effects when uh, via politicians and other players in public space um, many people uh, uh, are um, more tend uh, to believe that professional media plays against uh, against um, uh, public interest, or there are other other um, problems uh, on, uh, and those are those questions why I think that uh, we have to put together evaluation of uh, media quality and. Uh, that inner feeling uh, how uh, reliable uh, or uh, unreliable media, uh, how, uh, how people um, evaluate according to trust, distrust, re reliability, and, uh, and, and uh, unreliability. And of course, the very interesting uh, part, uh, not, not covered enough in this conference, is those uh, news resistors, this growing group, uh, what, are, uh, what are reasons of uh, news resistance and news avoidance? Thank you. And now I'm giving, uh, giving this device to Diamantas for next analysis. Thank you. And few remarks uh, regarding uh, public service media uh, in all three Baltic countries. What people think uh, about um, uh, public service broadcasters, public service media. Uh, one question was, uh, uh, how do you assess the content of uh, public service media news uh, without entertainment or without documentary? As you can see in the bottom of this diagram, uh, uh, Estonia positive answers uh, uh, 65%, Lithuania 56 and, and uh, Latvia 42. Uh, are some, uh, differences uh, are uh, in the couple of 20-30%. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, I want to present uh, a few statements uh, and what people think uh, regarding, for example, per public serious media reflects all the important issues of society. As you can see, the very similar re results uh, uh, was uh, in Lithuania and, uh, and Estonia, and a little bit uh, less uh, people uh, think that uh, uh, all important issues of society cover uh, PSM of Latvia. Uh, next statement, public service media is clearly different from private media. There is uh, about half uh, uh, respondents said uh, Lithuania and Estonia that uh, they uh, see this difference. And 44% uh, uh, 40, per uh, very similar uh, data and uh, in Latvia was uh, conducted. Uh, next statement, uh, PSM uh, is independent uh, of political influence in the conduct of uh, its program. Uh, as you can see, uh, a little bit less uh, than half respondents uh, gave uh, their opinion that uh, uh, 
publicis media in Lithuania and uh, Estonia, 43% uh, uh, think that uh, in publicis media uh, are independent uh, from political opponents. And uh, there is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, clear difference in Latvia, only one uh, fourth on or 26 percent, I think, in that way. It is uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, data. Uh, we have uh, uh, several uh, uh, studies uh, last uh, two, two, two years and last year in Lithuania was a very similar result uh, uh, regarding uh, these questions uh, in the uh, perspective of a uh, few years. Uh, and uh, next question is, uh, PSM is independent of economic interest in the uh, production of its programs. Uh, as you can see, less uh, uh, positive answers uh, in bottom. There is about thought, uh, 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 only uh, res respondents uh, think that uh, uh, public serious media companies are independent from its in uh, economic interest. Yeah, it is, uh, in my point, a very, very interesting uh, uh, opinion, but uh, it is a uh, need to, to, uh, to do qualitative uh, interviews uh, and to ask why in this point uh, uh, think uh, uh, people. Because uh, uh, all three uh, public service companies are not working uh, really in the commercial advertising market. And uh, what it means uh, economic interest for uh, uh, audience. And uh, last two uh, slides: uh, PSM supports development of democracy. Uh, as you can see, uh, about half uh, uh, people uh, uh, in uh, respondents in Lithuania and uh, Estonia said uh, a little bit uh, more than half and a little bit less than half in Latvia uh, see uh, that PSM supports the development of democracy. Uh, and uh, uh, last one, uh, slide and then a statement, PSM reports the Ocatelli uh, to the public on its activities. The activities uh, of public serious medias are transparent. Uh, as you can see, a uh, little bit less uh, uh, respondents and uh, inhabitants of uh, Lithuania and Estonia said that they see uh, these companies as uh, transparent. And uh, less uh, 32% of uh, Latvians said uh, in that way. I think uh, the preliminary conclusion that uh, our public service media companies uh, have a lot of reserve to show what they do and uh, uh, communicate and disseminate information on their activities. Uh, thank you for, the, uh, for our attention. Archie Paldes uh, Aita. Yes, yeah, we are done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We have presents waiting for you and aitäh, thank you for the audience, aitäh, kes te siin olete suuretanud tõlkidele, kes te... Thank you so much for interpreters who handled the day. It took a lot longer than we uh, planned to, but you're used to me. You know, knew how it was going to go and I'd like to thank technicians to uh, support this conference. Thanks to all the sponsors. Next year. In, in five years. <laughs> Which yeah, is it's typical a, for academic publications. Academic jokes. In, in this decade. No, but, but we need resources not only for, uh, for data, but also for publishing and then for reading. We please keep resources for reading as well for our publication. Yes. Yes, this That's is the final order presence. in academia. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming here. Yes, really. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Follow media and click the right titles. That's it. Thank you.